President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we will move on and I will call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Higher Education Support Amendment, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Faruqi. Senator Davey. Thank you. Uh, and as I was saying yesterday, contrary to claims I've read, the changes proposed in this bill will not disadvantage students from lower social and economic areas. It will enable more graduates from these areas and graduates going into fields that industries support and that support jobs, that support regional development such as health and agriculture. That is why our regional universities are supporting this package. And by strengthening our regional universities, by improving access to our universities for children and students from regional and remote and Indigenous students, and by offering incentives for universities to target students from these areas, this package truly delivers for rural, regional and remote Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I'm just going to make a short contribution in this debate, but I do want to put on the record uh, my position and Labor's position, especially insofar as this bill affects regional universities in my state of Queensland and students and aspiring students uh, in our regions. Uh, for reasons that have been explained by a number of my colleagues, Labor will oppose this bill. This legislation makes it harder and more expensive for Australians to go to university. It's hard to imagine that there is a worse time in Australian history for a bill to be introduced which seeks to increase the cost of higher education on students, make it more expensive for students to attend university at a time when we have seen hundreds of thousands of Australians lose their jobs and for the first time in many years in some cases consider undertaking university or other studies in order to reskill so that they can re-enter the workforce. So at a time when we've got hundreds of thousands of Australians losing their jobs making decisions about retraining so that they can get a new job, the government wants to make it more expensive for people to obtain those qualifications which will assist them to get that new job that they're looking for. Absolutely bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. An incredible disincentive to people to undertake the sort of study that they may need to be able to obtain a new job. But it's consistent with the approach that this government has taken to education and training the entire time it has been in office. We've seen their cuts to universities in the past. We've seen them increase the cost of study and put more of the burden onto students. And that's just for higher education. If we look at apprenticeships and traineeships, arguably the changes have been even worse than in higher education. 140,000 apprentices and trainees fewer in Australia than when this government came to office in 2013. As usual, they make all the promises in the world. Only a short time ago, they were going to create 300,000 new 
apprenticeships and traineeships. But if you look at the facts, there are 140,000 fewer apprentices and trainees in this country now than there were in 2013 when this government came to power. So they've cut universities, they've made it more expensive for students to go to university, they've cut apprenticeships, they've cut traineeships, and all of a sudden they realise that we've got a massive skill shortage, which is only going to be exacerbated by the fact that they won't be able to use the trick they've used for years to fill skill shortages, which is to bring in people from overseas. We are going to pay a significant price as a country in coming years for this government's failure to invest in universities and in training. We're not going to be able to resort to bringing in people from overseas to fill school skill shortages. We never should have had to rely on that as the way of filling skill shortages in the first place. If this government had properly invested in the skills of Australians by properly funding universities and training, we wouldn't have needed to rely so heavily on bringing in people from overseas. We would have had more Australians be able to fill skill shortages rather than be on the dole queues. So we've already paid a price for this government's failure to invest in universities and training, and it's going to really catch up with us in the next few years as we are not going to be able to resort to bringing in people from overseas in the way that we have done for year after year. And this bill just makes it worse. Now, there has been a lot of attention given in the last 24 hours to the extremely disappointing decision from Senator Alliance to back this bill. And one group who haven't had enough attention for their decision is One Nation. Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts, once again, as they have done ever since they entered this parliament, line up with the LNP to pass legislation which will hurt the battlers who they say they care about. We've got a Queensland election on at the moment. Day after day, we see One Nation candidates out there masquerading as the people who are standing up for battlers in our community. If only that were true. If only that were true. Because we know that a lot of the people who vote for One Nation are battlers. They are people doing it really tough. They are people who need someone in this parliament who is standing up for them. But what we have seen day after day, month after month, year after year from Senator Hanson and her party is that they come down to Canberra, they vote with the Liberal and National parties to shaft the very battlers who they say they care about. We've seen them do it on pensions. We've seen them do it on apprenticeships. We've seen them do it on labour hire. We've seen them do it on ho how, however many examples you want to pick. And now they're doing it again on universities. And the reason that Senator Hanson and One Nation think that they can get away with this is because they perpetuate this idea that universities are only for rich people, that universities are only for elite people in the big cities. That is total rubbish. And if Senator Hanson and her party had bothered to actually speak to any of the regional universities in Queensland, they would actually know that when they make these claims that universities are for snobs and for elitists and not for regional people, they would know that those claims are wrong and insulting to regional Queenslanders. I have bothered to speak to regional universities in Queensland. I have learnt as a result that regional universities in Queensland and probably the rest of the country, one of their core missions is to offer university education to people who have never had a family member go to university. To give you one example, Central Queensland University, but the same could be said of James Cook University, the University of the Sunshine Coast, University of Southern Queensland and other regional universities in my state. But to focus on Central Queensland University, they have a national reputation 
for offering university study to what is called first in family. People who have never had a family member go to university, who have got the marks at school to qualify, who want to become some sort of want to follow some sort of career that requires a university qualification, and who have always been shut out of pursuing their dream because university places weren't available or they were too expensive. And because of the system that has been brought into place by previous Labor governments, opening access to higher education, it has allowed regional kids and mature-age regional Queenslanders to go to university for the first time, to be the first person in their family who's ever had that opportunity and, as a result, has been able to get certain jobs that they've never been able to access, sometimes on higher pay than any member of their family has been able to access. These are universities for battlers. They do a fantastic job in research. They do a fantastic job of educating high-achieving people from families who've been to university before. But the thing that's special about our regional universities is they do an incredibly good and an incredibly important job for regional Queenslanders and regional Australians whose families have never had access to university before. And this bill that One Nation is voting for is going to take that opportunity away. What an incredible sellout of the battlers who you say you represent. You say you want people in regional Queensland to have a better life. For some, that's going to be getting an apprenticeship. For some, that's going to be getting a university course. And you're ripping that opportunity away by making the courses more expensive, by increasing class sizes through reducing the funding that universities are going to give, and just making life a whole lot harder for those battlers. Yet another sellout from this government and from the One Nation Party that supports it. That's why we'll be opposing this bill, because unlike One Nation, unlike the LNP, Labor actually does stand up for battlers. It does stand up for the people who want to go to university and be the first person in their family to do so, who don't want to come out of it with a crippling debt like you see in America, who want to be able to get on after they've graduated, buy a house, take out a loan, build a family, things that are pretty expensive and that are much harder to do if you have a big university debt, well, that debt is just going to become bigger as a result of this bill being pushed by the Liberal National Party and its accomplices in One Nation. Labor will continue to support higher education for all Australians, rich and poor. The Liberal and National Party, aided and abetted by One Nation, wanted to go back to the old days where universities were just for rich kids. Well, I can tell you, Labor will fight that tooth and nail as long as we are in this Senate. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak about the higher education reform package. In a perfect world, the package before us would dramatically raise funding for higher education. I want our universities and TAFEs to be the best in the world, and I want them to teach our children to be talented, creative thinkers who can solve the problems that face our communities and our world. We're a long way from achieving that vision. As much as I would like to see more funding delivered into education, it is clear the government has no appetite for this. I understand they need to manage the financial impact of COVID-19, but this position is short-sighted. It helps our financial position today at the expense of tomorrow. Nonetheless, that is their position, and they have made it clear that they are unwilling to shift. So the question is whether we should support this reform or stick to the status quo, whether this reform brings us closer to that vision of a world-class education system. There are good things in the reform. First, it creates tens of thousands of additional places for students. Demand for these places will increase sharply in the next few years as workers left unemployed by the recession choose to upskill and as the Costello baby boom moves through the system. Without this reform, many of those students will not secure places and will be forced into the worst job market in a generation. 
With the reform, there will be up to 30,000 new places. And changes to funding clusters mean some universities will be able to offer even more places in courses like commerce, humanities and law. The reform also ensures the Commonwealth places are used appropriately. Professor Andrew Norton has shown that 6% of new students fail every course they take in the first semester, and a quarter of those go on to fail every course in their second semester. Universities will be prompted to engage with students who have high fail rates and are accruing significant debts. They will have to work with students to understand their circumstances and ensure that continued study is in their interests. This is a sensible requirement, formalising a process that already exists in most universities. <coughs> Second, the reform restores indexation so universities can grow in the future. The Turnbull government froze university funding in 2017 in a move that was supposed to save $2 billion, but actually saved a fraction of that. A lot of pain for absolutely no gain. Undoing that freeze may be the best part of this package. And we've been assured that this is a permanent change, giving universities ongoing certainty in their funding. The government is also offering faster growth in places for regional and high growth metro campuses. And this is particularly important for regional universities. Most professionals who live and work in regional areas are the product of regional universities. More places at these universities will mean more professionals in these areas, more teachers, more nurses, more engineers, more scientists in regional Australia. Third, the reform introduces a demand-driven funding system for Indigenous Australians in regional and remote areas. For some people here, demand-driven funding is the opposite of what they want for universities, and there's merit to their views. But when it comes to Indigenous Australians, we should put aside our views on the broader system and agree this is very much a positive development. It means that any Indigenous Australian from a regional area will be able to attend university. There won't be any cap on places. That means an intelligent, motivated student misses out on their dream. That very much is a worthy goal. And I hope in the future we can expand that to all Indigenous Australians, regardless of whether they come from a regional or metropolitan area. So those aspects of the reforms are very much worthy. But other aspects are less worthy. Law, commerce and humanities students will have to bear almost the entire cost of their degrees. Many will graduate with forty dollars or $50,000 in debt. Now that's a hefty load for anyone, but particularly for humanities students whose careers tend to start a bit slower than those in other fields. Conversely, it will make life easier for those who choose to study other courses. The cost of an allied health degree will fall by 20 per cent. The cost of becoming a teacher or a nurse will fall by almost half, and studying agriculture will fall by more than a half. These discounts will help to attract more of the best students into the fields that Australia needs them to study. Personally, I would prefer to see an education system that doesn't settle students with debt. But the cost of a university education has to be met by someone, and I think it is reasonable that students who enjoy the benefits of their degree share in the costs. The government argues higher degree costs will provide an incentive for students to choose their degrees more carefully. Now, many people have been critical of this, arguing that school leavers tend to follow their passions. I think this criticism misses the point. Mature age students make up more than half of all enrolments, and they attend university to improve their career prospects. They pay close attention to the financials, and they will respond to price. The government is right when it says a different strategy is needed to influence the decisions of school leavers. But where is that strategy? Right now, hundreds of thousands of Year 12 students are making decisions about their university applications. As far as I can tell, the government isn't doing anything to ensure those students are making careful, informed choices. A final concern in this legislation, as originally proposed, would not have provided loadings to South Australian universities. <coughs> as the inquiry heard from the South Australian Vice-Chancellors, their universities would have received indexation but would have not qualified for high-growth metro or regional loadings. 
I don't believe it's appropriate for the federal government to have a policy that encourages the strongest students to potentially leave South Australia for another state because they can achieve a place. We already lose too many of our best and brightest, and I could not have supported a policy that permanently entrenched this. Senator Reliance has made these concerns very clear to the minister, and I'm glad to say he has listened to our concerns and acted on them. South Australian universities will receive an additional loading that ensures more places for South Australian students, and these places will be distributed to create greater equity. The vice-chancellors of all three South Australian universities have all welcomed these changes. The Minister for Mayo and I are happy to have once again secured a positive outcome for the state. Like every controversial bill, this package has also had its myths. The Shadow Minister for Education is one figure who has spread these myths, but she is not alone. The first myth is that the cost of degrees will double. This is untrue. Many degrees in areas of real need will be significantly cheaper, some I have mentioned previously. Another myth is that the package will deliver an Americanised system of higher education funding. That could not be further from the truth. Unlike the US, the package still has Commonwealth funding more than half of costs associated with each course. And for the other half, students will receive interest-free loans. They don't have to make any repayment until their income reaches the threshold, and students with larger debts do not have to make larger payments. There are few countries in the world which support higher education students more than Australia, and this reform does not change that. Another myth is that the reform cuts $1 billion from higher education. The Shadow Minister for Education has repeatedly made this claim, and it is false. The only way the numbers support that claim is if you add up the costs and ignore the extra money put into this sector through the transition equity and industry linkage funds. They are playing tricks with the numbers and creating anxiety and worry to win political points. It is a dishonest way to conduct a policy debate and undermines the public's confidence in all of us. This package is far from ideal. We would prefer to vote for a package that provided universities with better long-term funding. The decision before us is whether this package is better than the status quo. Senator Alliance supports the creation of more places for students at a time when they are desperately needed. We support the measures that will help those who struggle the most, Indigenous students, students from regional areas and first-in-family students. We appreciate that the government has listened to our concerns about South Australian universities who were going to be adversely affected. They have also listened to our concerns about social work, youth work and psychology students, about students with special circumstances and a formal review of the changes to ensure that they are working. We welcome the government's commitments and look forward to supporting the legislation when it comes to a vote. Thanks, Senator Grip. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, unlike my colleague here, I stand here in opposition to this bill. I stand here in opposition to it because it is complete and utter rubbish for university students, for the university sector, for children who aspire to go to universities, for their families who aspire for them to go to universities. And ultimately, it's rubbish for our economy because we know the best way to increase productivity in our economy is to invest in people. This bill represents a shocking attack on those who hold the aspiration to attend university. Not everyone holds this aspiration, and nor should they. University is not the be-all and end-all when it comes to opportunity in life. But in this place, we should never be standing in the way of the aspiration of those young people for whom university will be the ticket to the bright future that they aspire to for whom university will be the answer for a better paid job or the job of their dreams, and for the families who look at their children, who see that hope in their children, who can't afford to support them through university, who want those children to live their dreams and feel locked out because of this legislation and the additional financial burden it will impose on those who seek to attend university. What kind of country do we want to be in Australia? 
one which brings the axe down on the aspirations of young people to better themselves, to better their opportunities, or one which gives every student in Australia, regardless of the postcode they are living in, the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to develop and the opportunity to fulfil their individual dreams. I know what kind of Australia I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of Australia which supports aspiration, which supports opportunity for young people. And when those young people choose university, doesn't add such a huge financial burden on those dreams that they don't get to realise them. How many of us in this chamber got that opportunity? I did. I think most of the front bench on the other side did. Plenty of us in this place got the opportunity to attend university. And we took up that opportunity because we saw university as a path to the future that we wanted. So who are we to take that away from the young people who see that opportunity in their future as well? My colleague from Centre Alliance stood here today and said, in an ideal world, in an ideal world, we would see more funding for the university sector here today. Well, in this place, we make choices. We get to help choose the world we want to live in. We get to help choose the country we want to live in. We get a vote in this place. He gets a particularly powerful vote sometimes as a crossbencher in this place. If he doesn't think this is ideal, if he doesn't think this is the Australia which we want to see in an ideal world, then he can change it. He could have changed his vote. He voted for this. So it's one thing to say, oh, not ideal. Well, you actually have the power to do something about it, Centre Alliance, Senator Griff. You have the power to do something about it. And today you've chosen to sell out the aspirations of young people in Australia. You've chosen to sell out South Australian families who see that aspiration in their children and, by God, desperately want to see them achieve it. You've sold out productivity. You've sold out opportunity in our state. And you can come in here and pretend to have done something different. You can come in here and lament that we don't live in an ideal world, but you actually have the power to create the Australia you want to see. That's why we've all come here. So I think that is a pathetic excuse from Centre Alliance, a pathetic excuse to justify them turning their backs on aspiration, them turning their backs on South Australian students, them turning their backs on South Australian families and them turning their backs on our future productivity and potential prosperity in South Australia. It is outrageous and we should never let them forget it. There can be no more important choices we make in this place than how we help Australians achieve and realise their dreams and their aspirations for a better future for themselves and their families. That should be a key test for all of us. And when you take opportunity away in education, when you snatch it out of the hands of students from particular postcodes or particular backgrounds, then you take an axe to opportunity. You take an axe to the potential of young people and you take an axe to our economy and our future. South Australians will suffer as a result of this legislation. Their dreams will suffer, their opportunities will suffer, the sector will suffer. You cannot pretend it is any other way. This legislation will make it harder and more expensive for young South Australians to go to university. That, that is at the core of this legislation. Thousands of students will pay more for the same qualification. And if that qualification is part of their aspiration, well, then that's shot for a lot of them. 40% of students will have their fees increased to more than $14,000 a year, a debt burden that they simply cannot afford. And this is all happening at a time of record youth unemployment, when young people are doing it particularly tough when they're looking at their future opportunities, when they're looking at the jobs of their dreams, when they're looking at the economy, when they're looking at the burden of debt in front of them, it is an anxious time out there for young South Australians, an anxious time. 
and we are adding to that anxiety by imposing a further restriction and limitation on their ability to realise the opportunities they seek for themselves. So I think it's an outrageous piece of legislation. I think it's complete and utter rubbish. And I think what Centre Alliance is doing here today, under the cover of Budget Week, is shameful. It's shameful for the people in South Australia they claim to represent. Labor will be opposing this legislation. It is unsalvageable. And we will continue to stand for aspiration, for opportunity and for the potential of young South Australians and the dreams they hold for themselves and what they want to achieve. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, I rise to speak in opposition of this terrible piece of legislation and firstly just like to associate uh, myself with the comments made by my uh, colleague who um, leads this area for the Australian Greens, and that of course is Senator uh, Faruqi. Now, I am just gobsmacked at the uh, dodgy deal that has been done uh, this week by the Central Alliance uh, Senator, Senator Griff, uh, and uh, the member for Mayo, uh, Rebecca Sharkey, South Australians who, after months of telling the South Australian people they had problems with this bill, they knew that this piece of legislation was bad, bad for students, bad for the economy, bad for education. Months later, we now see the most significant backflip Central Alliance has done uh, since Nick Xenophon left this building. They have sold out South Australian students, they have sold out families, they have sold out our university sector, and they are going to make our South Australian economy suffer even more. In our state, we have the highest youth unemployment rate in the country. And under this dodgy deal between Scott Morrison and Rebecca Sharkey, we have seen life made even harder for young people. If there's no jobs for you, if there's nowhere to go after you've finished school, we want young people to be able to go to university and study, if that indeed is what their desire and aspiration is. And this bill, this piece of legislation today, makes that, for some of these young people, near impossible. Now, We've heard the platitudes from uh, Centre Alliance uh, Senator uh, Griff uh, this morning. After hiding for the last 24 hours from the Australian media, from the Australian people, we've now finally had some type of an explanation. And I tell you what, it's rubbish. They have been sold a pup. They've been hoodwinked by the government. And they're now passing a piece of legislation that is going to undermine our university sector for decades. It is going to throw young people under the bus and lock them out of future career opportunities forever. Let's just be clear. The coalition government, Rebecca Sharkey and Centre Alliance and Pauline Hanson One Nation Party are all voting today to cut funding to universities and to make it more expensive for students who are studying things like arts and humanities. And do you know who that disproportionately affects, Madam Deputy President? Women. Who has been the hardest hit in the middle of this economic crisis and in this recession? Women. Who has been the most hit by the loss of jobs, the loss of hours, the cuts to wages in this country because of this pandemic and this recession? Young women. And who is going to carry the burden now of the changes and the cuts to universities and the hike in fees that is going to pass this parliament because of this grubby deal that's been done? Young women. Women are the sacrificial lamb of this deal being done today by Scott Morrison and Rebecca Sharkey. It's just unthinkable. I mean, there is actually the ability in this place sometimes to make a real difference. 
to protect people from bad decisions that governments try and make, to make sure that decisions don't disproportionately affect one group in the community. Central Alliance had an opportunity to do something, and they've stuffed it. This government has had it in for universities since day dot, and now they've been handed the ability to follow through. Let's remember Tony Abbott, when he was Prime Minister, took an axe to the university sector. Let's remember this government has never thought that students who choose courses like arts, humanities, creative, the creative industries, that those students should be supported by government. They've had it in for them forever. And now they've just been given the green light by crossbenchers in this place. I think South Australians will be very, very angry that their senator, Sterling Griff, is voting with Pauline Hanson today to make it harder for a young woman to study humanities at Adelaide University. That is what is happening. That is what is happening today. Senator Griff is voting with Pauline Hanson to make it harder for students to study an arts degree, a humanities degree. Sterling Griff is voting with Pauline Hanson today to make life harder for young South Australian women. It's appalling, and they need to be called out for this. What did they get for this grubby deal? A couple of million dollars for a road in Harndorf. How do we know that? Because the member for Mayo, Rebecca Shuckey, stood in the House yesterday and asked a Dorothy Dixer of the government. Please, Deputy Prime Minister, tell me how good I am. And just so no one would miss it, she issued a media release saying the exact same thing. Senator Griff had a slip of the tongue earlier when he referred to the member for Mayo as the Minister for Mayo. Is that what's going on here? Is this all part of some deal to get the member for Mayo into the government? Throw young South Australians under the bus, throw our universities under the bus, sell out the future generation of workers and educated professionals so that the member for Mayo can get a cosy job with the government? This isn't Centre Alliance anymore, folks. This is Liberal Alliance. It is absolutely appalling that after knowing all the facts, after tweeting all of the problems that this bill has and this piece of legislation has, that you then turn around and expect people to believe that this is a good deal for students. It is not. It's bad for students, it's bad for universities, and it's bad for our economy. And overwhelmingly, it is bad for women. Now, last night, we had an extraordinary budget handed down, billions of dollars put on the table. And who continues to miss out under this government? Women. Oh, let's, you know. Credit where credit's due. The Prime Minister had a paragraph in there in the budget around uh, the impact on women, $250 million over five years. It's like they got to the end of the budget and went, oh, damn, there's a whole other. Who did we forget? Who did we forget here? Oh, women. Oh, we better write the word in there somewhere. Time and time and time again, it is women in this country who miss out under this government. This is the pink recession, and yet nothing of substance has been put on the table 
to help them. And in fact, we're now going to see the situation get worse. Because while the majority of people who have lost their jobs or lost their hours or lost their income in the midst of this are women, this particular piece of legislation is going to make life even harder. Harder for them, harder for the next generation of women coming through, and condemning young women across this country. Why bother? studying hard at school if you can't even get into the course you want to get into because the government decides it's not good enough. The message that Scott Morrison is, is sending young women today is we don't value you. We don't really care. We know you're there, but we don't value you. That's what his budget said last night. That's what this piece of legislation says. And that is what Scott Morrison is doing. Seen but not heard. That's this government's response to young women in this country. It is not good enough. It is not good enough. The fact that this is being shepherded through the parliament by two so-called independents is disgusting. Now, I know the electorate of Mayo quite well. A lot of progressive voters in Mayo right now are shaking their head and thinking, what? who did we vote for? This wasn't what we were promised. People are disappointed in the member for Mayo, Rebecca Sharkey, because she has let them down. She has let them down. She's cozying up to the Liberal government. She's flicking through the most fundamental, controversial changes to our education system we've seen in decades, locking out young women from the ability to study, to get those skills and that training they need to get a job. <coughs> Voters in Mayo are disappointed, and they're going to remain disappointed for a very long time. No wonder the member for Mayo is hiding from the media today. No wonder she refuses to take and answer those calls from journalists, because she knows she's done the wrong thing. The new Liberal Alliance in South Australia are showing their true colours. Liberal light, now flag bearers of the coalition government, and South Australians are going to be pretty disappointed. They don't like being lied to, they don't like being tricked, and they don't like being treated as mugs. And yet today, that's what Rebecca Sharkey and Sterling Griff expect can happen. That people won't ask questions. Under the cover of the budget, no one will know what's going on. Well, people are smarter than that. These reforms are devastating to our university sector. They're devastating to young people, devastating for young women, devastating for families and bad for our economy. They should be voted down. I'm so thankful that the opposition, Senator Lambie, Senator Patrick, all of my Greens colleagues see sense that setting young people up to fail like this in the middle of this terrible recession is not the right way to go. The exact opposite. I am disappointed that those on the other side continue their ideological attack on education, on young people and on women. 
That's why I'm voting no on to this bill later today. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak in opposition to this garbage fire of a bill that the government's brought before the parliament. People have got a right to be angry about the destructive nature of this legislation and the government's approach to what should be a key part of Australia's national capability in the university system. Senators have got a right to be angry. People in the higher education sector have got a right to be angry, and Australian families have got a right to be angry. I listened to the previous contribution, this quizzling, craven contribution, the capitulation from Senator Griff to the government on this issue. And I share with most Australians a profound sense of disappointment and anger, firstly, that the legislation was ever brought here, and a sense of deep disappointment with Senator Griff uh, and the member for Mayo's decision to waive this legislation through. See, as we've gone through the coronavirus crisis, the people that we've turned to every evening on our television are scientists, public health experts, epidemiologists, all from our university sector, providing the advice publicly to the people and privately to governments around the country about how to deal with the public health crisis. But the government's response to the system that generates the expertise and generates the capability has been a series of savage cuts and then this legislation. The higher education sector amongst our largest exporters is the biggest employer. You would think perhaps that if academics wore high vis to work that the government might pay more attention. In the course of the pandemic, Universities Australia, who have lacked a bit of courage themselves, I have to say, the peak body organisation uh, in their approach to this legislation, predict that 21,000 jobs will be cut from higher education this year. 11,000 have already gone. I just want to reflect on what previous Liberal governments have done. See, the university sector was built following the Second World War. Previously, it was the preserve of the sons of wealthy Australian squatter families and wealthy families to go to university. But in the post-war reconstruction, there was a bipartisan consensus to build an effective university sector. There's a bloke called Robert Menzies, the former member for Kuyong. It was a bipartisan achievement. He said, are the universities mere technical schools or have they as one of their functions the preservation of pure learning, bringing in its train not merely riches for the imagination but a comparative sense for the mind? and leading to what we need so badly, the recognition of values which are other than pecuniary. It was a small speech called The Forgotten People from 1942 that some of those opposite clutch when they're trying to remind themselves of the Liberal Party's moderate, what passes for what remains of their moderate wing. I even picked up Quadrant magazine the other day Robert Menzies, the former Prime Minister, said, our great function when we approach the problems of education is to equalise opportunity, to see that every boy and girl has a chance to develop whatever faculties he or she may have, because this will be a tremendous contribution to the good life for the nation. And under the Menzies government, in the post-war reconstruction, UNE, Monash, Macquarie, La Trobe, the University of Newcastle, the University of Flinders, all developed under that administration. The Whitlam government opened up education for everybody, and the Hawke-Keating governments, with Minister Dawkins, opened up the HECS funding model, which has provided so much income security for the system. 
This bill is a total repudiation of the Menzies and Whitlam legacy in higher education. You know, it used to be that the Liberals were for education. It used to be that they understood the Menzies tradition. You'd have to look pretty hard to find a moderate Liberal. They used to be called the wets. Now they couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. Senator Birmingham, nowhere to be seen, has gone along with this total craven capitulation run by a group of aspirants from the IPA whose experience of university was probably turning up as privileged, entitled young men, probably got talked over for the first time in their lives in a tutorial by a young woman who might have done that week's reading. When they're so used to just turning up and talking over everybody else. Well, this bill is a total repudiation of the equity principles that have underpinned the bipartisan consensus since World War II. It does it because the way that it manages underperforming students absolutely discriminates against those kids who are first in family kids to go to university. You know, those kids do have a stop start beginning. Life is tougher for those kids who've got no experience in their families before of going to university. Some of them fail in their first year. Some of them don't make it through, but they come back and they've got the resilience and they keep going. You know, I know some of them who failed in their first year, went away and did a bit of work and came back and they're now professors, making a great contribution to this country. But under your legislation, the message to them is don't ever darken our door again. And that is a terrible, terrible thing to do to equity in this country. It misunderstands the relationship between rural and city disadvantage. Terrible effects on the University of Western Sydney. But the people over here, senators over here, couldn't care less. It excludes people from high status courses. It sends a price signal to them which says, don't bother if you're a working class kid worried about debt. Don't bother becoming a lawyer. Don't bother studying political science because those courses are the preserve of the wealthy, people who are already privileged, who know people in their family who have gone through university. Well, that is a disgrace. It's a disgrace. I'm absolutely disappointed. I've watched the, the crossbenchers' consideration of this bill very closely. I've watched Senator Patrick and Senator Lambie apply a dose of healthy scepticism and both of their contributions on this bill have been absolutely fantastic and have recognised, particularly Senator Lambie, her, her contribution earlier this week and last week showed exactly what working class regional families think about this legislation. Uh, it should never have come before this parliament. And for the member for Mayo to come before this place and the other place, supporting this legislation is a craven capitulation. You know, the people of Mayo would be much better off with a Labor representative, much better off. But they may as well have had Georgina Downer, they may as well have had Jamie Briggs for all the good that it's done them. Because this capitulation is not only terrible for, uh, for school leavers in South Australia and their families, it is a terrible result for universities right across Australia and what should be a jewel in the crown of Australia's industrial and economic and research capability, our university system. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, to speak to this bill, but I'm first going to talk about uh, submarines and ships, and I'm going to do uh, do that, uh, asking for your indulgence. I will uh, definitely uh, link it back to the bill. Um, in 2012, in the Defence Capability Plan, uh, there was a, an item listed for the future submarine project for 12 uh, submarines for uh, greater than $10 billion. That was the sum 
that was indicated in the Defence Capability Plan. By 2015, in response to questions and estimates, that number had gone to $50 billion. In the 2016 uh, Integrated Investment Plan, the number rose again to $60 billion. In 2019, the number was $80 billion. And in September, uh, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, uh, in an estimates here, uh, sorry, a JCPAA hearing uh, not too long ago, uh, the defence came out with a new number, $89 billion. If I stick with the 2015 number, we can see that the submarine project has gone up from $50 billion to $89 billion. If I go to the Future Frigate Program, in 2016 that program was uh, listed to cost $30 billion in the Integrated Investment Plan. In 2017, it had gone to $35 billion. That was in the submarine shipbuilding, uh, naval shipbuilding plan. And in September of this year, in response to a question on notice uh, uh, through, the, through the Senate, the number has now gone to $45 billion. So the submarine project has gone from $50 billion to $89 billion. Now, most people don't even understand what that number means, so I'll, spell out, I'll, I'll say it slightly different. The submarine project has increased by $39,000 million. And the Future Frigate Program has increased uh, by, uh, it's gone from $30 billion to $45 billion. It's increased by $15,000 million. All up, $54,000 million. And have we heard a peep? Have we heard it mentioned much in this chamber? No. Now, when we look at this bill, if I come back to this bill that we're talking about, there's been motions, there has been inquiries, there has been extensive media coverage. We are now debating this bill. We are now uh, we are, we're going to vote for this bill. This bill is about $1,000 million, about a billion dollars, about the government saving a billion dollars. And I just wanted to point out the contrast of what's going on here. We have a considerable focus on a situation where the government's trying to save a billion dollars to great harm to the harm of our students. And yet on the, uh, 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 when we look at the defence side of the ledger, they can go up $54 billion and no one even notices. And one of the problems we've got is on that side of the chamber, you don't know how to deal with that. You want that to remain silent. You have no competence to be able to deal with, deal with what is a major blowout in defence projects, yet you're quite, quite prepared to come in here and cut a thousand million dollars from education. Shame. I just want the chamber to understand that contrast. Total incompetence on defence, total incompetence on project management in defence, yet you will uh, then steer to gain budget, some, some semblance of budget control that, you know, that in your thinking to save a billion. And these are for ships and submarines, I might point out, that won't be delivered until uh, late into this decade, 2035, if we're lucky for the submarines. We've got rising uh, tensions taking place in the South China Sea. Our geopolitical situation is changing dramatically, and we won't have a future submarine until 2035. It's like buying a parachute after the plane has crashed. We're seeing in this bill a lack of investment in our future. Education is our future. Post-COVID-19, the very thing we should be doing is investing in our future. And our future comes from our, from our children, from our students. That's where we ought to be investing our money. 
This bill takes us in the wrong direction. While you're squandering money on the defence side, not even paying any attention, completely incompetent as to what to do about it, you are destroying the future through a lack of investment in education. Now, the effects of this bill, just to be very clear, were well articulated by the, univers the, the uh, University of, of Adelaide's submission. And contrary to what Senator Griff said, whether universities are purportedly happy about this, if you read each of the submissions from the University of, uh, of Adelaide, from Flinders Uni and from um, UniSA, they all had deep concerns about this bill. Adelaide University put it very succinctly. A 9 per cent increase in hex help charges on average for their students. A 15 per cent reduction in federal support. A very significant cut to core funding for university research. I almost don't have to say anything else. The analysis there is this bill is bad for students, it's bad for universities, it's bad for research, it's bad for South Australia and it's bad for Australia. And to suggest somehow that the universities uh, in South Australia are in favour of this is ludicrous. This is a case of three steps backwards, two steps forward if we look at the negotiations that have been carried out by, uh, by Central Alliance. They have attempted to put a band-aid on a broken bone, and that doesn't work. The universities all agreed at the Senate inquiry, which I point out Senator Griff did not attend, they all agreed that the granting of regional status to the universities would be, better, uh, would be better, but overall it would be a case of three steps backwards, two steps forward. So the, the negotiations by Centre Alliance have not uh, uh, addressed that issue. Even the objectives of the bill, the objectives of the bill are to increase um, uh, funding in um, in areas of STEM or increase uh, the, the number of students that will go through uh, STEM courses. But it's interesting, when you look at the numbers for engineering, when you add up the government contribution and the, uh, and the student contribution, as it exists now, the, uni the university receives $28,958 for a, an engineering student. Under the new bill, they get 24000 it's a reduction. The same with engineering. So, uh, so, sorry, same with science. So, engineering and science both now provide the university with less funding. The same with agriculture, something that we're trying to uh, we're trying to foster in terms of uh, uh, in terms of our economy. It makes no sense. The Vice-Chancellor of the University of Adelaide articulated at hearing a more perverse example of this bill's, ver bill's flawed approach. The Vice-Chancellor said, Maybe I could try a hypothetical on you. Let's suppose a university is one science student below its quota, its cap, then adding one science student takes it up to its cap. The university could instead add 15 humanities students to take it up to its cap. Now the science uh, student is going to net you $24,000 or $25,000. Fifteen humanities students will net you around $235,000. There's the potential for universities to be driven by this factor. It will actually drive universities to do the, the absolute opposite of the stated objective of the bill. People don't choose their courses based on uh, a uh, a hex fee, they choose it on what it is that they think they want to do. They've looked around, they've done uh, in school, they've done uh, placements, school uh, work experience. They've looked and said, this is what I want to do. This is what mum and dad did. Culturally, this is what I, uh, this is what I need to do. 
No one was suggesting the debt was a factor that would, would uh, play in people's uh, minds when they selected a course. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't make uh, the, the bill okay. At the end of the course, what's going to happen is they're going to be burdened with debt. Burdened with debt. And uh, for Senator Griff to stand up and say that uh, you know, humanities students, so, uh, social studies, uh, you know, there's no, you know, the government's making a huge contribution. No, that's not the case. The government contribution for a social studies degree is uh, $1,100 uh, $1, per annum. And the student has to pay fourteen thousand five hundred. Again, if uh, if Senator Griffith turned up to the inquiry, he might have known that. The um, the real mechanism for controlling uh, numbers into into um, in the universities is, in, in actual fact, the ATARs. The bill should have focused on that. That's how universities control the numbers of students in each particular course category. It's something they have direct control of because they can't control the other things. I can tell you, my daughter, I've just been through uh, her choices for year 11 and 12. At no stage did we talk about HEX, but on the weekend she told me, Dad, I can tell you every ATARS for every course at Sydney University. She's memorised them. That's the lever you could have uh, played with if you really uh, were concerned or, or driven uh, to adjust the number of engineers coming out of uh, universities and the number of scientists coming out. could have funded them properly as well, but you didn't. You haven't used the right mechanisms. So you know, this bill cannot be salvaged. It is so broken it cannot be salvaged. I just want to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about the contribution that Senator Griff made. He himself said this bill is far from ideal. You've got a, a, a situation where a person can actually say no, can say go back to the drawing board, reset the course, Minister Tian. This, you know, you, no resetting the exam on this one, it's so flawed. You've got to go back and, and, and redo the course. Senator Griff could vote against it, this bill that is far from ideal in his own words. This, building, this bill provides less funding for more places. Now that can only mean one thing, that the quality of courses will go down. We're trying to be internationally competitive in Australia, yet the quality of our university degrees will fall as a result of this. There's no other choice. More courses, less money. More, more places, less money. Um, he talked about better funding through the you know, 3 3.5 per cent increase because of regional status. It doesn't do anything to deal with the 9 per cent cut to funding uh, that the University of Adelaide talked about. And he says it gives certainty. Now, no one in this place would ever think that a, the passage of a bill would give certainty, because in two years' time, when Senator Griff might not be here, the government of the day may pass another bill that changes things. So they've gone from a situation where they had a particular uh, regime in place, where they had more funding, to sell the idea that you're going to less funding, but at least you're certain about the less funding. It's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Unfortunately, Senator Alliance has sold out uh, students. I listened to a, uh, a girl named Keeley yesterday on the ABC, David Bevan's show on the ABC yesterday morning in Adelaide, talking about how she'd uh, gone through all the prerequisites. She was in year 12, gone through all the pre prerequisites to set herself up uh, for a uh, humanities-related course and now to be lumbered with this. David Bevan said to her, good luck, and I say to her, good luck, but I simply wish that Senator Griff have, had not put her in this position in the first place. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. Um, I rise to speak on the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020. That's quite the title, isn't it? But as we know, with bills from this government, this title of this bill is all about marketing and spin. It doesn't even come close to reflecting 
the reality of what this legislation will do, or, to be more frank, what this legislation won't do. Because the government has said that this legislation is necessary, that it will do certain things, but once we have a look at the practical implication of this very important legislation, it is very clear that it will not achieve what it is setting out to do. The bill will not make uni graduates more job ready, nor will it support most regional and remote students. Because there's always an asterisk on the end of what this government says it's going to do. There's always a caveat. What this bill says to students is that you can have a go if you can pay through the nose for your degree. You can have a go if your parents can afford to help you pay for your fees up front. You can have a go, but only, only if you study what we want you to study. And you can have a go, but absolutely do not make a mistake or get it wrong in that first year. This isn't a bill to get uni graduates into a job. This is a bill which will cut funding, jack up fees and lock students out. At a time when youth unemployment is at a record high, especially in regional Queensland, this bill won't do what it says it will do. It will just make it harder and more expensive for students to go to uni. Now, right now we know universities are hurting. This government is no friend to universities. They missed out on JobKeeper because the government changed the rules twice to keep them out of that scheme. And as a result, we have seen job losses around the country at universities, including in regional Queensland, where we have seen more than 300 job losses from the Central Queensland University in Rockhampton. Scott Morrison has done nothing to stop these job losses in our fourth largest export industry. He's shown no interest in the thousand of university staff losing their livelihoods or the communities that depend on these jobs. Instead, he's bringing this legislation in here, trying to tell people in regional areas that this will help, while well, we know that it won't. This bill is a slap in the face to students who want to study in regional centres across the country. Regional universities will be paid less to do more. Whether you are a student studying Cairns, Townsville, Mackay, this government is offering a raw deal for kids who might be the first one in their family to go to university. And it really doesn't matter how many times government senators come in here and read from the talking points on this legislation. Because what we know is this. Under the package, nearly twice as many regional and remote students will be forced to pay the highest rate of student fees. Regional universities deliver a higher proportion of courses that will have their funding cut compared to non-regional universities. We know that. No amount of spin can undo that fact. These universities will get less to do more with cuts to guaranteed funding of about $1 billion a year. And the Commonwealth's contribution toward, towards uni funding will drop from 58 per cent to 51 per cent, forcing students to carry 49 per cent of the load of their course fee. The bill won't do what it says it is going to do. It will not help regional students. It, will make young people, um, it won't make young people more job ready. It will make studying more expensive. And when the so-called job ready graduates package was announced by Minister Tan, there were a number of claims made which just do not stack up, stack up to scrutiny. Do not stack up to scrutiny. It has quickly become apparent that the minister's assumptions were based on ideology rather than fact. Humanities graduates are just as in demand as math and science graduates, and experts have found that price signals will not deter students from their preferred field of study. What the government's proposal does instead is saddle, saddle students with an increasing debt burden, with the average student paying 7 per cent more for their degree at a time during economic crisis. Unbelievable. The government will have you believe that the reason they are doing this is because we need more skills in key areas. But this government, this government is the reason that we have a skills crisis in regional Australia. 
This government has defunded TAFE and failed apprentices. Their, this is their skills crisis, but now they're blaming students for choosing the wrong degrees. And yet they go one step further from this. They want to punish students who struggle in their first year. And I draw the Senate's attention to the comments made by the CQ University in their submission to the Senate inquiry on this bill. I won't read out the full submission, but I want to draw the attention to this comment. They say, students lead complex lives. Within the CQ University's student profile, most are working, many have supporting partners and parents, and as such, the aspect of the proposed legislation is potentially extremely limiting and inequitable for them. That is what a regional university is saying about this proposal. This is particularly prevalent, they say, for students who come from underrepresented or disadvantaged backgrounds, including low socioeconomic, regional, rural and remote and indigenous students. Given one intent of the Job Ready Graduates package is to increase indigenous student participation rates in higher education through the introduction of a demand-driven funding allocation, this amendment seems counterproductive and detrimental to their overall success. Now, that is what regional universities are saying about this proposal. But what are regional students saying? Because we don't hear a lot of their voices in the speeches from government senators. Unlike members of the government, I've taken the time to listen to young people and young students who will be affected directly by this regressive proposal. If every senator Every senator did the same thing, they would not be supporting this bill. Students in regional Queensland feel anxious, unsupported, and left behind by these plans, and they fear what the LNP has in store for them. Emily studies marine biology at JCU in Townsville, and has, they have been hit um, and hit the nail on the head when describing how this proposal will impact poorer students. She told me that Townsville students are already struggling under this economic crisis. They're struggling so much financially that they are relying on a food pantry at the university just to afford groceries. That is the situation that these regional students are in. And Emily said, not only is this government attacking higher education, but they're cutting student income support, plunging many students back into poverty. Most regional students come from low socioeconomic backgrounds and don't have that financial safety net. If they do have a tough semester, their parents can't support them into continuing that education. I listen to many students during this process to understand their stories and to tell their stories today. And I want to thank them for sharing their stories, but now I want to share my story. I was the first person in my family to go to university. I was lucky that I had a parent who told me that if you work hard and you can do what you want, you can achieve anything you want to. And I've spoken publicly in my first speech about the struggles of growing up in the home that I grew up in. In that home, I knew instinctively that I needed to work hard and study hard so I could secure my own future, so I could take care of my parents when I had the chance, so that if I ever had children, I would be able to give them more than I had. I worked hard to get my chance, but I still couldn't afford to go straight to university. That was beyond me. So I did a traineeship for the year after school and I saved my money. I applied for scholarships, anything that I could possibly get so I could finally achieve this dream. I moved away from home so I could go to university and study what I wanted, which was arts and humanities. I didn't study this course because I didn't want to get a job. Like, I wanted a job more than anything in the world. I wanted a career, but it was what I was good at. And I knew that this degree would actually make me job ready for a huge range of industries this idea that humanities or art students aren't employable is just absolute rubbish. And yes, the first year of university was not easy. It was hard to adjust, but I found my feet. I studied, I worked hard, there were ups and downs. I went back at night to study during the GFC when I lost my job. Under this bill, 
thinking about the huge debt that I might have to have paid off, thinking about the possibility of losing access to support if I made a mistake in the first year, that would have made me think twice about studying. It wouldn't have made me think twice about studying another area. It would have made me think twice about studying all together. And maybe I wouldn't have studied un at university at all. I wouldn't have got that chance. Australia should be a country where kids are able to study. A traineeship, an apprenticeship and a university degree, no matter who your parents are or what you want to study. If your mum is a nurse like mine or a doctor or a teacher or a bus driver, it should not matter how much money your parents have, but under this bill it will. Australia was that country under Labor. That's why I got the chance to go to university, to step out of the cycle, to build a life for myself. But under this Liberal National Government, I would not have stood a chance. It wasn't my fault and it wasn't my mum's fault that she chose safety over financial security. Kids should not be punished, should not be punished for coming from a family where they need to work harder, harder to get that chance. And they should not be deterred. But under this bill, that is exactly what will happen. Kids from single parent families will be deterred from going and studying. I wouldn't have got my chance. Ultimately, whether this bill passes or fails will hinge on how the Crossbents votes. And sadly, we have seen One Nation sell out young people in regional centres like Rockhampton and Mackay by agreeing to support this bill. It is unsurprising, but it is still incredibly disappointing. The crossbench should vote against this bill. I applaud Senator Lambie for publicly coming out against this bill. My message to Senate Alliance and any other senators who are planning on supporting this legislation is to listen to what young people are saying and oppose this bill. Grow a spine and do the right thing. Don't fall for this marketing and spin. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy Madam President. As a kid, you're asked what you want to do when you grow up. Your answer is based on what you see around you. If your mum and dad work in an office all day, you might say you want to be a lawyer or a scientist. You might assume, even as a kid, that you'll go and get a higher education. But if none of the adults in your life went to university, you just don't know how to picture yourself there. You haven't got the living, breathing example of the sort of person that goes and gets themselves a degree. So you don't see it as something you'll probably do. For me, I never thought I'd make it to uni. Always seen, seen, saw university as being for someone else. The sorts of people who went to uni, in my eyes, were the ones on TV. They were the politicians making decisions a world, a world away. They were the journalists asking them thorny questions and delivering every bit of daily news with a deep voice and a steady pace. They were the scientists making breakthroughs and people who wore suits in the cities. It isn't like that for everyone. When you live in Sydney or Melbourne and your parents both went to uni and they're professionals who work in white collar jobs on computers in air conditioned offices, you grow up seeing every day what's available to you. You don't question it. It just happens. But that's not what it's like on the northwest coast of Tasmania. Certainly not in my day and it's not how I saw myself. For me, I went to TAFE. I studied the same place as my mum. My dad, he drove trucks. And when I, when, I turned into, when I was a teenager, I lived through, I lived in public housing. I dropped out of year 11 and I joined the army. And don't get me wrong, I'm proud of that. I'll always be proud of that. I'm proud of where my experiences in my community got me. And it was a good life. And I'm so proud of all the decent per people on the northwest coast and living in the rural and regional areas of Tasmania who quietly do so much to make our state and our country a better place to live. But I know what opportunity means to many in those rural and regional areas of Tasmania, and I know what it means to sustain it or to suffocate it. I know how hard it can be for people who live there to make their way into a place like this. It's still too hard. 
We aren't living in a land of opportunity yet, and it seems to get further and further away. I carry the weight of what I'm up here for and the people where I'm from. They know I'm here, and to them I might as well be in a foreign country. They see me rubbing shoulders with you guys. They see me on TV mixing it up with the kinds of people that are supposed to be on the TV news. I hope that when they see me, they think, well, if she's got there, I can get there too. I can do it better than what Lambie can. And they'd probably be right. <laughs> if they were. <laughs> they'd be better than Senator McKinn too. <laughs> if there were more of those guys up here, the country would be a lot better off, I can tell you. But I feel them watching me now. Every decision I make in this place, I feel them watching me. I want to be a good example for the kids, for our kids of the future. And many of them I'll never meet. And those parents who wonder if their children really can be whatever they want to be when they grow up, if that opportunity will exist for their children. Because more and more there are kids, on, kids in the rural and regional areas of Tasmania who want to work in politics when they grow up. They want to be politicians. God forbid knows why. They want to be on TV. They know they have things to say that the country needs to hear. And I know those kids and their parents see what I do. Maybe not on every bill, maybe not on every boat. But they've got skin in the game, even if they don't know it. They're trusting me to stand here and make the right choices. That's how I come at this bill. That's what's on my mind when I look at what the government's trying to do, because I know that the members of the Morrison government have no idea what it's like to fight tooth and nail to get the opportunities you deserve, to not have everything passed to you on a silver platter by mummy and daddy. That's the reality of most Australians. They have no idea what it's like to be the first one in your family to make it to uni or find yourself moving in social circles in this place. They have no idea what it's like to make your way around people who talk in an accent that's different to yours and use words that your parents wouldn't understand. They have no idea how scary it is to enter into that. That's what I'm thinking about when it comes to this bill. And I'll be damned if I'll vote to tell those kids in those rural and regional areas of Tasmania that they deserve to have their opportunities suffocated in a way they'd never even know. I'm not doing it. I'll never do that. I don't care what you offer. You can offer me a billion bucks for Tasmania, but I won't sell out our kids in Tasmania. I will never do that, nor will I ever sell any other Australian kid out when it comes to their education. I will never, ever, ever do that. I'm not going to be the one that gets here and tells them to bugger off because I'm right. I've got mine. I refuse to be the vote that tells poor kids out there or those sitting on that fine line, no matter how gifted, no matter how determined you are, might as well dream a little cheaper because you're never going to make it, because you can't afford it. I won't take that off them. I won't be a part of that. No one vote can stop a bill. It takes 30 us of up here to do that, 38 of us up here to do that, and no vote can pass a bill either. It takes 39 to do that. Senator Griff isn't passing this bill by himself. He's one of 39. He just happens to be the 39th. And trust me, as a crossbench, I've been there before. It's not fair to say that lay the fault of this bill on the feet, on the feet of Senator Griff. His decision to support this disappoints me, sure. But he didn't decide the other 30 votes who line up, up next to him. He didn't do that. Everybody who votes for this bill is responsible for it passing, and any person sitting in favour it can change their mind and beat it. It's not Senator Griff passing this bill. It's the majority of the Senate. Senator Griff's decision is just more heartbreaking because 36 votes in this place are being told how to vote. That's right. At least Senator Griff's got the opportunity to make his own mind up. The others, they just do as they're told. Democracy at work, huh? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? They're told where to sit. They're told how hard to, how hard to jump. And that's, and that's pretty much how it works when the bells ring. You know, those backbenchers get 200,000 bucks a year to see you told to shut up, do as you're told, and take the vote where I tell you to. That's how it works. That's what they get paid for. 
God forbid it's embarrassing, isn't it? But that's democracy, apparently. I can live with the way I'm voting. I'll hold my head up high, and if I lose votes for it, I'll lose them with pride. If I lose my seat, I'll lose, I'll lose it with pride. I didn't get into politics to dim the futures of the people or our kids. I'm here to help. And if the price of staying in politics is betraying the people I'm here for, I'll leave with grace. My future isn't worth more than theirs. My goals, my hopes and dreams aren't more important than our kids. I'm here for them. We're all supposed to be here for them. We're supposed to be here so they have a decent future and we lay that out in front of them. This will become law and I'll go back to them and say, hey guys, I tried. I really tried. I did what I could, but I fell short. I'll say to them, if I had a degree, maybe I may have won the day. Maybe that would have made me a little bit smarter on my feet. Who knows? And I'll say that. If you're sick of people who've never known the kind of life that I've seen or they've seen deciding on what's, what's on the menu for people like you, beat them at their own game. If the tools it takes to win are only available to the well-off, they'll keep winning and we'll keep losing, and the divide between the richer and poorer will keep getting greater. That's where this country is going. It's just worth unpacking with this bill supposed to do. It is supposed to create more places at university. university. You ask them for evidence, it'll create more places, and the room goes quiet. And even if it's making more places, it's giving no more money, no money to universities to teach them. It's supposed to align funding with the cost of teaching. Sounds good to me, but the only bit of evidence they're relying on to set the cost of teaching is evidence that nobody thinks is even close to reality. But then again, you know, what's worth more, real life experience or an education? I guess if you had both, it'd make you a better person. It's supposed to be a bill that encourages people to study in areas where job prospects are the highest and discourages people from studying things where job prospects are the lowest. But it's cutting funding for engineering, it's cutting funding for science, it's making it more expensive to study business. You don't think our economic future is going to need engineers, scientists, small businesses? It makes no sense. If this was a good bill, it wouldn't have to rely on evaporating evidence to win over support. If this was a good bill, the evidence would be there for all to see. Instead, it's set to pass courtesy of a sweetheart deal for South Australia. But here's, here is the rub. The bill is built to be budget, budget neutral. It's about saving money. So sweetheart deals don't come for free. They just mean that more, the more money is going to have to come from somewhere else and someone's going to have to pay the price. The question you need to ask yourself is, where else is, going, where else is it going to come from? Are the states? Are the students? Who's going to lose so you can get this win? I'm pleased to hear that Senator Griff has the support of Vice-Chancellor of South Australian Universities. It's important that they're supportive. I can see how that might help persuade someone to support this bill. It doesn't, su doesn't, support, it doesn't persuade me much, though. I don't take advice on how to help poor kids from the three blokes making one million bucks a year. I can assure you of that much. And I sure as hell, after hearing from the rest of the University of Tasmania, who were right up against their own vice-chancellor and said, do not take that deal, listen to the vice-chancellor. I've seen it for what it was. I've seen what the majority wanted. That's how it worked. And I heard the rest of the Australian universities and I heard the rest of the kids. I come from a place in Tasmania with the lowest graduation rates in the country. If there's anybody who knows anything about what it means to be locked out of university, it's me. I live and breathe the North West Coast. It's in my bones. I'll tell you this right now. The North West Coast isn't patting you on the back for this and neither are the bloody kids down there. They're never going to thank you for taking away their dreams their futures and making their lives even more miserable. I'm thinking about them when I decide how to vote. I don't know what we're debating and what we're doing today. They'll just be looking at courses a few years from now and wondering how it got so expensive and how we let, let it get so bad and how we let them down. Well, I didn't let them down. It was the other people on the other side. They won't remember your name. 
They won't remember this bill. They'll treat the world we're creating for them today as a world as it, as it is. One where rich kids get the course of their dreams and the poor kids get the scraps. Nothing changes. One where rich kids get discounts and poor kids get debts. Where if you can't afford to study full time, you fail, you lose, you're out, you're finished, you're gone. Get on the damn dull queue. University is not for you unless you, unless you can buy your way into it, and that's where we're going now. You want to go to university? Good. Go and eat noodles, get two or three jobs while the rich kids, they get everything from mummy and daddy. It's just great. It's a great example to set for um, Australia. I, I, can, I cannot actually see anything more un Australian, to be honest. I, it makes me feel really sick that it's actually come to this. Is this what we want, a country of such divide between the rich and the poor and the ones in the middle where well, there's very little of those left? And by geez, we haven't even got to the middle of next year with this COVID yet. But you know what really, really, really annoys me about the Liberal National Party more than anything? It will hit the most vulnerable first. If it's not our veterans, if it's not our aged, if it's not those totally permanently incapacitated uh, soldiers out there, you know, if it's, and then it's the students, you will go after those that are most vulnerable and you will sure as hell go after those who don't give you political donations. And this is killing the country. This is not the way forward. It's time you put the country first and put your ideology in a suitcase because it's enough. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Carr. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I stand proudly with the Labor Party in opposing this bill. I do so because this bill ushers in probably the most radical overhaul of higher education that we've seen in the last perhaps 20 years. And it does nothing of what it actually claims to do. It will not make graduates better prepared for jobs. In fact, with our 6 per cent reduction in government support in funding, it will make funding of university places actually produce poorer quality higher education. It reduces public funding for science. It reduces public funding, of course, for so many areas that we assert in engineering and other fields that we assert are central to the future directions of the country. This bill will increase, not decrease, the obstacles faced by regional universities because it simply does not take into account the higher than average teaching costs in those regions. This bill is another step towards the Americanisation of our higher education system. It has been unseemly rushed, it's ill-conceived and it's extremely poorly drafted. It probably has the highest level of ministerial discretion of any higher education bill I've had to deal with in my time in this chamber. The system is inherently inequitable. It will reinforce the inequality, reinforce privilege and the patterns of power and wealth in this country. Instead of opening the doors for opportunities it will actually undermine the capacities of the poorer and less privileged people in our country to be able to participate. It's about extending the levels of debt, extending the levels of debt, particularly at a times when people are forming families, trying to buy houses and actually trying to set up their lives. With many people faced with debts for an undergraduate degree of $45,000 plus, of course, the postgraduate degrees that many jobs now require, 
of another $60,000. There's $100,000 of debt being accumulated for many of our young people setting up jobs, for instance, in the Australian Public Service. We are seeing the circumstances which actually reduces the capacity of people. And we are moving further and further and further away from the principles that underpin the way in which the higher education contribution scheme was originally established. This bill changes the funding of student places. That means that we now have to have more places with less money. There can only be one consequence of that, lower quality. Higher classes, higher class sizes, bigger lectures, more casualisation of our university staffing arrangements and less ability to provide the wherewithal for a quality education. It will also undermine our research capabilities for our public universities, capabilities which are actually essential to our long-term national pr prosperity, essential to our ability to build a more productive, a more innovative, a more complex economy. A research capability upon which our universities' reputations depend, the basis on which they attract international students. Their international rankings are depending on their research rankings, and this bill undermines those. The bill breaks the nexus between teaching and research. And of course, what have the university vice chancellors got in return? Well, of course, they've been dealing with a government that treats them like a bully treats a victim. And they think by trying to be nice to the bully, the bully will leave them alone. The evidence, of course, is to the contrary. Another example of where hope, of course, exceeds experience. On the question of research, the government's now come forward with a proposition well provides you with emergency funding of $1 billion for one year. How many research projects last for one year? What happens in the second year? How many staff are employed beyond the one year? Of course, there's no answer to those things because it's emergency funding for one year. It includes a number of research infrastructure projects. It's not what it's made out to be. It's not about rebuilding the research capacity of our universities. It's in fact probably about one-seventh of what's actually needed and it's probably about half of what's been lost in this one year alone. This is a bill that takes a billion dollars a year out of the university system. So I suppose that's what you mean by stability and, and certainty, that you know that you're going to have reductions of that size. And of course, is it any wonder that the Scotty from marketing team is able to promote this so completely within the media the way it is at the moment? Because it's so often presented in a totally distorted manner. And it's part of a broad pattern of hostility towards universities which we've seen, for instance, in terms of the long-standing assault upon the research and development capabilities of the country. How many times have we seen research and development laws attempt to be amended and cuts to research and development uh, be amended through this time? And of course, it's failed in this chamber. And of course, this bill, however, produces an amendment uh, to the Higher Education Act, which now, in fact, commit higher reductions than even the Birmingham bill, higher reductions than, of course, the Pine bill. This minister has been able to secure, through these private arrangements he's entered into, more dramatic changes, more transformational changes to the universities than these two predecessors. And of course, it's openly speculated in the press, and was made the point made in the Senate inquiry, that he's now open, of course, to any portfolio he wants in the forthcoming reshuffle. And there's a very interesting point about any of the concessions that have been made as to whether or not they're actually in the bill, because the minister may not be there come December, 
And so much of this bill relies upon ministerial discretion. It may well be that the promises made don't ever have to be honoured because there'll be a new minister on the scene. This is the assumptions that are being made. And of course, we see in other bills that are being presented, like the sister bill, uh, we see in terms of the uh, changes to the provider category standards and other measures bill, there'll be changes to the way in which research is actually calculated in universities. We may in fact see that there are less universities in this country being classified as universities because of those changes. And other devices will be put to bear as to what will be, what may be interpreted as a form, another form of intimidation. Universities are constantly told, well, you're not following our version of what freedom of speech is about. And if it's not freedom of speech, you're told, well, of course, you're being uh, subject to foreign interference, despite the fact that there's been no breaches publicly declared of any of these measures in regard to the extraordinary regulations in regard to the Defence Exports Control Acts or any of the associated provisions. We have our academics pilloried across the front pages of our newspapers, like some sort of giant wanted poster, alleged to be some sort of collaborators with a foreign power. Our vice chancellors are told that they're too China friendly. Various devices have been imposed to suggest that the universities should be more compliant. Universities and with themselves are told they've got to get a good relationship with the government. And if they don't get a good relationship with the government, their funding will be cut. Well, of course, you can try to get a good relationship with this government, your funding still will be cut. And of course, we see that very much in this bill. What we see is this government has a profound and deep and abiding hostility to the university system. It has this bizarre notion that somehow or another universities are in fact hostile to it. It's a nonsense. The university system in this country represents all the strengths and all the weaknesses of the country at large. They're not the great centres of radical thought that some people on the opposition benches seem to suggest. I think, for instance, in the current parliament, the member for Curtin, the former vice-chancellor, the member for Higgins, former academic, medical uh, academic, the member for Reid, a for, as former lecturer at Sydney West, uh, West, West Sydney University. I think of our own president, a former political science academic at the University of Melbourne, Mel uh, Senator McKenzie, a lecturer in education at Monash University. I think, of course, in past times, many others. Former education minister, David Kemp, Dr David Kemp, a lecturer in political science, again at Melbourne University, and a professor of politics at Monash. The universities in this country have produced, oh, there was uh, others, of course, uh, that uh, were off, went off to be ambassadors and the like, former senators here. The universities in this country have produced a whole range of people from conservative backgrounds as they have from Labor backgrounds and many other shades of opinion. It's just a terrible, terrible mistake to make an assumption that the universities are in fact hostile to conservative thinking in this country and that they have to be tamed, that they have to be controlled, that they have to be dominated. It's an anathema to the very principles of democratic thinking. But this is the presumption that exists within this government. And they produce results such as this bill, which is about punishment, which is about retribution. It's about demonstrating a, an attitude towards the university system that we've got to reduce their expenditure and, under, and undermine their public support as measured by that expenditure. 
So much of what, of course, is in this package is not actually in this bill because it relies upon government discretion, a point that the various committees and Madam Deputy Chair, a point that you have made on numerous occasions, an increasing problem within the legislation of this parliament, where the principles, the legislative principles, the policy principles are not actually contained in the bill itself, but are left to delegated legislation and to ministerial discretion, not subject to parliamentary accountability. There's a persistent theme here within this government, throughout the various governments that have, uh, have been uh, demonstrated through the various education ministers that we've seen in recent times. And this bill is a culmination of that thinking. Profound hostility, prejudice, dishonesty, dressing up as a support for regions which in fact undermines the regions, suggesting we're going to have more student places which are in fact underfunded, a cut to our research program of catastrophic proportions. And then, of course, a one-year relief package, a one-year emergency relief package, which gives no security, no certainty and no defence for our long-term national interests. This is a package of measures that clearly demonstrates that government doesn't understand, appreciate or value higher education, doesn't understand the importance of the university system to the future welfare of this nation. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. My colleague, Senator Faruqi, had to withdraw her blunt assessment of this bill yesterday. So I'm going to translate. So rather than offending the Senate and telling it how it is, what I'll say is that this bill sounds like ship and rhymes with chit. This bill is a pile of doo-doo. This bill smells like a toilet and it's really crappy. And shame on the government to bring it on. Shame on Senator Griff and Senator Alliance. Shame on One Nation for supporting it. In short, this bill is going to more than double student fees in the humanities and social sciences. It's going to slash up to $900 million in funding for teaching and learning, and it's going to punish struggling students. It gives the finger to young people. And this is tragic. Because education doesn't just benefit individuals. As a country, we are better off when our citizens and community members have easy access to education. When education is a right for everyone at all stages of life. And the Greens believe that education should be free from early childhood to tertiary degrees because it benefits society, it benefits the economy, it benefits individuals. And we should be doing everything we can particularly as we are recovering from this pandemic, to encourage and support people to be undertaking university degrees and TAFE courses, to rebuild, to build their skills, their knowledge and their understanding of the world. Because having an educated society means that we've got workers with the skills to tackle the climate emergency, to create the clean green energy revolution that we desperately need. It means that we've got the social workers, the doctors, the nurses, the epidemiologists and the other specialists to help, get, help us go, get us through the pandemic. And having educated society means that we can flourish with the creative thinkers, the problem solvers, the artists, those who can help us learn from and reflect on where we've come and where we're going to, that can you know, chart our course into the future. And these are the skills that the humanities and the arts develop. I mean, higher education has enormous benefits, and we need to be investing in it, not slashing, as this bill does, just at the time when we need to be resetting our economy post-COVID. I mean, this Liberal Party bill is going in entirely the wrong direction. An average, as I said, I mean, it's going to more than double students 
fees. It's going to slash up to $900 million in funding. It's going to punish struggling students. Average course fees are expected to rise by over 7 per cent over the next year alone. And some of the estimates that we've seen say it could take over 20 years to pay off a three-year arts degree. That's assuming, of course, that graduates will be able to access consistent, reasonable paying work, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic and recession. I mean, the slashing of $900 million in funding to teaching and learning means that students are going to have to make up a lot of that gap through fee hikes. And universities, which are already cutting their teaching staff to the bone, will have to make up to the rest. Consider that in the context of last night's budget, where we had the government giving $99 billion in handouts to, and tax cuts to businesses with no guarantee that we will have anything to show for it at the end of it, other than businesses buying a lot of stuff and most of it probably completely imported, bigger shareholder profits and incentives to, for young people to be employed in short-term, insecure, part-time work. Our long-suffering young people being shafted yet again. I mean, we're meant to be applauding the government sort of saying we're going to give a billion dollars of funding to universities for teaching and research. I mean, this only just covers what's being slashed from universities in this field. And there's an underlying issue too with the number of places that the Liberal Party is willing to fund at university. I mean, put simply, there just aren't enough. Large numbers of young people want to go to university, and that's a good thing. At the same time, people at every stage of life, having got getting through this um, pandemic, may be taking this opportunity to retrain and upskill. And this package does not account for that. And one of the worst aspects of this bill is it's going to punish students to fail more than half their subjects by cutting off their access to HEX. This already just so much inequality built into our education system. We know that people from privileged, wealthier backgrounds are able to draw upon resources and face far fewer challenges in being able to access education. And they're less likely to need to take up a part-time job that cuts into their time for, for sleep and for well-being. I mean, the current experiences of my two kids give me a small insight into what's currently wrong with our tertiary education sector and how this government is failing young people. I mean, my kids are privileged and they've got family to, to fall back on and to support them during tough times. But the experiences of so many more of our young people are far, far more dire. My eldest son, John, he's doing a PhD in linguistics and he's pretty well placed because he's got a scholarship and he's got part-time work, tutoring in linguistics to support himself. But sadly, he caught COVID three months ago and he's still unwell. So he's had to take leave from his PhD and he's had to move back and, of course, not be teaching his classes. He's had to move back home so that I can help look after him, which is why I'm here in Melbourne rather than in Canberra this week. His work, of course, is, is of course, casual work. So there's no job security, no sick pay. And if he didn't have me to fall back on, he would be in a really desperate situation. He'd be unwell, unable to pay the rent, and desperately worried about what the future holds. But it's already been really tough for him to cope with having COVID and post-viral symptoms for three months now. And I can only imagine what his state of mind would be if he had the extra burden of you know, thinking about what the future was, was going to hold. You know, just surviving to contend with. And there are many, many people in, in worse situations who do not have that family to fall back on. And this is the state of our tertiary system today. My younger kid, Leon, is doing an arts degree. And they've worked in hospitality in the arts sector to support themselves through their degree. And of course, there's been not much work in those fields over the last six months. And no job keeper payments for Leon either, because of course, all of their work was casual and they haven't been working with the same employer for over 12 months. So they've been very appreciative of, of receiving the COVID supplement on top of their student allowance, but that's now being slashed. So they are now worrying about how they're going to be able to afford to pay the rent once the, cut, the cuts kick in. Because of course, the casual work in arts and hospitality doesn't look like it's about to come back in a hurry here in Melbourne. And again, they know that if things really get tough, that 
Yes, I would step in with some rent assistance. I'd be able to fall back upon the bank of mum. And I think of all the young people who don't have the security, who in the current economic circumstances are going to find themselves couch surfing or worse. And last night's budget was giving tax cuts to millionaires, $99 billion of handouts to big business, and it hasn't helped them one jot. And who, if they are doing an arts degree like Leon, and they are looking at a massive increase in their student debt. And you would be forgive, forgive them for thinking, what's the point for throwing in the towel to feel really morose about what their future holds? I mean, we have a mental health pandemic in this country, and it is of no surprise Actions like this bill are just making it worse. And this is also, of course, in the context of the other massive cuts and the slashing and burning that the universities have had to do to keep afloat with the loss of, of international students. I mean, under our corporatised, privatised university system, um, rather than supporting universities, the government is just happy to see them wither away, away to be a shell of their former self. And what's more, far from supporting STEM, this government is actively presiding over a system which is seeing our once great research and teaching in this area contract massively. And I've got an indication of just how bad things are from a friend who's a maths lecturer at one of our leading universities. At his university, there have been 355 voluntary departures. And he says that so far that they have saved about $50 million that $200 million is the cost-saving target by all sorts of savings, including a, t a round of targeted redundancies. The government is promoting STEM, the usual smoke and mirrors, but we in maths and stats will be losing six of about 30 academic staff, having already lost around that many over the last couple of years for retirement and resignation. He says that the level of staff losses probably depends on how close people were to retirement. Most are pretty happy to get out. The package was pretty attractive. Stats is OK, but maths is somewhat decimated. And the rest of us are wondering what the workloads are going to be like going forward. But we'll need to use some of the research-focused staff to do large class teaching. They won't enjoy it, and the students won't enjoy it. And when he says large class teaching, this is what he means. He says that COVID has dramatically accelerated the move to online, and then he's going to be teaching a class of 900 next year, 900 students online. He said, I did a class of 450 last semester and got a good teaching score, so I'm sure 900 will work, but it relies on recorded lectures and interactive Q&A sessions and sufficient marking support. It wasn't imposed on me. I agreed to do it, but it has become an absolute necessity with all the departures. I guess the main takeout is the government's failure to support higher, he higher ed has led to a heap of 50-something STEM people escaping the sector, which acts directly against any support for STEM. And it acts directly about the quality of the university education that our young people are able to, to get. I mean, the National Tertiary Education Union, they summed up this bill they said, should this bill be passed, the direct result will be the under-resourcing of Commonwealth-supported students by public universities already under substantial financial pressures due to the COVID-19 crisis, with sector losses currently projected to be around $16 billion over the next three years and 21,000 full-time equivalent job losses. This is just tragic. And the most galling part about this whole system is the hypocrisy. The Liberal Party is stacked with ministers who got their university education for free, including the Prime Minister. But now they're in power, they're just pulling the ladder up after them. And as I said, I mean, the Greens believe that universities should be free. I also benefited from free education at uni. So why should those of my generation and all those government ministers who benefited from it why should we be the ones that, that benefit but leave the young people of today high and dry? I mean, we could afford it then and we can afford it now. Again, you think of they're spending $99 billion in last night's budget. We can afford free education. It is a matter of choice. 
I want you to know what free education felt like. I mean, free ed tertiary education to me meant that I felt that the world was open to me. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 18. Who does? I mean, I did a science degree because I thought, oh, I can put off making a decision about what, I, about what my career is going to end up to a later stage. It meant that I could study whatever I wanted. It was, and free tertiary education was freedom. It was hope. It gave me a sense of launching off into a life full of potential rather than a life full of debt. I mean, put simply, this bill is the Liberal Party's attempt to destroy the university sector under the cover of the bill. It will cut university funding when they're already desperately underfunded. It will hurt Australians who need to access education. It will hurt our society. It will leave us poorer and dumber when we are facing the joint challenges of a pandemic, a climate emergency and the inequality crisis. This bill should not be passed. It will be a disaster for our future. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Rice. And Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support the government's changes to university funding. Firstly, though, we agree with the government's general thrust. Secondly, we want to go further to ensure responsibility among students and to reduce taxpayer load. Thirdly, we want to restore accountability and academic freedom in universities, to make our universities better so that our future students will emerge better. So let's get to the government's thrust. It reduces fees for courses that meet needs for future jobs and more practical courses like engineering, nursing and teaching. We support that. It will make these courses more, more affordable. It raises fees for humanities courses, and I'll explain later why that is, uh, that is so effective, because humanities people with graduates are not getting jobs right now. The government's thrust focuses taxpayer funds on needed skills, and that is good for our country. So the second point I wanted to discuss was that we need to go further to ensure responsibility among students and to reduce taxpayer load. The current HECS debt is $65 billion and growing rapidly. That's the outstanding HECS debt. With Australia's national debt now pushing $1 trillion, the repaid HECS money could be used productively. We believe that we need to reinstate the 10 per cent discount for fees paid up front. Now, people who pay their fees up front, people who, who Sorry, people who can afford university do not need the concessional interest rate, and as things start, do not need to repay debt, do not start repaying debt until earning an annual income of $46,620. Financially, it is better value for the government and for taxpayers, and we do represent taxpayers, to have a loan paid up front at a discount than paid out over 10 plus years. It takes, on average, about 10 years for a student to repay a hex debt, and we need to reduce the threshold for repaying hex debt, based on data and fairness to students and fairness to taxpayers. Remember them? The people who are paying our salaries? The people who run this country? We need to limit student entitlement to seven years full-time equivalent and stop people on fee-free fee university education with little or no chance of a job. Students cannot continue to live off the taxpayer forever. We've got to get job-ready graduates. We have a duty to protect taxpayers and to protect our nation, our community, as well as to protect students. The third area, restoring accountability and academic freedom in universities. Universities monitor student academic progress, and students who repeatedly fail for example, if they do not pass uh, more than half of the subjects, should stop getting fee help. This removes a fee-free career for university students who keep failing. We also need students to be aware of what they're getting from taxpayers' money, and we need job-ready graduates. I can give you some examples of universities suppressing free speech. Dr Peter Ridd was sacked from his position at James Cook University 
for being critical of poor quality reef science. He was fulfilling his duties as a scientist to challenge his colleagues, and he was sacked. And the recent Senate inquiry in Queensland vindicated him when academics admitted facts and data that revealed the Queensland State Labor government does not have the facts to support its recent reef regulations. Peter Ridd was correct. Professor Bob Carter, the late Professor Bob Carter, well known globally as a fine scientist, paleoclimatologist, he was prevented and hindered from speaking by James Cook University. And now just here recently at the ANU, Dr Howard Brady, a noted geologist and an un un understands climate extremely well, was invited by the staff at the University of Queensland, at University ANU, to pr make a presentation on the impacts of, of, of the uh, study of climate science and what's, why it's gone wrong. ANU prohibited him, after the notice was sent out, ANU prohibited him from delivering that seminar. But here's a, here's a welcome sign from ANU. Professors and staff at ANU were so disgusted with the ANU's response that they joined together and Dr Brady will now be conducting his seminar later this month. And they've given him immense publicity internationally. He's received support from the University of Sydney staff, from the ANU staff, from other universities within Australia and from overseas universities, including Princeton. The former High Court Chief Justice Robert French recommended in his government commissioned review of free speech at Australian universities that academic freedoms be protected so data and research can be put forward. That's a scientist's responsibility. Justice French recommended that as part of academic freedom, academics should be allowed to, quote, to make lawful public comment on any issue in their personal capacities. Universities allow, indeed encourage, far-left Marxists, anarchists, socialists and communists to speak freely on university campuses, yet do nothing to stop these same fascists shutting down lecturers with whom these fascists disagree. In not protecting free speech of all voices, universities are complicit in the suppression of speech. Now, I went to the University of Queensland where I got a Masters in Business Administration and I'm very proud to say that the dean of that university just recently, a few years ago, welcomed students with a note saying, there are no free spaces, no free, no safe spaces at the University of Chicago. Basically, he was saying, suck it up, discuss and debate freely. That's what universities were about. That's what they need to get back to being about. And recently, I was listening with a university vice chancellor, a regional university vice chancellor, who subtly admitted to me that the capital city unis have fouled their nests because of their craving for political correctness and their fear of upsetting people. The media reported Professor Ritter saying he supported, quote, any moves to improve the disastrous situation at the moment where academic freedom of speech effectively does not exist. At present, universities are applying their vague codes of conduct on top of academic freedom of speech. And this means academics have to be respectful and collegiate. Any robust debate, as he points out, is likely to seem disrespectful to somebody. So that is a way of shutting down debate. That's how universities that fear academic freedom or are too gutless to ensure freedom suppress academic freedom and free speech. And we need practical graduates. And my three years underground as a coalface miner after graduate was priceless for me. So I left university and then I realised I'd better go and learn something. So I worked underground as a, at the coalface for three to four years. We also need to remember that in addition to practical experience, universities are not for everyone and should not be for everyone. We need to rekindle trades, rekindle the TAFE, rekindle apprenticeships, and Senator Hanson has been leading the way in Australia on, on rekindling apprenticeships, and the, her, and the government has taken her policy two years ago and implemented it. We need to also stop political correctness at TAFE and get it back on track. So we're very pleased then to see that the government is undertaking a major shake-up of university fees in a bid to steer students towards fields where there are skill shortages and jobs for the future. And it's better for students after graduation. University graduates have been slamming universities for meaningless degrees that have left students with dismal career prospects and crippling debt. 
While a university degree leads some students to a bright future, for others it currently leaves them with nothing but debt and disappointment. Now, I want to take a break here because I want to answer some comments from Senator Murray Watt. His comments disrespect the university students and universities, and his fabrications require me to, uh, to respond. He said that since they have entered Parliament, Senator Hanson and, one, and, uh, and Senator Roberts line up with the LNP to pass legislation. Well, let's see who lines up with the LNP. Let's indeed have a good look at this. On climate policies, Liberal and Labor are similar. They believe the nonsense. On energy policies, Liberal and Labor both believe in a renewable energy target. Both believe in stealing farmers' property rights, as they have both done. Liberal and Labor both believe in gold plating the networks. Liberal and Labor both believe in a national electricity market that has turned into a national electricity racket. One Nation opposes all of those. On water, the Turnbull Howard 2007 Water Act is supported by Labor. Now some Liberals are waking up and some Nats are waking up. One Nation opposes the 2007 Water Act and the destruction it's caused across the Murray-Darling Basin. Electricity price, as I've just said, Labor and Liberals support the renewable energy target. They support subsidies to the intermittent, unreliable energy sources of, of wind and solar. They support privatisation. They support the national electricity market, which, has been a, which is a national electricity racket. Both are anti-coal in their actions. The only difference between Liberal and Labor is that Liberals are positive in their talk, but not their actions. Labor and Liberal have been killing our fishing industry. Foreign ownership, Liberal and Labor have sold out Port of Darwin and other companies and water rights in our country. Record debt, state and federal, Labor and Liberal join. Infrastructure, a lack of infrastructure and neglect. Taxes, foreign multinationals tax-free. Labor and Liberal have enabled that over the last six decades. I could go on, but you can get the point that Liberal and Labor are actually closer than One Nation and Labor, One Nation and the LNP. The second point Senator Watt talked about was One Nation candidates out there masquerading, these are his words, as the people who are standing up for battlers in our community. Well, let's go through some of our candidates. Michael Blacksland at Gympie, Sharon Lose at Maryborough, Sharon Bell. Now, here's a good example. Sharon Bell, a real fighter. She's a working class girl who's come up and is now working in the construction industry. She is fighting the member for Bundamba, who was parachuted in from a job, from a, from a union position in Melbourne, parachuted into uh, Queensland outside the Bundamba electorate, and then two months before the recent election, so by election, he moved into Bundamba, and he's doing nothing. And what did, Liber what did the Labor Party do? They got rid of Joanne Miller, a first-class, true Labor member of parliament, and replaced her with this, with this blow-in parachuted in from Melbourne. Then I could talk about Dob Deb Lawson, Christine Keyes, who wants to restore solid education, Wade Rothery, a coal miner in Keppel, Torin O'Brien, Steve Andrew, an electrician who has got such a good rapport with the people of Mirani in his electorate because he is a member of parliament. These are the types of people that One Nation is very, very proud to say stand, stand with us. And they, ha they are fed up with the tired old parties, both Liberal and Labor, and so is an increasing number of voters. And that's why these candidates are standing up, because they're sick and tired of the Liberal Nationals and sick and tired of Labor. They have been abandoned by both the tired old parties. Labor and the LNP actually make battlers. Senator Watt talked about uh, us as standing up for the battlers. That's correct. And the reason we have to do that is because the Labor Party is creating battlers. It's taking the middle class and making them poor. It's taking the poor and making life tougher for the poor. Look at your energy policies. Look at your agriculture policies. They are coming to One Nation because people need someone in this parliament who stands up for them, and someone in state parliament who, needs, who stands up for them. And Senator Hanson, and this is something Murray Watt, Senator Watt has said, Senator Hanson and her party come down to Canberra, they vote with the Liberal and National parties. It's not us that have the policies that are the same. It's not us, it's you guys. Let's then have a look at, um, let's then have a look at what Senator Watt said. We've seen it, he raised pensions. 
Senator Hanson and I have advocated for an increase of pensions. We're advocated and advocating and got solid policies for decreasing cost of living. That's more important because to a pensioner, the cost of energy is a highly regressive tax and burden. Then Senator Watt raised apprenticeships. Senator Hanson introduced the apprenticeship scheme into this parliament and the government has taken Senator it. Senator Roberts, yes. I have been listening carefully and you certainly started off talking about the higher ed bill and I think I've given you enough time to respond to other senators in this place, but I do remind you the bill before us is the higher education bill. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Madam Deputy President. I'm simply responding clearly to everything that Senator Watt has said because his, his, uh, his comments misrepresented Senator the Roberts. facts. The bill before us is uh, the higher education bill. That's the bill you need to be responding to. There are other opportunities to respond to other senators. Thank you. Certainly. Well, in, in response, uh, Madam Deputy President, I want to comment that, that this bill, with One Nation's amendments that the government has agreed to, protects students, protects taxpayers, protects universities, protects Australians and protects Australia. Because education is vital to the future of our country. Education is vital as a source of foreign income. And while Labor is off with the rainbow-coloured unicorns on this and many other topics, we are very, very proud to speak for the battlers and to support the battlers. Order. Order. Students must be equipped educationally for a career in and beyond the COVID-19 economy with its focus on digital technologies, robotics, automation, science and health services. Real jobs. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Deputy President. Um, I rise to um, make a contribution to the debate on the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill of 2020. Well, this bill continues this government's war on higher education and universities. So much for the clever country. I and my father were in fact first in family. I know that sounds strange to people. But we actually started our higher education on the same day. My father dropped me at university on our first morning and then he went off to his uh, new institution um, on that same morning. I can't tell you what a difference it made to my father's life. He became a teacher, a job he had wanted, something he had wanted to do for his whole life. But growing up as he did in a very low-income family, he never had the opportunity to or even dream to go to higher education until he was able to access a free university education, until he was able to access free higher education. And until the day he retired, he absolutely loved his work. And he gave so much to the schools that he taught in. And in fact, not long ago, I bumped into one of his former students who said to me what a difference my father made and how much she enjoyed being in his classes. So it does make a real difference to people's lives. Myself, coming from a low income family, I would not have gone to university if it was not for the fact that I could get was one of the lucky ones who also got a free education. And I doubt I'd be standing in this place if I had not had access to that system. So I'm very passionate about a free university education because I know what difference it makes to not only the individuals but to the community. Because I'd argue that the lives of my father's students were affected by the fact that he went, got a higher education and became a teacher. I'm very, very concerned about the effect this bill will have on students, on the quality of education, on educational opportunities and the community. This bill does not take into account the precarious situation that we are transitioning to in a post-COVID world. We must invest in students and our education system, not make it harder to access 
education, not make it less sustainable, and we should not be increasing students' debts. We already know that younger people are facing a much more precarious future. They are already carrying a heavier burden into the future, given the world we are currently in. This package will more than double students' fees in the humanities and social sciences, slash up to $9900 million in, in vital funding for teaching and learning. This includes STEM and nursing courses. This will punish struggling students. The government's claims to support regional universities with this plan don't stack up. It will force regional universities to teach more students with much less money and forces the students to go into huge debts to get their degree. The consequences for regional communities will be more job losses, less local investment and fewer options for students. The package doesn't create anywhere near enough new places to satisfy the emerging demands in, um, for education to retrain and to retrain during um, and following the COVID-19 recession. The bill guts research funding by rejecting the long-held notion that base funding, student fees and Commonwealth contributions should provide for teaching, scholarship and base research capability. Now, the government will come in here and crow that they last night put $1.5 billion into research. That nowhere near covers the gap, which is estimated to be around $6 billion. Again, I say so much for the clever country. Universities should be well-funded, high quality and fee-free for all students. I passionately, as I said, believe in the power of higher education to improve people's lives, but not only, the, as I said, not only the individual, but our whole community. This package shifts costs of higher education much more strongly from government to students. Higher education in Australia has been hit incredibly hard, as we know, by the COVID crisis. These new laws will make things worse. The government should invest in our university and TAFEs, not starve them of funds. I do want to look at some of the key aspects of this bill. Changes to student fees, increasing length of time to pay off hex debts, and look at other challenges that students are currently facing. In many cases, this will make it harder and more expensive for young people to access higher education. Student fees, um, there's reduction in fees for STEM, teaching and nursing. The Greens welcome reduction in fees for these types of courses. Education should be affordable and these course fees have meant for some students higher education is out of reach. However, that also more than doubles the price, raises fees by 113 per cent of humanity courses other than English and languages. And um, fortunately, um, social work which was going to increase has now been uh, when the government realised what a foolish thing it was to do to increase course fees for social work and how much we need social workers, um, they have taken them um, off that higher, as I understand it, off that list of the higher fees. But the government is making a judgment here. The government's saying these aren't valuable. These courses aren't valuable. You might not get work. Well, tell that to all those people working in those areas, how important they are to our community, how important they are to individuals, how important social work is, for example, to our community. This will undoubtedly decrease the number of students who seek humanities courses, which would be detrimental to individuals, workplaces and the community. A Deloitte's report in 2018 on the value of humanities found that the value of humanities was to employers through having a more productive, innovative and multidisciplinary workforce, the broader community through better informed citizens and a better understanding of our place in the world, graduates through increasing their lifetime earnings by increasing wages and jobs prospects and our society through the contributions of humanities research to improved social outcomes. Is a 28 per cent rise for law and business. Average course fees are expected to rise by more than 7 per cent over the next year. 
Students are already expected to live far below the poverty line. Youth allowance is one of the lowest payments, and they are disproportionately affected by insecure casual work. It's important to note that the government is failing these students and their future. We must ensure that students are able to live above the poverty line and don't have to sacrifice study to maintain insecure work. Many students I've heard from are actually trying to work full time and try to maintain a full study course. The length of time to pay off the hex debt could take up to 20 years to pay off a three-year arts degree, according to our modelling. That's conservative as it assumes that graduates will be able to access full-time consistent work for the, for the, from the moment they graduate. It doesn't account for the years taken off for parental leave and other reasons and doesn't account for further study or the fact that graduates are increasingly in um, part-time and insecure work for, quite, uh, for much longer certainly than when, one, when I came out of university. This means that a generation that is already finding it challenging to find work and attain home ownership is getting further and further uh, behind. Home ownership is getting further and further out of reach, and, and they face additional and long-term debt, tipping the hand against them even more. Affordable and accessible education is essential for a community to thrive. We need, particularly in these, in these challenging economic times, to be making educational opportunities easier to access. Government needs to be investing in a skilled, adaptable and trained workforce. We don't disagree with that, but it actually needs to make sure that we are meeting people's needs and that it is, it, it is, is affordable and that the community and that young people want to take it up. We shouldn't be saddling students with more debt. Between $500 and $900 million uh, to government contributions is being cut to teaching and learning um, funding. Students will be forced to make up much of the cuts through these fee hikes. Universities are already cutting jobs and courses around the country. We are losing, we are losing key people. We are losing their academic contributions their contribution to debates in this country, their, con their contribution to student learning. The package reduces the overall government contribution to a domestic Commonwealth-supported place from 58 per cent to 52 per cent, and the student contribution is rising from 42 per cent to 48 per cent to pay for more additional places. Government says the package will produce 39,000 additional places by 2023 and 100,000 by 2030. There was a pre-existing issue. There is already a pre-existing issue with student places. The Costello baby boom cohort will start looking for university places over the next few years. The package does not account for the inevitable influx of people choosing to study during an economic downturn, nor does it go anywhere, nor is there anywhere near enough places to meet demand, and the government has provided no evidence that price signals will funnel students into the courses they claim to be prioritising. This punishes everybody. It punishes students, it punishes the future and our community. The bill will punish struggling students by removing their access to HECS if they fail more than half their subjects. This is, as a number of other people have uh, mentioned in their contributions to this debate, is grossly unfair. And I personally know a number of students who, in their first year of university, for example, did badly. They went on to be outstanding, outstanding students and went on to make outstanding contributions in their choice of work. $900 million for an industry-linked fund for investment in science, technology, engineering and mass education to be paid, is to be paid for by cuts in teaching and the learning budget. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul. This package creates a perverse incentive for universities to enrol more students in higher fee degrees. 
This is going to lead to perverse outcomes. This is bad legislation. We should be nurturing our, our higher education, nurturing our universities to do the job that they're there to do, which is to educate and prepare students for their contributions to our community. This is not just this. We know we, know we need to increase jobs. We know that. But this is also about making sure that we are preparing our students for their contributions to our community. All young people should be given an opportunity, whether it's in TAFE, whether it's in higher education, whether it's or at university, whether it's in apprenticeships. We should be making sure that all our young people have an opportunity to contribute, to do what they want to do, to make the contributions they want to do, and not pick winners, which is what this government is doing. This is bad legislation. It is going to detrimentally affect young people, students and our community. This has long-term consequences for our community. Make no mistake. No mistake. This is bad legislation and should not be passed. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I'm pleased to be able to contribute to the higher education debate that um, we're having here today. And I, and I have listened to most of the contributions that have been given, and I have to say they've been of very high calibre, making very important points for the um, argument to vote against this bill. This bill is a bad bill. And it's very disappointing that Senator Griff has decided to vote with the government on this bill and has decided that this will be one of the lasting legacies he leaves in this Senate. Do you really want this bill to vote for this bill to saddle huge debt on Australian kids? South Australian kids, huge debt. Do you really want that to be part of your legacy of being in the Senate? I hope not. I hope you have a change of heart, because this piece of legislation, as so many people in the debate have already said, is a despicable piece of legislation. It's designed to make it harder and more expensive to get an education. Now we all know that. That's what this bill is about. I just do not understand how the member for Mayo and Senator Griff don't get it. <laughs> this is what this bill is about. And you have to wonder why. This government is so intent on pushing this bill through, because what the bill does is shifts the burden onto students, and it will, and it will impact young people from poorer backgrounds the hardest. So why on earth would any government want to make it harder for our young people, particularly disadvantaged young people, to get an education? Why on earth would they do it right in the middle of the deepest and darkest recession in almost a century? It, it doesn't seem to make any sense. But of course, when you realise this isn't about increasing levels of educational attainment, but quite deliberately about decreasing opportunities for our young people in the pursuit of cu cutting costs and making savings, then it starts to become clearer what the end game is here. This is about attacking universities and quite deliberately undercutting them, because the Liberals have an ideological objection to poor kids getting a degree. Because for the Liberals, university should only be accessible to those who have the right school tie. If this bill passes, students will pay 7 per cent more for their studies—that's an average increase in fees of 7 per 
7 per cent, around 40 per cent of students will see the cost of their education hiked up by as much as 113 per cent. For some, this will shift the cost burden onto them so much that they will be paying 93 per cent of the total cost of their course delivery—93 per cent. What a regressive, backward step from the days of free higher education. For the many students studying in the field of humanities, they will see the cost of their degree more than double. The fees these students will pay will jump to $58,000, up from just over $27,000 for a four-year degree. I mean, it, it, it really is amazing. These students will be forced to pay more than their counterparts studying medicine and dentistry degrees. It makes no sense to me. In fact, the CEO of the Australian Industry Group, Innes Wilcox, Wilcox, said of these changes, and I quote, a large financial burden is being shifted to these future workers who will fill important professional roles required by industry. End quote. This bill doesn't even achieve the additional student places the government claims it will. The government somehow expects additional places to appear despite the fact that they are providing no extra funding. In fact, they are reducing the average funding per student. However, those opposite claim that over three years 39,000 places will be added. And now, even if that were achieved, it would fall substantially short of forward demand for places. The bill provides no acknowledgement, no recognition of the increased demand for university places brought about by the Morrison recession. Indeed, it doesn't even take into account that well, uh, that well, that well understand, understood increase in demand brought about by the baby boomers of the, of the 2000s, the children of which are now reaching university age, one of which, of course, is my own daughter. It should come as no surprise to anyone in this place that applications for places at our universities have more than doubled this year because of limited opportunities to work or travel. What is abundantly obvious with this so-called reform is that our universities will be expected to do more whilst getting substantially less. It's called a funding cut, plain and simple. In fact, if this bill is successful in this place, the Australian university sector will experience an overall cut in government funding of around $1 billion a year. That's what this bill is about. That's what this bill does. It cuts funding to unis, almost a billion dollars in funding, and who bears the cost? Who pays the price? Australian students, our young people and our nation. We all pay a price from cuts to education. This bill will see the average funding per student paid to universities dropped by 5.8 per cent. For an engineering course, the fee per student will drop by around 16 per cent. If we look at the, a nursing degree, course funding is facing a cut of 8 per cent. In education, the funding cut amounts to 6 per cent. And in clinical psychology, we're talking about a real funding cut from government of 15 per cent towards the cost of delivery of a degree. And of course, the cuts in this bill are on top of cuts to university budgets this government has already made. On top of cuts already made. This government, the Morrison Liberal government, has already cut funding, as people here well know, have cut funding from our universities to the tune of $2.2 billion. Then there is the losses in revenue universities face due to the loss of international students a loss in revenue project, projected to be around $16 billion. Our universities simply can't cut anymore, and yet that is what is being asked of them by this government. And it is our students, our young people, who will bear the brunt of the costs imposed on them by this government through this bill. 
I want to draw your attention to the impact of this bill on students in my home state of Tasmania. Because if the Morrison Liberal government gets its way with the passage of this bill through this place, Tasmanian students will face a funding cut 33 per cent worse than mainland students. We know this because compelling evidence was provided to this place through the Senate committee hearing into the bill. During the hearings, the committee heard from Mr Mark Warburton, an expert who has worked extensively on higher education funding policy for the federal government for around nine years. He was able to point out that the University of Tasmania and its students will be more perversely affected than their mainland counterparts by the bill. Mr Warburton is an honorary senior fellow at the University of Melbourne's Centre for for the study of higher education and a former principal analyst for Universities Australia. He described the University of Tasmania's stance on the government's cut as inexplicable during the Senate committee hearing. Mr Warburton told the committee, and I quote, the package has been clearly, clearly been rushed out to achieve savings the government have been seeking since 2014, but has been unable to secure. It's more marketing than substance. Well, we're not surprised by that. But to continue his quote, it's been riddled with mistakes and arguments enunciated for, for it, for it do, does not um, withstand scrutiny. The position of some stakeholders in the higher, is, in the higher education is in, in, inexplicable. They argue that the package should be supported to bring certainty to the sector. It will do the opposite. Regional universities will be subject to this uncertainty and many bear a disproportionate share of it. The University of Tasmania will be more perversely affected, potentially losing 8 per cent, more than the national average of 6 per cent. This change will be permanent." End quote. Well, there you go. The, cuts, the cut to the University of Tasmania and therefore Tasmanian students who remain in Tasmania to study will be worse than the cuts to university and students on average across Australia. And of course, this will be particularly bad, particularly hard felt for students from and students studying in the north and northwest of Tasmania, whether it's students in Launceston studying nursing, social work, so, uh, psychological um, science, or even students in Burnie studying humanities or education. All of them, all of them, Madam. Deputy President will be worse off. All will be paying higher fees. All will be deeper in debt. All will be discouraged from getting an education. And in the other place, the Liberal members for Braddon, Mr Gavin Pearce, and member for Bass, Mrs Bridget, Bridget Archer, support these fee hikes and uni cuts. They support disadvantaging North and Northwest Tasmanian students from their electorates. That's a shame. It is essential for the future of young Tasmanians and our university that these cuts are blocked right here in the Senate. And I would hope that all Tasmanian senators would vote in the interests of our state and vote to block this bill. Once again, it's the reg regional remote and disadvantaged students who will bear the brunt of the Liberals' ideological attack on universities students and, fr quite frankly, as we've all heard in the many uh, contributions here, and it's an attack on education. So you see, what we have here is a total schmozzle of a bill, thinly veiled as reform, but in fact quite clearly nothing more than a cut. So let's be clear. This bill is nothing more than a funding cut and a fee hike and it couldn't come at a worse time. It is a cut that will only saddle our young people with more debt and fewer opportunities. I urge the Senate to once again reject the government's attempts to gut our universities. I ask senators to vote down this bill. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator McKim. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. This legislation is an ideologically driven attack on universities. It's also an ideologically driven attack 
on young people who were shafted so badly in the government's budget last night. And it's legislation that looks like it will pass through this place because Centre Alliance has traded off young people's future for some roadworks in the electorate of Mayo. Now, as I said, we had a budget handed down last night that continued this government's shafting of young people. It threw yet more millions into the billions that the Commonwealth government already uses in corporate welfare for the big fossil fuel polluters, stealing young people's future from them by failing to take action in regards to the breakdown of our climate, and a budget which did nothing to address the rigged housing market that young people are facing, where far too many young people simply can't afford to rent a home and whose dreams of one day owning a home, that opportunity that so many of us have been lucky enough to have, are evaporating in front of their very eyes. So young people are being completely shafted by this government in last night's budget and by this legislation today, this ideologically driven attack on universities, on education and on young people. This package will more than double student fees in humanities and, so and social sciences. It will slash up to $900 million in vital funding for, funding for teaching and learning, including STEM and nursing courses, and punish struggling students. The government's claims that this will support regional universities don't stack up. It will force regional universities, including the University of Tasmania in my home state, to teach more students with less money. It will force their students to go into huge debts to get a degree. The consequences for regional communities will be more jobs lost, less local investment and fewer options for students. And mark my words, young people today who are being forced to pay through the nose for the opportunity to gain a university degree are not blind to the fact that the decision makers in this place who are going to make this decision today to shaft young people, to shaft universities, we all got, or at least the overwhelming majority of us, got the opportunity to get a university degree for free. A free degree. And that's where this country should be. We should be offering free TAFE to upskill Australians and give them opportunities to get better jobs. And we should be offering free tertiary education, how it used to be when most of us had the opportunity to go to university. But no, of course, once we're across the moat, we've pulled up the drawbridge behind us. And it's going to pass all because the government is splashing a bit of cash for roadworks in the electorate of the member for Mayo. This package doesn't create anywhere near enough new university places to satisfy what is an obvious and emerging demand for education during a pandemic and during a recession. I mean, seriously, anybody could see that in a recession, during a pandemic, when job opportunities are drying up and have dried up, of course more people are going to take the opportunity to upskill themselves. Of course more people are going to want to enrol in the university to get a degree and we're seeing that happen as we stand here and debate this bill but this legislation does not create the new places needed to satisfy that emerging demand and it's worth pointing out that universities have been absolutely smashed during this pandemic Massive job losses out of our universities. The government rewrote 
the JobKeeper rules on multiple occasions just to make sure universities couldn't qualify to access that essential lifeline for so many of their staff who work in higher education. And why did the government do that? Because they've got an ideological hatred of our universities. They don't want a highly skilled community. They don't want highly educated Australians. Because that is the neoliberal ideology. Another thing this package does is shift costs of higher education from governments directly to students. Again, this is the user pays model, again a central plank of the neoliberal ideology that not only underpins this legislation but underpinned last night's budget delivered by Treasurer Frydenberg. Cost shifting from the government to the student. Absolutely blatant neoliberal ideology. Universities in this country should be well funded, they should be high quality and they should be fee free for all students. That should be our national vision for tertiary education in Australia. Not cost shifting from the government to students, not requiring a user pay system as this legislation does, but we should collectively be aspiring to free universities, free TAFE, so that Australians can upskill themselves and have the opportunities to become better educated. We've seen, as I said, higher education in Australia hit incredibly hard by the COVID crisis, and these new laws will only make things worse. We shouldn't be starving funds to our TAFEs. We shouldn't be starving funds to our universities. We should be increasing the funding. And don't think that we'll be letting the Labor Party off the hook here too. I do recall very well, very well, when I was Minister for Education in Tasmania and the then Labor government took the axe to university funding. I recall that very well. And I recall senior figures in uh, the University of Tasmania asking me when I was a minister, why do both major parties see uh, tertiary education funding as an easy budget saving? And I said to them, because they're not well enough organised politically at a national level, and if they wanted to see their funding retained into the future, they needed to organise better at a national level and mount their arguments better, not only directly to government, but in the public conversation. Because education is the pathway out of poverty. And although um, the Liberal National Party, through its primary policy delivery mechanism of this year, last night's budget, has condemned millions of Australians to live in poverty with no pathway out. I acknowledge the Labor Party uh, would not support uh, much of that, but the fact remains, the fact remains that millions of Australians are either unemployed or underemployed in casual, insecure, poorly paid and in some cases dangerous work in this country. And this government has basically, in last night's budget, drawn a target of 6 per cent for the unemployment rate. 6 per cent. And I want to be clear, not having full employment in this country is a policy choice. It is a policy choice. And the government is choosing, choosing to allow millions of Australians to live in poverty with no realistic aspirations to one day have a job. And instead, they are prioritising the $99 billion of corporate welfare that is in every single out year of the budget that was delivered last night. This legislation will more than double 
the price of humanities courses other than English languages and social work. And for those courses, humanities courses other than English languages and social work, fees will be raised by 113 per cent. 113 per cent. There's a 28 per cent price rise for law and business degrees. On average, course fees are expected to rise by more than 7 per cent over the next year. And of course, students are going to pay the overwhelming majority of this, and they are going to be loaded up with hex debts as a result. Our modelling shows that it could take up to 20 years to pay off a three-year arts degree, should this package pass. And that is a conservative estimate, as it assumes graduates will be able to access full-time, consistent work from the moment that they graduate. It doesn't account for years taken off full time for parental leave and other reasons, and doesn't account for further study. So that is a highly conservative estimate that, on average, it could take 20 years to pay off a three year arts degree. This legislation cuts government contributions to teaching and learning by between 500 and $900 million. And remember, as I said, last, year, last night's budget has got $99 billion of corporate welfare embedded into every single one of the four out years that are covered by the budget papers. This package reduces the overall government contribution to a domestic Commonwealth-supported place from 58 to 52 per cent, and the student contribution will rise from 42 per cent to 48 per cent. Now, the government says the package will produce 39,000 additional places by 2023 and 100,000 by 2030. Uh, leaving aside this government's penchant for uh, absolutely heroic assumptions that underpin its budgets and its projections in regards to legislation like this, uh, we need to understand that there was already a pre-existing issue with student places, because the uh, Costello baby boom cohort are going to start looking for university places over the next few years. So these kind of um, demographic realities these obvious increases in future demand need to be factored in and need to be understood. As I said, the package does not account for the inevitable influx of people who choose to study during an economic downturn such as we are currently experiencing as we enter what will be a lengthy time in recession in this country. This package will not fund anywhere near enough places to meet demand, and the government has provided no evidence whatsoever that price signals will funnel students in the course, into the courses they claim to be prioritising. This is terrible legislation. This is ideologically driven legislation. It's legislation that none of us should be surprised has been put forward by a Liberal national government. But what we can be, and in my case what I am surprised about, is that Centre Alliance and Senator Griff have indicated that they will be supporting this legislation. They've clearly done a deal to support this bill in exchange for some roadworks in the electorate of the member for Mayo. Well, our young people deserve better than that. Our universities deserve better than that. And I absolutely condemn this bill and I urge the Senate to vote against it. Thank you, Senator McKim. We have Senator Wish Wilson remotely. 
Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I welcome the opportunity to talk to the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill, um, Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional Remote Students 2020. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Faruqi, uh, who's done a fantastic job um, working with stakeholders right around the country to stop this legislation going through today, uh, to stop these cuts the university funding to stop this uh, culture war that the government's trying to drive by picking winners uh, in the courses being offered uh, at Australian universities. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all the stakeholders around the country, um, many of them who got in touch with me months ago and my colleagues saying they were very concerned about what they were hearing uh, in relation to uh, negotiations on this bill. Um, why would the government, government be doubling fees for students in humanities and social sciences and cutting fees for other students in other courses? Well, clearly the fees that students pay are price signals. And by using price signals, the government is actually trying to pick winners. It's trying to direct which students study which courses. There's no doubt that these are changes to incentives. And what's behind that is purely and simply a culture war. Now, Acting Deputy President, I started my university higher education uh, with an arts degree. My father started his higher education with an arts degree, and so did my brother, who's now a professor at Murdoch University in Western Australia. My daughter, is currently studying an arts degree. There's what other reason would the government have for trying to double fees on humanities and social sciences? Fee rises of nearly 113% across humanities courses, unless they didn't want more students to study humanities. I can only begin to speculate, Acting Deputy President, as to why the government want, wouldn't want more students to study the humanities. Why is it trying to direct students into courses like engineering and science? Surely these are the decisions that should be made by students based on a whole range of other important decision-making criteria rather than the cost of their degree. And let's, let's put this on the table and be completely clear about this. These perverse changes to fees will more than double the cost of a degree for a young person in this country in the humanities and social sciences. They will slash up to $900 million in vital funding for teaching and learning across the country, including from STEM and nursing courses. And they'll continue to punish young Australians who choose to study humanities. Now, the government claims to support regional universities with this plan, and it doesn't stack up. We've heard evidence in the Senate inquiry that, indeed, uh, it will also punish regional universities, like the University of Tasmania, uh, that I proudly worked at for nearly a decade before I went into the Senate. It will force regional universities to teach more students with less funding and forces their students to go into more debt to get their degrees. The consequences for regional communities will be more jobs lost, less local investment and fewer options for students. The package doesn't create anywhere near enough new places to satisfy emerging demands for education to reskill and retrain, especially during this pandemic, this COVID crisis. The bill guts research funding by rejecting the long-held notion that base funding, which is student fees plus government contribution, should provide for teaching, scholarship and base research capability. The package shifts costs of higher education from governments to students, more of the trend that we've seen from this government in the last seven years. Now, the Greens have always said, and we've been out and proud, that universities should be well-funded, high-quality and fee-free for all students. 
We went to the last election with a policy to make higher education free, a policy that was fully funded, fully funded, including by making large corporations pay their fair share of tax. We should be doing everything we can, especially during a pandemic, to get young people to universities, to get them into higher education, to get them into TAFEs. It's not a time for governments to be picking winners and trying to decide what kind of society Australia should be in 10, 15, 20 years' time, based on the courses that students, young Australians and young Tasmanians should be choosing now. We know that higher education has been hit incredibly hard by this COVID crisis. Um, in Tasmania, we know how many uh, those working at the University of Tasmania have lost their jobs. And this has been something we've seen day in, day out from other universities around the country, as fee income has dried up, especially from overseas students. The government's provided no assistance to these workers. They haven't been uh, they haven't been able to qualify for JobKeeper like so many other Australians have. And the Greens have continually tried to get JobKeeper extended to university workers, just as we have to other sectors who have missed out on these stimulus payments. These laws will only make things worse. Uh, we want to see proper education, investment in our education, in our universities and our TAFE. Uh, we don't want to see them starved of funds. Um, in the, the last four minutes that I've got left, uh, Acting Deputy President, I just wanted to say that in, in, in relation to the budget that the government brought down last night, there's been a lot of references to the, the most important budget since the Second World War. But that's, that's where the similarities stop, Acting Deputy President. Um, the budget following the Second World War reformed this nation for more than a decade. It transformed our society and our country at a time of crisis. The Chifley government brought in significant reform. What we saw last night from this government was a cash splash designed to shore up their electoral prospects probably at the end of next year. Where was the reform? Where, where was the vision, apart from the vision for Mr Scott Morrison's own re-election. This is a time that we need to be investing not just in our communities through better education and better health care, but investing in actually tackling the great crises of our time, tackling inequality and tackling the climate crisis. What we saw last night was just more funding for fossil fuel companies. What we saw last night was tax cuts for the wealthy. What we saw last night was two key economic programs that most economists, in fact, most first year economic students would tell you won't work in a recession in a time of significant uncertainty. Receiving tax cuts in a recession means most people have a higher marginal propensity to save than to spend and to get that money circulated through the economy or pay off their mortgage. The bulk of the debt that we're going into, and the Greens have always argued that debt is not a dirty word, as long as it is spent wisely. Investing a significant proportion of more than $200 billion in new debt into tax cuts won't set this nation up for the next decade, Acting Deputy President, and nearly $213 billion in investment incentives for corporations won't work either in a time of recession. One thing I do know about companies, having worked for many of them over the years, is they always look at maximising the present value of future cash flows. They don't like uncertainty and they don't like risk. And that's exactly the environment they find themselves in now. Why would they go into significant expansion of their capital expenditure in a recession with such an uncertain economic outlook? Some companies may bring forward some future capital expenditure plans, 
but most companies won't be going out there and suddenly spending because they're getting a government incentive to do so. So there's the big bulk of the money that was spent in this budget on two economic policy paradigms that most economists and most first year economic students will tell you will fail Australia. This was a time for significant reform. And the bill that we have before us now is cutting funding to universities, cutting funding in investment in our young people, in retraining uh, middle-aged and older Australians. Education is critical Order, for the Senator Wish Wilson, it being 12.45, I shall now proceed to Senator's statement. Senator McMahon. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. From my first day in this place, I have always come into this chamber with one thing in mind. How can I best advance the interests of the Northern Territory? That is one of my number one goals. Yesterday's federal budget was a big win for the Territory. A big win I have worked tirelessly to deliver with Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormack and Finance Minister Matthias Cormann. In fact, I was in both their offices this morning, humbugging them about territory issues. And I thank them that on one of the busiest days of the year for them, they took the time to listen to what is important for the Northern Territory. They know the contribution the Territory makes to our national economy. And when the Territory is strong, so is our nation. They know the vital strategic role the NT plays in our nation's defence. Last night's budget has delivered hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure, delivered to the NT. It has delivered continued support to maintain vital aviation networks, including within the NT as well as from Darwin to interstate. It has delivered more funding for the Building Better Regions Fund, with many areas in the NT set to benefit from this. $2 billion for water infrastructure, of which I informed the Deputy Prime Minister last night that I intend to grab a slice of. We can only achieve these outcomes when the Northern Territory has strong representation in the parliament. We can only achieve these outcomes by maintaining and, in fact, growing the Territory's voice in Canberra. As the Deputy Prime Minister wrote in an op-ed in the NT News in August, such a large area as the Northern Territory, with residents spread everywhere, needs and deserves more than one reps MP to ensure democracy is well served best served. I will continue to work constructively within the government to achieve that end, including through the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. I have already been working very closely with the Joint Standing Committee Chair, Senator James McGrath, to ensure the Northern Territory's voice is heard loud and clear. I am not surprised, reading through the submissions to the committee's inquiry, of the vocal opposition to the Australian Electoral Commission's recommendation to reduce the Territory's two lower house seats of Lingiari and Solomon to just one. Given the strong opposition from community groups, Indigenous land councils, political analysts such as Anthony Green, various professors, the Territory Government, the Territory Opposition, federal members and senators in this place, I have to wonder why we would allow a blunt mathematical equation based on population to get it so wrong. On the AEC's formula, I might just add, it doesn't include unenrolled voters. And at 31st of March, the Northern Territory Government believed there were 24,000 unenrolled voters in the Territory. 
Many of the Territory's unenrolled voters are Aboriginal. Having recently just been through some of the gruelling remote area polling, I have seen firsthand how many people in remote communities are not enrolled. If it were to lose one seat, the Territory would then become the largest seat in the country, seeing an extra 30,000 people spread over an area more than 35,000 times larger than the electorate of Melbourne. 35,000 times larger. Well, on the other hand, we have Tasmania. and I do love my Tasmanian colleagues, but Tasmania is guaranteed five seats regardless of its population. Five members in the House of Representatives with a population of about 535,000 and 12 senators. So for Tasmania being approximately double the Northern Territory's population, you have over four times our representation. And if we were to lose one, Tassie would have over five times the Territory's representation. That doesn't sound very fair, and it's not. Territorians are seeking assurance that they will retain a minimum of two seats for the Northern Territory in the lower house. Let's not forget we only have, as a territory, two senators. So that's four federal representatives in total. And that's all we are seeking, is to maintain what we currently have. The country Liberal Party and the Nationals have been pursuing this matter since the AEC's recommendations became known. We have provided a submission to the process. While others come into this place and talk about their intentions, we have been working on this behind the scenes to ensure delivery. This is what the CLP and the Nationals in government achieve. I would like to thank my, my opposite number, Senator Malandiri McCarthy, for her strong advocacy on behalf of all Territorians for the retention of two seats. However, we must also remember <clears throat> if the top end wasn't so badly mismanaged for so long by Territory Labor, we wouldn't even be in this position. The best way to keep two seats is to increase population growth, providing the economic growth the NT needs so that the numbers stack up on their own and we keep those seats. But due to Labor's ineptitude, we now find ourselves in this position of having to legislate to maintain our representation. I will keep working as part of the Morrison-McCormack government to deliver the services and infrastructure Territorians want, need and, most importantly, deserve. And I will hold this government to account to act on the Joint Standing Committee's report and to ensure that the Territory retains a minimum of two lower house seats. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Can I, before I proceed to my statement, can I thank uh, Senator uh, McMahon for that contribution? And we uh, make clear to her Labor will continue to press for two seats for the Northern Territory. And we look forward to her and the other nationals' continued support for that position. Um, Acting Deputy President, honouring those who come before us is a vital principle of feminism. Those who had the courage and audacity to push history forward. In the past month, we've lost three greats. Helen Reddy, who insisted her voice, a woman's roar, be heard, our Labor sister, Susan Ryan, who made equality of the sexes in Australia the law of the land, a woman to whom all of us owe such so much and to whom I will pay tribute to in tomorrow's condolence motion. And the world also lost Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose life and contribution I celebrate today. And we should celebrate Justice Ginsburg, not just because of the venerated role she held, hard-earned though it was, but because of her commitment and her courage from which so many have benefited. Her story may have ended only last month, but it began in a different time altogether. 
When she first graduated from Cornell in the early 1950s, she took the civil service exam. Despite high marks, the only work for which she was deemed suitable was typing. And like many working women in those days, when she became pregnant, she got the sack. Two years later, she returned to study at Harvard Law School. Her class had nine women and about 500 men. Even so, she was pressed by the dean as to why she was taking up a place that, and I quote, should go to a man. This is a variation on the message given to countless millions of women. This is not for you, know your place, and this is not it. But as Ginsburg would come to say later, women belong wherever decisions are being made. And she was steadfast. This is not to say she didn't ever doubt herself. She wrote to her cousin saying she feared she didn't have sufficient aptitude for the law. She was often told to set her sights on something more appropriate for women, like teaching. It's a reminder that courage isn't the absence of self-doubt. It's pressing on regardless. So she completed her studies at Columbia University at the top of her class, top of the class at the best law school in New York. And Columbia recommended her for a clerkship at the Supreme Court, but she didn't even get an interview. Like law firms, likewise, offered nothing but rejection. Finally, a mentor from Columbia threatened a judge that his future supply of promising clerks would dry up unless he took Ginsburg on, and she was on her way. And she so impressed the judge, he insisted she say for a second year. She made her way to a teaching role at Rutgers Law School, where she was told she would be paid less than her male colleagues because your, because your husband has a very good job. In time, she began to focus on the legal rights of women. While working as the first female tenured professor at Columbia Law School and as the founder of the Women's Rights Project, at the American Civil Liberties Union, she brought a series of cases to upend statutes that discriminated against women. She figured out that when bringing cases to judicial benches filled entirely with male judges, she was usually better off arguing a case of gender discrimination by showing how it could also harm men. As a result of her landmark Moritz versus the Commissioner case, the government petitioned the US Supreme Court stating that the decision cast a cloud of unconstitutionality over hundreds of federal statutes which it compiled. And she then set about litigating those statutes under the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause, organising clerk cases, finding plaintiffs and delivering the arguments. And she demonstrated again and again that laws might have been intended to help women did so by rendering women as dependent and effectively branding women as inferior. The New York Times has observed that between 1973 and 1976, she argued six women's rights cases before the Supreme Court and won five, profoundly changing the law as it affects women. Legal commentator Jeffrey Tobin has described Ginsburg as being to feminism what Thurgood Marshall was to civil rights, both leaving indelible marks on, us, on society and the law well before their respective appointments to the US Supreme Court. In commenting on her Supreme Court nomination in 1993, Marcia Greenberger, then co-president of the National Women's Law Centre, said that Ginsburg was as responsible as any one person for legal advances that women made. Doors of opportunity had been opened. And despite being known as an agent of chains, Ginsburg herself was not an advocate for judicial activism. She believed elected representatives should write laws, but she did believe in justice. And justice can only be delivered where there is equal treatment before the law. And if laws do not treat people equally, they cannot be just and they must be overturned. <coughs> A potential illustration of this worldview is the wage underpayment case of Ledbetter, heard by the Supreme Court in 2007. <coughs> Excuse me. Her dissent in that case has been described as the most effective of this generation, prompting the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act to be introduced in 2009. <clears throat> in another case, the owners of Hobby Lobby argued they had a right to deny contraception coverage in their employees' K health plans. In her dissent, Justice Ginsburg vividly argued your right to swing your arms ends <clears throat> just where the other man's nose begins. The rights and freedoms of one person come with a responsibility not to impinge on the rights and freedoms of another. Justice Elena Kagan is one of the two women to have followed her onto the court. 
She also had an easier time in the legal profession as Dean of the Harvard Law School and as US Solicitor General. Considering the question of why her experience was so much more favourable, Justice Kagan said, the answer is simply Justice Ginsburg. As a litigator and then as a judge, she changed the face of American anti-discrimination law. She and millions more who benefited from Justice Ginsburg's efforts are living proof that what each of us does matters for those that follow. And that isn't only the case if we serve in the highest court in the land, because it's not just up to a venerated few to make our world a better place. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was not born an icon, and she didn't start on her path so she could be on the Supreme Court. In fact, much of her contribution happened before she was even on the court. A series of steps, one foot in front of the other. Each step, an act of grit, humbly defying everything we assume about what is possible. Of course, every new generation comes to assume what it knows life to be is what life has always been, especially when some of that seems so obvious, like the equal legal treatment of the sexes. But this assumption creates inertia against new progress. And even worse, it imperils the progress that has been won as old cultural movements seek new footholds. And that, senators, is why history matters. We must understand how we got here in order to understand how to keep going. But we cannot afford to look at the great achievements of human progress and be overwhelmed by their magnitude. We can't treat that progress as the work only of great figures of history because we are not their, just their beneficiaries. We are the custodians of a constant project. We must, all of us, use what we know, where we are, to do what we can. And this is what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did, and this is how change happens. Thank you, <coughs> Senator Wong. Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Last week, an Australian Walkley Award winning judge sat in a UK court in a glass cup, crawling on his knees in order to speak to his lawyers. Lost a lot of weight since he was last seen. Watching on, journalist and documentary filmmaker John Pilger recounted this man telling him, I think I'm losing my mind. That man is Julian Assange. Last week saw the conclusion of Julian Assange's extradition hearing in London. Over four weeks, many of the world's most celebrated journalists, publishers, lawyers and doctors presented evidence, finally settling the historic straight on many issues. And I'd I'd actually like to pay my respects to Senator Wong for her contribution on uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And while she was speaking, I couldn't help but thinking, what would Justice Ginsburg think of this part of an extradition trial of Julian Assange to her country, the United States? The judge in the UK will make on the 4th of January next year. And then, Julian Assange remains in Belmarsh Prison, a prison built for murderers, murderers and terrorists, which is no place for this softly spoken Australian publisher, who to many people is a revolutionary and a hero of our age. What did the court hear? First, that the prosecution of Assange and WikiLeaks is quite simply political. The Obama administration had ruled out prosecution, but as Australian lawyer Jennifer Robinson testified, the Trump administration, this is the guy who's just had his Facebook post deleted for putting up false information about COVID, the Trump administration offered Assange a pardon if he would reveal his sources to the DNC leak. When Assange refused, because no matter what, journalists and publishers don't reveal their sources, the prosecution then came down on Assange like a ton of bricks. The judge agreed to bring her decision down after the US election. 
How much more political could this possibly be? Second, the court heard of the spying operation conducted against Assange by UC Global on behalf of US intelligence agencies, which was especially focused on his meetings with his lawyers. Clearly a breach of protocol around client lawyer privilege. The court also heard about the seizure of legally privileged information from the Ecuadorian embassy by the FBI. The court heard of plans to poison and kidnap this Australian citizen. This is totally outrageous and basically means he cannot get a fair trial. This is a show trial, a farce. Any statements from our government giving assurance about due process are simply empty, simply empty in the face of this outrageous and shameful breach of process by the US authorities, our ally and friend, the United States. Third, the court heard about the devastating health consequences Assange is suffering and which would finish him if he were extradited to the extreme isolation and deprivation of special administrative measures in the horrific US prison system. Fourth, the court heard three days of evidence by senior and award-winning journalists that Assange and WikiLeaks engaged in journalistic activity, including meticulous redaction processes. One third of the Afghan war logs were withheld to protect individuals named. A nine month curation process occurred with respect to the diplomatic cables, which were only fully revealed because two Guardian journalists published the password in a book inadvertently. So no, WikiLeaks doesn't dump materials online. And yes, Assange took great care to protect the names of sources. Three days of evidence provided great detail to that effect to the UK court. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my fellow Tasmanian, uh, Dean Yates, who was the Reuters the head of the Reuters Baghdad Bureau at the time of collateral murder, that now infamous video of an Apache helicopter gunning down Iraqi civilians and Reuters journalists, a potential war crime that has never been followed up. And Mr Yates provided evidence of what this meant to him and the process he went through with the US military to get justice for his colleagues. Fifth, harm was not done by WikiLeaks, but enormous harm was revealed by WikiLeaks. The court heard evidence of war crimes, crimes against humanity, corruption, and that the US still cannot provide any evidence of the harm brought about by WikiLeaks. Finally, technical computer forensic evidence demolished central accusations in the indictment that Julian Assange was aiding Chelsea Manning or conspiring to procure documents. Patrick Heller, a digital forensic expert employed for two decades by the US Army, reminded the court that the prosecution had failed entirely to tender any proof of Assange's involvement in chat logs with Manning. There simply isn't any forensic evidence. We know these details of the trial thanks to Australian journalists like Mary Kostakidis and Andrew Fowler, who were part of a small group of journalists given access to video feed. Mary tweeted late into the night for four weeks, reporting in intricate detail so that we would know what was going on in this process, this sham of a process that has not demonstrated the principles of open justice at all. In fact, on the first day 
the judge revoked permission that had been granted to nearly 40 NGOs and parliamentarians to monitor the trial. I am proud, Acting Deputy President, to be a founding member of the Bring Assange Home Parliamentary Group, a group that now has membership from the crossbench and the Labor Party in both the House and the Senate, but still has failed to get a single LNP Member of Parliament to join, whereas I know from my private discussions there are a number of LNP members who are very concerned about this issue. So I, I take that back, uh, Acting Deputy President. I should say a single Liberal Party Member of Parliament. There are indeed two National Party members of that group uh, who are doing a great job advocating for the release of Julian Assange and bringing Julian Assange home. But I'm proud to be part of that group. Now, during the, the hearing, our co-chairs met with the UK High Commissioner, who gave them a good hearing and assured she would report their exchange and their information and how serious concerns back to London. But during the four weeks of the hearing, hundreds of protests and vigils happened all over the world. A large process, presence of loud processes outside the court every day. A dozen councils have passed resolutions across Australia calling on our government to act. During the trial, over 160 world leaders current and former presidents, prime ministers and officials called for Julian Assange's release. Thousands of journalists, hundreds of doctors, the third biggest petition ever tabled in this parliament and a growing chorus from the margins to the centre of media, from the right and left of politics in Australia, all agree that Assange must not be extradited. What was on trial in London was the fate of press freedom and national security journalism. If a president is a set that allows the US to assert its laws. Outside the US, the world will never be the same again. While the press freedom is on trial, so too is an Australian. We must bring Julian Assange home. Senator Abetz. The time has more than arrived for the freedom-loving countries of the world to unite in the name of freedom, in the name of their national sovereignty and in the name of world peace to counter the corrosive and growing pervasive influence of the Chinese communist dictatorship. At the outset, let it be understood that the Chinese people are as peace and freedom loving as all other peoples of the world. The issue is not the Chinese people. The issue is the communist dictatorship under which the Chinese people have suffered for far too long. Next year, the Chinese Communist Party will be 100 years old, which has the sordid record of cruel repression, ruthless extrajudicial killings, labour camps and a naked pursuit of influence on the world stage for all the wrong reasons. Ten minutes is insufficient to set out the legacy of cruel, inhumane and illegal activities in which the communist dictatorship of China has engaged. Be it Tibet, be it Christians, be it students in Tiananmen Square, be it the Falun Gong, the barbaric forced organ harvesting of prisoners of conscience, the Uyghurs, the slave labour camps, the ripping up of the UN sanctioned Sino-UK agreement guaranteeing the freedom of the Hong Kongers, the expropriation and illegal claiming of the South China Sea Islands for aggressive military purposes. The list goes on the ugly, repressive social credit system which seeks to control the Chinese people, Australian journalists leaving China because of the regime's repression, the cyber attacks and the stealing of intellectual property are not the behaviour or standard expected of a global player deserving of respect. Nor is it deserving of respect to quietly remove the word peaceful from the Unification of China resolution at the recent National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Indeed, this change on the cusp of the centenary of the formation of the party is very worrisome and perturbing. One assumes the removal of that vital qualifying word peaceful was not a typographical error. So the removal of the word peaceful, deliberate as it must have been, should send alarm bells ringing it begs the question, why was the word peaceful removed? The people of Taiwan deserve and need the unqualified support of all freedom-loving nations. 
Taiwan is a nation geographically smaller than my home state of Tasmania, but with a population equivalent to the Commonwealth of Australia. It is a fully-fledged democracy. We need to stand in solidarity with them. With the benefit of hindsight, the recognition of Beijing at the expense of Taipei, a demand of the communist dictatorship, was just the beginning of an ugly list of demands and concessions for which the freedom-loving countries of the world fell all those years ago. It is with regret I recall my own government, albeit under different leadership, promoting an extradition treaty with a Chinese communist dictatorship and mine being a lone voice of opposition, but one which helped derail the proposal, much to the chagrin of some. That said, I confess at the time I was still labouring under the misguided hope that with the opening of the Chinese economy there would follow the opening up of personal freedoms and liberties. But for me, an extradition treaty with a regime that was a dictatorship didn't believe in the rule of law, had a 99.9 per cent conviction rate in criminal trials and the death penalty was going way too far. Concessions to encourage the expansion of liberties was a tactic worth trying but with eyes wide open. It is a matter of regret that the freedom-loving nations of the world pursued economic gain and favouritism from the dictatorship whilst turning a blind eye to the well-known human rights abuses. Australia itself had an arrangement with the Chinese regime to have an annual human rights dialogue, a great initiative. But when it was unilaterally suspended by the communists, we didn't push back and we should have pushed back hard. When China expropriated the South China Sea Islands for military purposes, the freedom-loving countries simply added millions of words to international dialogue, but not a single practical act to halt or reverse the building of military facilities on the illegally seized islands. Despite the litany of egregious abuses, the world community has allowed the communist dictatorship of China to have inappropriate influence over the World Health Organization. And let's not start on COVID-19 and the devastation it has wreaked on the rest of the world, for which it does need to be brought to account, or the consequences to nations seeking an international inquiry into COVID, like Australia being called the dog of America, or having unconscionable tariffs imposed as not-so-subtle punishment and a warning to others, nations, should they pursue decent requests for answers to a devastating pandemic. Then there is the, the undue influence of all bodies on the UN's human rights body. On 31 July 2015, the President of the International Olympic Committee announced that Beijing would be the host city of the 2022 Olympic Games. It was a mistake to award China as the host five years ago, and it is a mistake if the International Olympic Committee proceeds with them as the host in 2022. The 2022 Winter Games will be the last Olympics exempt from human rights principles being incorporated in host city contracts by the IOC, which will bind hosts to UN conventions from Paris 2024 onwards. China's hosting in 2022 is a glaring choice before the conventions become part of the contract. Recently, 160 human rights advocacy groups delivered a joint letter to the Chief of the International Olympic Committee calling for Beijing to be removed as host of the Games over its actions in Hong Kong and the detention of Uyghurs in Jiang. British MP Sir Ian Duncan Smith, a co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, of which I am pleased to be a member, rightfully asked that the IOC think again about hosting the Winter Olympics in China. The time has come to draw a line in the sand to say enough is enough. The International Olympic Committee could provide much-needed leadership by reconsidering the holding of the Winter Olympics in China in 2022. Countries vie against each other to host the Olympics because of the economic and tourism benefits, along with the international credibility and prestige it brings. 
Why should the Olympic community bestow such undeserved prestige and credibility on this discredited dictatorship with its legacy of human rights abuses and flouting of accepted civilised international standards of behaviour? The similarities of human <coughs> rights abuses, expropriation of territory and manipulation of international bodies to gain undeserved credibility is spookily reminiscent of events of some 80-plus years ago. The insidious Belt and Road Initiative, which is a debt trap inflicted on less well-off nations to exert undue influence, needs to be called out. 138 countries have thus far become engaged in this debt trap. My colleague Senator Fiorenti Wells was ahead of the game and called it out and was foolishly repudiated for her comments. History will affirm Senator Fiorenti Wells for her courage and insight. So when a sovereign state of our Commonwealth willingly signs up to the insidious Belt and Road Initiative, it encourages the communist dictatorship peddling its debt trap to countries around the world. Having the imprimatur of Victoria is a great public relations coup for the regime and a great disservice to the nations and their peoples that become entwined and entrapped in the initiative. The Labor Premier of Victoria should repudiate it, as he should reconsider whether the Chinese contractor shortlisted for the North East Link should even be allowed to tender. Similarly, the purchase by the Labor Premier of new trains built by exploited Uyghur labour is reprehensible and should be stopped. To continue gives funding and credibility to the ugliness of slave labour camps and the communist regime which runs them, a company blacklisted by the US. The time has come for the freedom-loving countries of the world to combine and stand in solidarity with each other to let the communist dictatorship of China know that their activities of abuse and aggression will not be tolerated. The freedom-loving countries of the world need to act now before it's too late. It's always worth standing up for freedom. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Last night the government handed down its budget, a budget which rains down money on Australia like a summer monsoon. Where did the money come from? While well, it is going to be printed in Australia on the Reserve Bank printing presses, many people will welcome the short-term financial assistance, but it will be a short-term benefit unless Australia becomes more productive. If we flood the country with billions of cash printed here in Australia without at the same time improving productivity, the Australian dollar will depreciate against other currencies. A less valuable Australian dollar means overseas goods will become more expensive, including medicines made overseas. The government has talked about making essential goods in Australia, but there was little in the budget about how it would achieve this goal. I was disappointed there were no nation-building projects on the scale of the hydro, snowy hydro scheme because the lack of water is limiting the growth of our primary industries and good jobs for Australians, particularly in regional Queensland and regional Australia. There was no money for a coal-fired power station in Queensland to lower electricity prices. In short, the budget was silent on how Australia will deliver global competitive water and electricity prices, which are essential <coughs> for a revival of manufacturing in Australia. Manufacturing jobs are important because they are better paid, tend to be full-time and have a productivity factor of 1.6, which means that every job generates 0.6 of another job. With money flowing like champagne from a shaken bottle, the government hopes that somehow Australian business will lead to an economic recovery. Australian businesses need relief from unfair competition from foreign companies that pay little or no tax in Australia. Many Australians would be unaware rail freight companies are competing directly with foreign-owned ships and are losing that fight. Time-sensitive freight is carried by road and rail, but the non-time-sensitive freight is now being carried by foreign ships. These foreign ships take jobs from Australians and pay a pitiful amount of tax, although they do pay port charges, which end up as profits for foreign-owned port owners. 
This is called cabotage. The Australian company SCT Logistics provides 1,500 Australians with jobs driving trains, loading containers, managing the arrival and pick up of the freight. These jobs are now in danger because the government is deaf to the impact of cabotage, moving goods from port to port in Australia, employing foreign crew and paying little or no tax. <coughs> Some members of the government may be aware of the impact of the go slow at Australian ports, with containers not moving anywhere and businesses being badly affected. Many of these ports are foreign owned, including Brisbane and Melbourne Port. How is the government going to stop price gouging by these foreign owned ports once freight increases on the taxpayer funded inland rail line proposed between Melbourne and Brisbane ports? If the government allows foreign shipping to drive rail companies out of business, then that freight will be driven to foreign owned Australian ports. The National Party has in the past two weeks circulated a discussion paper to encourage foreign shipping to the horror of the rail industry. During the height of the COVID pandemic, foreign ships stopped coming to Australia and rail freight increased dramatically. Was it the government's plan? If there are, what is the government's plan if there are no rail businesses to move the freight both in and out of the ports? I now want to turn to the heavily marketed government gas-led economic strategy. In the budget, just $52.9 million is set aside to help unlock Australia's vast gas reserves onshore. We don't need any more gas. We have enough gas off the west coast of Australia for a thousand years and we are currently exporting it to other competitors in China, Japan and South Korea. The problem is this gas is in the hands of foreign gas giants who export the gas on long-term contracts. The Australian-owned and listed Woodside offered to provide chilled gas to the East Coast a while ago. It would have required the building of a $250 million regassing plant in each state, but the government did not take up that offer because it wants to buy jobs at huge expense by fracking in Queensland. So here we are getting none of our gas from the West Coast, where it's cheap. Instead, our West Coast gas is earning a handful of foreign-owned companies $50 billion a year through exports to our competitors. Exporting Australian gas is highly profitable for these foreign companies because these companies do not pay for the gas, nor do they pay income tax on the profits made from selling the gas. Government policy means we do not benefit from our West Coast gas reserves, but we reward the foreign-owned gas companies with $325 billion, that's billion dollars in tax credits. It is a stupid policy. The government needs to explain why Australia is the only large gas exporter in the world where the domestic price is higher than the international price. Foreign investment in our oil and gas has made economic indicators like exports and GDP look good, but foreign ownership of our West Coast gas reserves has done next to nothing for jobs, wages or corporate income tax collection. The Reserve Bank told me if Australians wanted to benefit from trillions of dollars of natural gas off the coast of Western Australia, they need to get a job in the sector or buy shares in oil and gas giants with names like Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell and BP and um, ConocoPhillips. So what stops the government changing the law so Australians benefit from the vast reserves of natural gas in Commonwealth waters off the coast of Western Australia? It is the fear of arbitration in foreign tribunals under provisions in free trade agreements known as the Investor State Dispute Settlement Provisions or ISDS provisions. These fears are justified because in 2011 Philip Morris took the government to a foreign tribunal claiming compensation in connection with tobacco plain packaging laws. The Productivity Commission told the government to avoid ISDS provisions because they gave foreign investors greater rights than those enjoyed by Australian investors. But the government rejected the advice accepting ISDS provision in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP-11. New Zealand is a signatory to TPP-11, but it avoided ISDS provisions with side letters. Australia could have done the same, but again, stupid. 
In 2018, One Nation voted against the enabling legislation for TPP11, but our votes made no difference because Labor voted with the government. Instead of fixing weak laws, the government finds itself pinned to the ground by multinationals whose knees are pressed on the government's neck. In this position of weakness, the government has decided not to take on the West Coast gas cartel, but instead propose a gas-led strategy based on new gas production in Queensland. This strategy involves the government encouraging fracking of the gas in prime agricultural land, guaranteeing new production through take-or-pay multi-year contracts and lumping East Coast gas users with high prices. The government must stop picking winners and subsidising electricity generation, first solar, then wind and now gas. Government should get out of the way and let these market players compete against each other so we get the lowest electricity prices. Government interference in the markets always ends badly and in this case has left Australia with globally uncompetitive energy prices, which will kill off the manufacturing strategy and jobs throughout the economy. If the government persists with guaranteeing the gas industry in Queensland, then we are doomed to high gas prices and lower living standards. With gas demand falling since 2014, it is inevitable under multi-year take-or-pay contracts that the taxpayers of the future will pay for gas, which is not needed. Just as the Northern Territory pays for gas, it does not need from the Black Tip project. Essential services like water, Gas, electricity and telecommunications should be in the government's hands because it is clear the government is a hopeless regulator. The government must provide a level playing field if Australian businesses are to have a chance of growing the economy and providing prosperity to Australia. Being timid will not get us there. We must reform the foreign investment regime if Australia is to remain free to determine its own future. As I've said, there was nothing in the budget to actually encourage Australian industries and manufacturing. We are competing on a world stage and our free trade agreements are destroying and have destroyed our industries and manufacturing. It's a shame the government, with COVID-19, got out there and said we need to change our industries and manufacturing productivity in Australia, but they showed nothing of it in the budget. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I hear it's uh, raining around Central Australia at the moment, uh, pretty cool around Yulara, and up in the top end, uh, the wet season is certainly on its way uh, with a bit of rain and certainly the humidity. People are even catching $10,000 barramundi fish with the $1 million fish competition that's happening. We're growing in the Northern Territory. We've had about 100,000 people who've crossed our borders since July. Of course, not all of them will stay, but I'd say we're going to have a lot more people staying in the Northern Territory. Business, even, in August. Our retail sector was one of the highest in spending uh, across the country. We are growing in the Northern Territory, Madam Deputy President, acting Madam Deputy President. But where we're not growing is in our representation. When there is a push to remove a voice in the lower house to reduce the seats of the Northern Territory from two to one, that's not what this parliament should be about. It should be about encouraging and growing our remote and regional Australia incentivising, especially when we see the budget. In the north, the forgotten north, doesn't receive nearly enough of what it should if we are to finish the unfinished business of our country, both in infrastructure, investment, in growth and in fairness in representation in the Australian parliament. We saw in the House yesterday a significant vote took place. An amendment was passed to a government motion, a government motion, not an opposition motion, not a Greens motion, not an independent motion, but a government motion. An amendment was passed to a government motion 
that will, in a nutshell, allow the private member's bill before this place, the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, ensuring fair representation of the Northern Territory Bill 2020 to be debated and voted on in the other place if it passes in here in the Senate. And the government supported that amendment. Yes, the coalition government supported that amendment before the House for the suspension of standing orders to allow this to happen. We have a window in time here in the Senate as the only opportunity from an opposition's perspective to be able to bring on a suspension of standing orders in that other place. They have opened the door, Madam Acting Deputy President, to enable us in here to send a private senator's bill to them. And I say to the government, the government supported this suspension of standing orders in the House. The government can support the suspension of standing orders in the Senate. The Northern Territory is poised to become the comeback capital of Australia. Territorians have worked hard to make sure we have been the safest place to be during this dreadful pandemic. We are on track for economic recovery as we position the Territory for future investment, leading to more jobs and economic growth. And that hard work is seeing people flock to the Northern Territory. The NT government's most recent data indicates a trend of around 4,500 permanently relocating since the border reopened. Keep that figure in mind. 4,500 people have permanently relocated since we opened the border. But the Northern Territory is going to lose a seat, has lost a seat as far as the Australian Electoral Commission is concerned, because we are short of 4,778 residents in the Northern Territory. Now that decision was back in March. So we stand to lose our representation at the very time our population is increasing. We have always argued that the formula that the Australian Electoral Commission bases its decision to cut one of our seats does not reflect the true nature of the Territory's population. The Australian Electoral Commission made a determination on July 3 for the NT to revert to one seat in the House of Representatives. And under their formula, we basically just miss out on making the quota for two seats. But there's an even stronger kick in the guts here. Territorians don't even have the chance to put their views to the Australian Electoral Commission about the reduction. Now, other seats across other states have an opportunity, as part of a redistribution, to put their views. We don't even get that. All we have is the Joint Selection Select Committee on Electoral Matters, which is a brief inquiry into the private senator's bill. What has been clear throughout that committee's hearings and throughout the many times I have stood in the Senate to alert senators to this growing political concern in terms of the voices of the people of the Northern Territory, along may I say, along with my CLP colleague, Senator Sam McMahon. We are absolutely united on this front, that the parliament must not, cannot reduce and diminish our voices. Indigenous organisations, land councils, chambers of commerce, trade unions, religious bodies, political parties and concerned private citizens have all said they want the territory to have a fair go in Canberra. This afternoon I will table a petition reflecting exactly that, of nearly 4,000 signatures from residents right across the Northern Territory and indeed right across Australia. And you know what, Madam Acting Deputy President? That petition is going to keep running because this is a battle 
that the people of the Northern Territory are not going to give up on. We deserve a minimum of two seats in the lower house. We want more, naturally, but we certainly don't want to lose what we already have. There have been a lot of words said here in support outside this chamber about the need to maintain the representation of our regions of the Northern Territory in this parliament. And I urge all of you, all of the senators here in this place, to take the territory bull by the horns and fix this question of our representation. Fix it this week, as a motion in the other house has invited us to do. The motion that's come from the other house has invited us to have the courage to bring it in here, to debate it in here, to support it in here and do the right thing in here for the people of the Northern Territory. Because we have a window that has now been opened and invited to us from the House of Representatives to do exactly that. A unique situation, a historical moment. And we can do this. How important are the people of the Northern Territory to the Senate? How important are the people of the Northern Territory to the lower house? Well, they showed how important the people of the Northern Territory are by putting forward this motion, by challenging us in the Senate to have the courage to pursue this inequality in terms of the voices of First Nations people, of our cattle stations, of our mining organisations, of our Aboriginal communities, ranger programs, of the fishing industry. Make sure their voices are reflected adequately in ensuring that we do maintain the two seats of the Northern Territory in the lower house and hopefully one day to come even more seats and senators even. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Over the years, I've come across many admirable contributors to the autism sector, but few meet with the amazing standards set by 92-year-old Olga Tennyson. Her profound impact on the lives of autistic people and their families have been achieved through a close partnership with Professor, Professor Cheryl Disignacchi, and I apologise, I'm sure my pronunciation is incorrect there, of La Trobe University, where through her generous support, they established Australia's first research centre dedicated to autism, the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre, or OTARC. This world-leading research centre at La Trobe University would not have been possible without the significant private donations that now exceed a staggering $6 million. There are few people in this country with the energy, drive and determination of this impressive and inspirational woman. She was born Olga Hayward in Rockhampton, Queensland, and attended primary school in Brisbane and St Ursula's, a Catholic boarding school in Toowoomba, for her secondary studies. While she was there, one of the nuns recognised her talent for clear speaking and acting and encouraged her to train as a stage and radio actress. She trained with Jean Trundle, then well-known speech teacher in Brisbane, who also had a small theatre company where Olga performed. While training, she sat for and passed competitive examinations in speech for prestigious qualifications from Trinity College in London. After completing her schooling and actor's training, she worked at a bank while pursuing her acting career as a stage and radio actress with the ABC. She was married in Brisbane to Patrick Tennyson, a well-known journalist and author working for the Melbourne Herald. They first lived in Sydney and then moved to Melbourne, following a period in London where her husband Patrick co-founded the Melbourne Press Club in 1971 and was its first president. Olga gave up working as an actress after her second child was born. Her interest in autism was triggered when her grandson was diagnosed with Asperger's disorder at 12. Despite her recognition that he had a developmental delay from a few months of age, Mrs. Tennyson does not seek public recognition for her generosity. She's entirely modest about her significant contribution to OTARC and La Trobe University 
although she greatly appreciates that her gifts may inspire others to support autism research and services. It was for this reason alone that she reluctantly agreed to have the centre named after her. Indeed, her initial support in 2007 that led to establishing the centre provided a critical visibility into autism that had not been realised prior to this simple act of generosity. Moreover, her voice as someone with a close experience of autism gives her authenticity to speak on behalf of the centre and promote the work that's being undertaken, of which she is incredibly proud, and rightly so, may I say. Through its research outcomes and the services, OTARC provides enormous value to the community at large. The training of students and professionals, including GPs, maternal and child health nurses, and other educational and allied health specialists, as well as dissemination of information in the general community, and most importantly to those families living with autism, means that evidence-based information can inform best practice now and into the future. Beginning with a focus on infancy and early childhood, research within the centre over a period of 12 years now spans well into adulthood, with programs supporting autism employment, suicide prevention and a core understanding of growth and development throughout the lifespan. Mrs Tennyson's visible public support for the work of OTARC inspires its staff and provides comfort for individuals and families with and for whom the centre is working. We've come a long way in autism research in Australia, including establishing the Australasian Society for Autism Research in 2009, a member-based organisation to advance autism research and scholarship, which would, not also, would, which would also not have been possible but for Olga's support. This has been an outcome of the initial and ongoing unwavering generosity of a single individual in our community. It's important to note that Olga has never requested any recognition. If one were to calculate her donations as a percentage of her wealth, she would rank in the highest echelons of philanthropic activity. Unlike many major donors and philanthropists in Australia, she's not from an intergenerational family with wealth and a long history of philanthropic giving, nor is she from a successful corporate background. She lives a life without extravagance so that the money she and her husband accrued over a lifetime can be put to use in a significant and lasting meaningful way. Madam Acting Deputy President, I have an autistic son. And when my child was diagnosed, the uh, grief and the challenges that you face as a parent trying to discover and uh, what therapies are the best options for you to undertake, where to turn, where to get assistance, where to get support, is incredibly challenging, is incredibly difficult. Uh, it was nine years ago uh, and it still is today. And it's the work of organisations such as OTARC that has provided so much comfort to families like mine, uh, especially in Melbourne where they've worked on studies, uh, including uh, an incredible study that I learnt about a number of years ago where they are now able to uh, assess and look at autism and recognise autism in children under 12 months. Um, this is a huge step forward because with autism, the earlier the intervention, the more successful the outcome. Whatever interventions you provide a child with autism, they will always leap forward. It, you don't know how they're going to leap forward, you don't know how they're going to develop and what success is going to come and where on the spectrum they're going to end up falling, and that will move throughout a child's life. But we do know that the earlier the intervention, the more intensive and best quality intervention, the more successful the outcomes are going to be. And the work of OTARC, looking at a study of a number of children from when they were under 12 months and looking at what success rate they had in identifying autism at that period to when the children were then five, was absolutely extraordinary. And to be able to put these diagnosis uh, criteria in place, to have better understanding throughout the medical profession uh, what it is they need to look for when they're looking at children with autism or potential developmental delays. Uh, to be able to do it at that young age is going to ensure that we have the best possible outcomes for that child and for their family. Uh, it's also looking at best practice intervention. We have a challenging environment throughout Australia. We have a, a, an, it's an inbuilt resistance in some respects 
to best practice therapy. Uh, we have on the Raising Children website acknowledgement that uh, therapies such as applied behaviour analysis are well supported by evidence and research to be best practice early intervention therapy, yet we have a blockage within uh, much of the funding resources and government that uh, has traditionally been opposed to such significant behavioural therapy. Uh, it's also opposed considerably by uh, some uh, more adults that are uh, diagnosed with autism who usually have never experienced the therapy for themselves um, and certainly are relying on evidence from you know, perhaps 50, 60 years ago as opposed to how these programs are being delivered today. Um, so, but it is the, with the work of organisations such as OTARC that we see the recognition of best practice, we see what research and evidence can produce and how best to help Australian families. And I know that my experience has been mirrored by so many Australian families. Uh, like so many uh, families and, and most people in this room I know would know someone whose family has been affected uh, by autism and has a child or themselves has an autism uh, spectrum. So many Australians are affected both directly or indirectly. But it's with thanks to people like Olga Tennyson that there's comfort and that there's hope. And it's the groundbreaking research at La Trobe University and the significance of that research and the undertaking and understandings uh, surrounding those on the spectrum that so much has been improved. Uh, I know with our work in the Senate Select Autism Inquiry, we are hoping to build upon that and look forward to when Melbourne opens up again, being able to meet with those from uh, Monash, uh, La Trobe University as well as uh, the OTARC Centre. So we have much to be grateful for, and many Australian families I know would like me to say on their behalf, it is with great gratitude uh, that we acknowledge the amazing philanthropic donations that enabled the Olga Tennyson Research Centre to be developed in the first place and for the work that it continues to undertake. So it's my great honour to highly commend her for her sincere charitable efforts and to record our deep and sincere gratitude for posterity. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to look at and talk about the impact of the Morrison budget on West Australians. And I feel that I'm in a privileged position to do that because over the last couple of months uh, I've prob probably travelled more in Western Australia than any federal WA senator in the room. And I've been uh, as far as Port Hedland, perhaps not Senator Smith, we'll give him a bit of leeway, been as far as Port Hedland, I've been down to Esperance, I've been out to the central wheat belt and I've been as far east as Narrabeam and Senator Smith I haven't finished yet. And during that visit I've talked and had the privilege of listen, listening to uh, men's shed participants, um, First Nations people, farmers, uh, farmers, farming groups and shopkeepers and just a whole range of people in those regions, people providing services, whether it's uh, not-for-profit drug services, whether it's um, Bloodwood Tree in Port Hedland, which does a whole range of services and during the pandemic has, o has opened uh, a shop where people can come and shop for a gold coin donation. And it's just been a privilege to hear firsthand from those West Australians. Also earlier this year, or actually it was last year now, I had the privilege of attending uh, a women's listening forum in Roeburn, attended uh, by Senator McCarthy and Ms Linda Burney, the member for Barton. We had over 100 First Nations women in the room and they came to tell us in, very, uh, in no uncertain terms what they expected from government and indeed from a Labor opposition. I'd like to thank particularly Jolene Hicks, an amazing, an amazing woman from Roeburn who really went out of her way to welcome us, to pull people together and facilitate uh, that big meeting that we had in Roeburn. The Roeburn and the Port Hedland and indeed the other women who came from across the Pilbara are a force to be reckoned with and they demanded we come back with a draft, which we did in December and then a final presentation meeting, which I did uh, not last week, the week before, which sadly Senator McCarthy and um, Ms Burney couldn't attend because at that point uh, they were still locked out of our state. 
um, but we're hoping they can come again next year. And I met with um, a group of women in Port Hedland, I beg your pardon, in Robin, and in Port Hedland I had the absolute privilege of meeting with elders. And I tell you what, those elders uh, say it like it is, and uh, they were very clear about what they expected. Last week I met with the South West Aboriginal Medical Service, a highly regarded service in Western Australia, uh, does amazing work and delivers way beyond uh, its regional boundaries. It's got a fantastic plan for a one-stop centre, because uh, at the moment it's based in Bunbury and Bustleton and all over the place, and it wants to have a one-stop centre. It has lobbied the Morrison government. It wants 15 million. It's got a shovel-ready project. I'm glad that we've got some West Australians here. It's got a shovel-ready project, DA approved. It's got land. It's got support. It's got a great group of people behind it. And all it wanted from the federal government was 15 million. Sadly, it missed out. Despite uh, making uh, representations to Minister Wyatt, that centre got nothing. Now, I would have thought 15 million is a pretty good ask. Uh, certainly during the election campaign, um, Mr Porter, the member for Pearce, was able to just give the city of Swan 20 million towards a pool, but hey, that came out of the sports rorts. Uh, area and SWARMs, who are well deserving, shovel ready project, missed out. They weren't the only ones to miss out. I'd urge people, if you didn't hear um, the report this morning, the interview with Chris and Joe from Rockingham. Chris, a truck driver, Joe working three jobs one as a cleaner and two uh, jobs as a swim teacher talk about how the budget impacts on them. They were better than any of the economic analysis that I've heard. They were passionate. They are typical Australians and, indeed, very typical Western Australians living in Rockingham. And they thought it delivered nothing for them. Jo is an architectural draftsperson by trade, and she hasn't been able to get a job in that field, but works three jobs, which we know many women do. She lost her job as a swimming teacher uh, when pools were closed during the lockdown period and, of course, because the federal government were not kind enough or generous enough to extend JobKeeper uh, to local government, Joe lost income. So they are very cautious. They're worried. And they said any tax cut they might get was going into the bank because they're worried about their future. And for them, the budget hasn't delivered confidence. For the patients who use the South West Abor Aboriginal Medical Service, it's delivered nothing. For the elders up in Port Hedland who are concerned about their children's aspirations, we've got 12 uh, kids graduating from Port Hedland through the Clontarf program up there. That's a record. But guess what? Their chances of getting to university with the outrageous university bill, which um, Senator Alliance, Senator Alliance has agreed to in this place will stop them. Do you know in Western Australia we have less than 2,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids at university? Less than 2,000. Most are mature age, and most of them take degrees in the humanities areas. And who have we just disadvantaged? Now, Senator Griff and the member for Mayo have sold out for 40 pieces of silver for a few roads in Mayo. And when those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids in Western Australia ask me why university fees for them have doubled and why it's much harder for them to get to university, I'll know where to point. I'll be pointing directly at the Morrison government and I'll be pointing directly at those senators, including um, One Nation, who are supporting an outrageous bill that will make it much harder for kids to go to university, particularly Indigenous kids. We should all hang our heads in shame that in Western Australia we don't even have 2,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island kids at university. We have not even reached that milestone. And guess what? That statistic has not changed very much over the last 10 years. For the farmers that I met with out in Corrigan and Meriden, who really do want to see action 
on climate change. Yes, they are very happy with the battery project, as we all are. But that's a McGowan project, which, yes, you funded. Tick. They're happy with that. But they've seen nothing else from you on, on um, climate change. Nothing. And we're seeing the effects of climate change in Esperance. We get frosts now where we never used to. That impacts on the crops. We've got in WA, most farmers are growing barley, and they absolutely lay the blame for the um, downturn in the barley from China at Mr Morrison's feet. Absolutely. These are not necessarily Labor supporters. That is what they told me. So it is time that you lifted your game and started to represent Australians like Chris and like Joe, Order. like the elders in Port Hedland, like the farmers in Esperance, like the farmers in Meriden. Order, Senator That's Lyons. Who you Time represent. for the debate has expired. Questions without notice, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister confirm there are 928,000 Australians over 35 years old? who will snap back to living on $40 a day after December and who will be ineligible for the Morrison government's hiring credit scheme. The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, I thank Senator Wong for that question. No. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Can the Minister explain that despite unveiling a budget with a debt well in excess of $1 trillion, the Morrison government has left nearly a million Australians over 35 years old without work behind. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, no, I cannot uh, confirm this. What the Morrison government has delivered uh, last night is our plan to get Australia out of the COVID recession and to get Australians back into work. Uh, we are not uh, accepting that people will uh, remain on income support forever on a day. We are actually working to get people back into work. And we understand that there is a difference between uh, people that have a track record in the workforce, that have uh, been uh, employed before uh, in terms of their employability, and the challenges faced by a more vulnerable segment of the population in the context of the COVID recession, based on experiences in previous recessions. We understand that young Australians who have either not yet been in the workforce, who are about to get into the workforce, who have only just recently been engaged in the work workforce, are in a comparatively uh, more challenging position and it is very important that we ensure that they do not become entrenched in terms of having to rely on welfare support. That is why we've put in place the particular hiring credit in order to provide particular support to Order, young Australians. Coleman, but of course we want all Australians to get back into expired. work. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Order. How many of the Senator McKim. Senator Wong, please. How many of the 928,000 Australians aged over 35 years will still be out without work, without work uh, when JobKeeper ends in March and be left to live on $40 a day when JobSeeker snaps back in December? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. We are working to ensure that every single Australian has the best possible opportunity to get back into work. To get back into work. Order. That is what we are doing. That is what we are doing. We are working to ensure that we get Australia out of this COVID recession, that we get Australians back Order. into work. And of course, I mean, the Australian people, unlike the Labor Order. Party, understand why we are in the position we are in. They also understand that Australia, while it's been tough and while we will continue to go through a tough period, that we are in a stronger, comparatively stronger and better position than most other uh, comparable advanced economies around the world. And we will, we will let, uh, the, we will let uh, the Labor Party continue with the sniping. We will continue to work to get every uh, Australian. Uh, we, we continue to work to give every Australian the best possible opportunity to get back into a job. Senator Scar. Mr. President, my question is to Australia's absolutely outstanding Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the minister inform the Senate? How the Morrison government's 2020 to 21 budget sets out a comprehensive plan to get Australia out of the COVID recession and Australians back into jobs. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator 
uh, Scar for that very important question. Mr. President, uh, the budget uh, we delivered uh, last night uh, is indeed our plan to get uh, Australia out of the COVID recession and to get Australians back into jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs and more jobs. We are focused on saving uh, the jobs uh, that, are, uh, that are needing to be saved. We are there to restore the jobs that were lost. We are there to create more new jobs, but it will be a private business, a private sector-led recovery. Because you know, on this side of the chamber, we understand that jobs don't grow on trees. On this side of the chamber, we understand that jobs are created by viable, successful, profitable, growing businesses, which is why in our budget we have taken a whole series of very important measures to ensure that businesses have the best possible opportunity to be successful into the future and to grow, because we know that a growing business will hire more Australians. And that is of, I mean, if you look at the measures that we've taken uh, since the start of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, started, $507 billion worth of fiscal support, 25.6 per cent of GDP in support of the Australian people and our economy, Mr. Mr. President. Um, this budget uh, alone provides $74 billion worth of support measures as part of our job maker plan to drive the strongest possible private sector-led economic recovery and to drive the unemployment right down, which will be good for the economy, which will be good for the opportunity of uh, working families around Australia to get ahead, and which will be good for our budget and for budget repair into the future. Because, of, of course, more people in work means more um, revenue for government from income tax. It, may, it means lower payments uh, on uh, welfare support uh, for job seekers. Because of, course, because, of course, that is what we are focused on. That's what we've achieved Order, in the Senator past, Coleman. and that's what we'll work for Senator in the future. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, can you outline some of the major job-creating job -creating measures in the 2020-21 budget? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, our job maker plan uh, aims to support about one million jobs over the next four years. Our job maker hiring credit will boost jobs growth by offering an incentive for business, businesses to hire younger job seekers. Treasury estimates that measure alone will support about 450,000 jobs for young Australians at a cost of about $4 billion. Uh, Mr. President, other job uh, creating measures which will help all Australians who are, working, who are looking for work include our record investment in upskilling and reskilling Australians, starting with the establishment of the $1 billion Job Trainer Fund to create more than 340,000 free or low-cost training places. 340,000 free or low-cost training places. $1.2 billion to create 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships with a 50% wage subsidy for businesses who employ them. $1.4 billion. Senator Coleman, time for the answer has expired. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will tax cuts, tax cuts play a crucial role in the Morrison government's economic recovery plan? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Bringing forward income tax relief for hardworking families, uh, focusing on low- and middle-income earners across Australia, that puts more money uh, into their pockets, boosts their take-home pay, but it also helps to stimulate the economy because, of course, it will lead uh, to a strengthening of aggregate demand in the economy. It will help ensure uh, that uh, businesses across Australia uh, are able to benefit uh, from a strengthening in demand. The budget also uh, delivers, of course, um, significant other uh, tax cuts. I mean, these this tax cuts we've reached, which we are proposing now, uh, about $17.8 billion worth, build on uh, $8.1 billion worth of tax relief, which is being delivered for the 2020-21 income year under our previously legislated personal income tax plan. In 2020-21, low- and middle-income earners will receive tax relief of up to $2,745 for singles and up to $5,490. answer has expired. Senator Mario Smith. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Why, in a budget racking up in excess of $1 trillion in debt, did the Morrison government allocate just 0.024 per cent to spending promises in the Women's Economic Statement? Why is the Morrison government leaving Australian women behind? The Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Payne.
uh, Senator Smith, for the question. Um, well, the, the federal government is, uh, is absolutely delighted to be able to have presented the second women's um, economic um, security statement as part of the, this budget and a number of new measures that have been able to be added to the ongoing measures that are embedded in every part of the budget to support Australia's women. Um, and part of our plan for the economic recovery uh, that was announced, which was our budget last night, we believe that women play a very important role. I mean, first and foremost, we also understand that the most important thing that we can do for women is to make sure that they have access to work when and if they want it. Um, so, but there are a number of measures that were listed last night in the Women's Economic uh, Security Statement, um, which include uh, a couple that particularly in my area, um, the, the announcement of the paid parental leave changes to ensure that women who have missed out um, on being able to get paid parental leave because of the circumstances surrounding them becoming unemployed meant that they couldn't meet the work test. So we have, uh, we have allocated $130 million over this 12-month period alone to make sure that women who found themselves out of work during, uh, to, due to the COVID pandemic are able to still access their paid parental leave because we understand many of those women probably had made the decisions in relation to uh, their families before the pandemic um, hit. We also have made sure that we have made a very strong focus of getting women into work in areas of science, technology, engineering uh, and mathematics, because we understand the jobs of the future are going to be around that, that science base, because so many of the exciting opportunities for Australian employment going forward are going to be in these areas. So there are a number of areas in the, in the budget that are focusing on making sure that women have the opportunity to be able to take the jobs of the future and supporting them in their education their skills and their training to make sure that they Order, can take those Senator opportunities. Rustin. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that for the more than 754,000 women accessing job seeker and youth allowance, the Morrison government's budget is simply offering a reduction in their support payments and a training course? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And the answer to your question, Senator Smith, is absolutely no. Um, the, the, the federal government has made a absolutely unprecedented um, de, uh, support package in place for all Australians, including Australian women. Um, we have put in place um, on, in March we put in place the coronavirus supplement that was available for all Australians. But equally, we understand that Australian women um, have equally been impacted um, by job losses. And we have, uh, in the July economic fiscal update, made the announcement in relation to the continuation of that supplement. But the most important thing that we can do as a government is to make sure that we work with businesses, because it will be businesses that create the jobs to enable Australian women who found themselves without work during this pandemic to be able to give them the opportunity to be able to go back into work. Because it will not be government that creates jobs. Governments don't create jobs. It will not be the government that spends us out of this recession. It will be business. Order, Senator Rustin. Order, Senator Smith. A final supplementary question. Why, despite slugging Australians with a debt in excess of $1 trillion for generations to come, is there nothing in the Morrison government's budget to make it easier to access childcare and increase women's workforce participation? I remind senators to remain silent. During order, I remind senators that while interjections are always disorderly, they are particularly unhelpful during the question being asked. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I would absolutely refute the accusation and allegation in the question that I've just received. This government Order. has gone out of its way to make sure that we have supported all Australians, and that includes women, and particularly women who have children, to make sure that they have the same opportunities as all Australians. But as I said in the answer to my previous question, it will not be without the support of a strong and profitable economy, strong and profitable businesses that provide the employment Order. opportunities. For Senator women. Rustin, I have, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. The question did relate to uh, nothing in the budget in relation to childcare. Just wonder if the minister representing the Minister for Women might want to return at some point to that question. That was part of the question. I will be honest. That was one question that I missed being able to transcribe all of it because of the noise in the chamber. That was part of the question that I heard. I'll call Senator Rustin to continue. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Well, I would draw the attention to those on the other side of the amount of support that this government has provided to childcare um, during the Order. last six months to support Australia 
to order. support Australian women and families to make Sarah sure that they Wong. have got access to the support that they needed. When they were out, when businesses were shut down, they had nowhere for their children to, to, to be able to get to work, and so they were provided with additional support. We have supported the childcare sector through this pandemic, and we will continue order. to support Senator the childcare Rustin. sector. Senator, order. Senator Watt. Senator Rennick and Senator Watt. Senator Bragg. Milt Norcolopoulos. Senator Rennick and Senator it's Watt, coming. save it for state of origin. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's plan to get Australians back into jobs, as outlined in last night's budget? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. Mr. President, uh, as Senator Rustin has uh, articulated, uh, it is employers that create jobs. Governments put in place policy frameworks that employers lever off. And certainly the Morrison government is focused on putting in place those policies that will ensure Australian businesses are able to prosper, grow, and create more jobs for Australians. And in fact, since the coalition was elected to office in 2013, uh, to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the economy has now created in excess of 1.5 million new jobs. And Mr. President, last night's budget further demonstrated the Morrison government's commitment to getting Australians back into the workforce. The Australian economy is now fighting back from COVID-19. And in fact, in the last three months, we've seen around 458,000 jobs created. And as our Senator Cormann has stated, the government is particularly focused on ensuring that young Australians who have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 are able to get back into the workforce. Last night, the Treasurer announced our $4 billion hiring credit. This will give employers who take on an eligible job seeker aged between 16 and 35 an incentive of between $200 and $100 per week for 12 months. And we anticipate that this hiring credit will help around 450,000 young Australians, young Australians that we want to get back into work. And Mr President, that is of course on top of the announcement we recently made of $1.2 billion to create an additional 100,000 new apprenticeships. And again, this announcement, it's all about doing what we can do as a government to ensure that we have the best policy framework in place to get Australians, and in particular young Australians, Order, back Senator into Cash. work. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How does the government's job maker hiring credit enhance existing incentives to help Australians back into work? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as I've said, we know that young Australians have been disproportionately affected by the impact of COVID-19. And uh, the Morrison government's $4 billion hiring credit will support around 450,000 positions by giving employers an incentive for each new job they create over the next 12 months that employs someone who's been on income support um, in at least one of the three previous months at the time of hiring. Now, the hiring credit itself, though, complements other existing government wage subsidies that are already in place. Uh, we already have in place a number of wage subsidies for existing cohorts uh, of people, such as parents returning to the workforce, Indigenous Australians and the long-term unemployed. We also have a $10,000 restart wage subsidy that actually helps job seekers aged over 50 uh, to get back in the workforce. And in the last few years, that has actually assisted 50,000 Australians to get a job. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How has the coalition's record of strong economic management built the foundation for our job maker plan for economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And while the impacts of COVID-19 have been absolutely devastating uh, on the Australian economy, it must be remembered that Australia entered this crisis from a position of economic strength. And that is why last night we were able to hand down the budget and make that further level of investment that we did. When we entered COVID-19, the economy was growing. And in fact, we had record 
employment participation, labour force participation in Australia. The unemployment rate had fallen uh, to 5.2 per cent, and the budget was back in balance for the first time in 11 years. And as the Prime Minister says to Australians, we have done this before, we've got your back, we will put in place the right policies to ensure that we can emerge stronger on the other side of COVID-19. And that is why, as we emerge from the health crisis, uh, the job maker plan that we have outlined to the Australian people will get Australians back into work. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, and relates to the budget measures for home care packages. According to the latest quarterly report from the Department of Health, there are still 103,599 103, Australians waiting for home care packages and 7,400 waiting for a Level 4 package. While the government's media release talks about the number of places it has funded since 2013, it appears the budget allocation of only 23,000 extra places still leaves a shortfall of at least 70,000 places. Can the minister explain why the budget only promises 23,000 additional home care packages over four years across all package levels, despite current wait lists of 100,000 people who are waiting up to 18 months for a package for which they have been approved? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank Senator for his question. Mr President, uh, since the 2018-19 budget, this government has invested uh, $4.6 billion in 73,105 new packages. And last night's uh, budget allocation of 23,000 new packages, which uh, is not over four years but over the next 12 months, will make a significant change to those who are waiting for uh, a home care package. Mr. President. And what we're doing is exactly what we said we would do when the Royal Commission handed down its interim report in November last year. Uh, we will continue to invest in new packages, as we've done on three occasions now—10,000 in November in our response to the interim report, 6,105 in July and then 23,000 last night, Mr President. Uh, and this financial year there will be an additional 30,000 home care packages injected into the system. Mr President, we have to grow the workforce. These 30,000 packages, these 30,000 packages will create about 6,000 jobs. 6,000 jobs, Mr President. Uh, and, and to assist with that, Mr President, we've also allocated funding to the Workforce Industry Council of over $10 million. And as we announced last week in conjunction with Minister Cash, over $10 million to support training of nurses to go into an aged care uh, support. And there are a number of other packages, Mr President, uh, through other portfolios, for example, the, the uh, Job Trainer Program, uh, which will provide incentives to employ other people into the residential aged care sector. So, Mr President, the waiting list now has reduced uh, by over 20 per cent since I came to this portfolio. The 30,000 new packages that are being allocated will make a significant uh, contribution to reducing Order. that further. Senator Colbeck. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, th percentages aren't people. When you look at real numbers, and 30,000 is a long way away from uh, meeting 100,000. Now, out of the packages that have been announced, only 2,000 will reportedly be offered at level four, which, as you know, is the highest level of care. Now, around 30,000 older people have died while waiting for their approved package in the past three years. Why hasn't government allocated more packages to the areas of highest need? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Mr. President, uh, the government has allocated the packages to the areas where, will they most, where they will most quickly reduce waiting lists. And so where the demand is and where they will most quickly reduce waiting lists. That's the whole point, Mr. President. So the allocation of the packages, the 30,000 packages over this financial year, have been allocated to reduce waiting lists to, so that people don't have to wait as long as they have been for the for the care that they want through a home care package. But can I also make the point, Mr President, the inference that people are left without care is an incorrect one. All of these people, all of these people have access to Australia's excellent health system to support them. All of them have access to Australia's excellent health system, and 98 per cent of them have an interim package, have access to an interim— 
order have access to an interim package or support through CHPC, CHSP. They are not order, left without Sen support. Senator, again, Colbeck, Mr. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. The budget paper allocates $21 million over four years to, and I'll quote, delay the implementation of payment and arrears for home care services. Yet the government introduced a bill that allocates home care funding and arrears in an attempt to address the millions in unspent funds that are being held or often not returned by providers when aged when age care clients pass away or enter residential care. Does this mean the government plans to delay the reforms by four years that will cost $21 million in unaccounted for funds? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the answer to the question is absolutely not. Mr. President, we delayed the implementation of the payment in arrears uh, cycle because we didn't want to have a negative impact on home care providers during COVID-19. It was having a significant impact. Mr. President, we will follow through with the legislation. I'll be uh, presenting some further information, sec uh, legislation, the second phase of that, into the parliament before Christmas. Uh, and uh, we will be implementing the payment and arrears process during the early phases of 2021. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is last night's budget providing support for new parents whose work has been interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz um, for his question and acknowledge your ongoing interest in the area, particularly supporting Australia's families. Uh, and uh, your very thoughtful op-ed yesterday that we, I'm sure everybody in here um, read in the examiner. Um, but sadly, like so many Australians, um, uh, women uh, expecting mothers uh, faced significant job losses as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, through no fault of their own. And that's why the package that was uh, announced yesterday of $130 million over the next or over the 12-month period to support those parents who found who were previously employed but found themselves unemployed uh, and as a result did not meet the work test for, um, for paid parental leave in the time limit that was allocated. Under normal circumstances, the, the work test requires um, a parent to be in work for 10 out of the previous 13 months prior to the birth of a child in order for them to qualify for paid parental leave. But as, uh, as of the announcement last night, those women who um, were, uh, have gave birth between the 22nd of March this year and the 31st of March next year um, will be able to have a change um, in terms of the arrangements, and that is that instead of 10, uh, 13 out of, uh, 10 months out of 13, it will be 10 months out of 20 months recognising the, the, uh, the difficulty of the pandemic. So that will affect around 12,800 uh, families um, and maintain their connection to the workforce. But we also you know, really understand that many couples had probably made decisions in relation to starting a family before the devastating impact of COVID pandemic and therefore had made their arrangements in relation to their finances and structured their lives, believing that they would be eligible for paid parental leave. So this uh, temporary change recognises that, that many for those 12,800 people um, that, that we understand that they would otherwise have qualified for paid parental leave and now they will be able to get access Order. to it. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that answer and ask further, how do the measures for new parents build on the flexibility changes the government has already made to pay parental leave earlier this year to benefit dads and partners? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, um, earlier this year, um, we passed legislation to provide new families with increased flexibility around how they use their paid parental leave entitlement. Previously, um, it was required that mothers um, take the full 18-week uh, entitlement block in the year after their baby's birth. But uh, under the changes that were passed earlier this year, we now have a situation where uh, the first 12 weeks uh, is taken in the first year, but in order to provide flexibility for the other partner, um, the remaining six weeks can be taken any time in the, the succeeding two years of the birth or the adoption of a child. Um, and it also, as I said, it's very important that now we see that mothers can transfer their entitlement to uh, the other parent or the other partner in order for them to be able to have uh, access to this leave as well. And this certainly means that dads uh, are able to share 
in the support of the newborn with these new arrangements. Um, and we also understand that not all families are the same, and so we want to make sure that we've got Order, greater Senator flexibility. Rustin. Senator Betts, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government supporting grieving families for whom Mrs Purnell has so ably advocated who suffer from the loss of a child? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I was really pleased um, to be able to, and, and I am very pleased to be able to inform the Senate that, as part of the budget process, um, we've improved access to bereavement payments for parents who suffer uh, the tragedy of a stillborn or where their child passes away in the first uh, before their first birthday. Uh, when I came into this place, uh, and I acknowledge um, Senator Keneally um, for her work in this area, um, it became obvious to me that there were, in some instances, lesser payments paid to somebody. Uh, uh, bereaved parents, depending on the circumstances of their families uh, for their child's death. So what we have done is said um, the new stillborn payment will be up to $3,600 for parents uh, on low incomes to support them with the personal and financial impacts of this tragedy. This will support about 900 families every year. Um, we clearly understand that no amount of money can ever make up for the grief of lo losing a child, but we hope in some way this will support parents through that grieving period. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Finance Minister, Senator Cormann, regarding the budget. Tax relief for most Australians who earn less than $90,000 a year will disappear after one year. But millionaires and people like Clive Palmer and Gina Reinhart will get tax cuts of $2,500 a year permanently, Order. increasing further to $11,000 a year in 2024. Yep. Now, of course, tax, tax cuts mean nothing if you don't have a job, and yet unemployment support is on the chopping block. Why has the government chosen the millionaires over the million unemployed Australians? Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question. Uh, Senator Waters is false. Uh, we, are, uh, we have baked in. We have baked in. Uh, tax relief for low and middle income earners uh, into our tax system through legislation passed by this parliament. And they say, oh, but just for one year. No, no, no. What they're, what they're referring to here is the fact that we have extended by another year the low, uh, uh, low and middle income tax offset. So we are, in fact, doubling doubling the income tax relief available for uh, low, low and middle income earners. So you have completely misread uh, the announcement. I mean, what we've of course done here is bring forward uh, income tax relief that was due to come into effect from 2022. Instead, it's going to come into effect from 1 July uh, 2020. Uh, and what we've uh, also made sure is that those who've already benefited from uh, this income tax relief because they were first a cap of the rank when it comes to providing income tax relief uh, in our previous legislation. We have, given, we have in effectively doubled uh, their uh, income tax relief for this year. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. With a gas-led recovery that goes against recommendations from scientists and economists, and taxpayer Order handouts right. to the Vales Point coal fire power station, which just happens to be a generous Liberal Party donor. Why has this government chosen to prop up climate destroying Order. industries rather than support a jobs rich right. transition to a renewable energy future? Order on my right during the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, Colleagues won't uh, be surprised to hear me say I completely reject the premise of the question, because our government, uh, yes, uh, we are committed to uh, maximising the strength of the recovery, uh, but we are also committed to do so uh, in an environmentally efficient fashion, and we are committed to supporting uh, renewables. In fact, our investment in renewables across Australia is higher, higher uh, than that in countries like Germany, France, uh, in fact, across the European Union as a whole. If you I see them shake their heads. If you look at what we are investing in renewable energy in Australia on a per capita basis, it's about triple. It's about triple to what is uh, invested, invested by uh, uh, Germany, for example. But, 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 uh, of course, gas is going to be an important part uh, of our uh, economic recovery. I mean, we, if we want to ensure that our manufacturing sector can be internationally competitive, and we do, then gas is going to be an important transition fuel as part of the, on that journey. Of course it is. And any Order. reasonable— Senator Cormann. Senator Waters. 
Final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Given that women have been hardest hit by the COVID crisis, compounding existing gender inequality, and domestic and family violence is at epidemic levels, why has the government chosen to invest only 0.035 per cent of the budget in measures to address women's economic security and provided no new money for frontline domestic violence services? None. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, under uh, a succession of outstanding uh, Minister for Women's Interests uh, in the coalition, uh, from Senator Cash uh, you know, all the way through now to Senator uh, Pine, uh, we have made very substantial investments in uh, terms of measures uh, to uh, prevent and to address uh, domestic violence, including in this budget. I mean, there's another $150 million worth of support specifically. Order, Senator Waters, <coughs> on a point of order. Point of order, uh, President, misleading the Senate. There is no order, new money Senator in this Waters. budget. That's a matter for debate. Please, you know better than that, Senator Waters. There's an opportunity after question time to debate the merits of answers. Senator Waters, I ask you to please respect the ruling. That's not the appropriate way to raise a matter of substance in an answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, through over uh, and as a result of the contribution of successive uh, outstanding uh, coalition minister, ministers for women's interests, from Senator Cash uh, through to Senator Pine, uh, we have made a substantial uh, commitment uh, to, uh, to the prevention uh, and to addressing uh, domestic violence, including through additional investments in the wake of the COVID. Uh, pandemic, uh, given some of the concerning uh, consequences uh, that that brought with it in, in, in this in this space, uh, 150 million dollars worth Order. of additional Senator support. Corman. Time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Minister, what is the total taxpayer funding committed to support Australia's participation in the 2022 Winter Olympics to be held in Beijing, the capital of the People's Republic of China? Given the gross human rights abuses committed by the Chinese government, including what amounts to genocide against the Uyghur people, uh, the suppression of, the democra of democratic freedoms in Hong Kong and the imprisonment of Australian citizens on trumped-up national security charges, how can the government morally support Australian participation in the 2022 Winter Games in Beijing? Would you agree that Australia should step away from what will be a massive Chinese communist propaganda spectacle. Will you, as the Sports Minister, confer with the Australian Olympic Committee and the Australian Winter Olympic Institute to bring about an Australian boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympic Games? The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, at the outset, can I say that um, Australia remains deeply concerned at by reports of enforced disappearances, mass detention, forced labour and pervasive surveillance of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang and by restriction of freedom of religion and belief in China. Uh, Mr President, uh, these concerns are reflected, I think, across the parliament and the Australian community, and I note Senator Abetz's um, contribution to the parliament uh, during Senator's statements earlier today. Mr President, uh, Minister Payne has clearly conveyed the Australian government's concerns about the situation in Xinjiang to China, including during her last three meetings with State Councillor Wang Yi and during her address to the UN Human Rights Council on 14 September this year. Mr President, Australia will continue to raise our concerns during sessions of the UN Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly, as we have done consistently during recent, recent sessions. Mr President, I have some figures on support for um, winter sports. Um, I will note that uh, all of the funding allocations made to winter sports are available publicly on the Sport Australia website. The last financial figure, year figures that I have for high performance allocations were for the Winter Olympic Institute of $5.25 million and Ski and Snowboard received $1.61 million for able body sport and $1.23 million for 
Paris sports. Mr. President, those numbers go beyond Winter Olympics. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, is it not the case that the International Olympic Committee's 2017 adoption of human rights principles in its host city contracts uh, does not apply to uh, its agreement with China for the 2022 Winter Games in Beijing? Will you, as Sports Minister, contact your counterparts in other Western democracies to urge that their countries boycott the Beijing Games? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and in relation to that particular matter, I do note the comments of Foreign Secretary Raab in recent uh, days, where he indicated that it was his instinct to uh, separate sport from diplomacy. Uh, Mr. President, I share those instincts, but I do not step back from the comments that I made in response to the Senator's primary question. Uh, neither, I think, do anybody in um, the parliament. Mr. President, we have a range of avenues to advocate strongly for human rights in China, including directly with China and in multilateral forums. Uh, we will continue to raise our concerns, as we've done consistently uh, through the joint statement with 38 other countries to raise concerns about human rights in uh, Hong Kong and in Xinjiang. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, would you agree that if Australia is to boycott the Beijing Games, that decision should be taken now without delay so that Australia's Winter Olympic athletes will know where they stand and that appropriate financial support can be provided to the AOC and Winter Olympics Institute? Will you commit to full support for our athletes who should not be asked to compete at an event that will promote a communist government, a communist government engaged in genocide? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can I say that it is not the government, but the Australian Olympic Committee, the independent Australian Olympic Committee, who are responsible for sending teams to Winter and Summer Olympic Games uh, and are independent from government, Mr. President? Uh, and I share Senator Mackenzie's view that I don't believe the AOs, the Australian Olympic Committee re require financial assistance from the government. In fact, they're quite proud of the fact that they don't That's receive fine. any. Mr. President, uh, it is clearly outlined in the AOC's objectives that the AOC has exclusive authority for the representation and participation by Australia at the Olympic Games, Winter Olympic Games, Youth Olympic Games, Youth Olympic Winter Games and at regional games, including the selection and discipline of all members of the team to represent Australia at, their, at those games. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance. At what dollar value and in what year will gross debt peak? Minister for Finance, Senator Thank you very Cormann. Much, uh, Mr President. Order. Order. Are you interested in the answer? Okay, thank you. Uh, so gross debt uh, is uh, projected to keep growing until it stabilises at about 55 per cent as a share of GDP towards the end of the. I mean, honestly. Order. I, I've named... Order. Order. Can we can we please hear the minister who is who is being directly relevant? Um, but they are assuming. That I'm, 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 I'm trying to get the answer, but they're seconds. clearly not interested in the answer. They're clearly they're just more interested in playing politics Order. than you actually listening answer, to the Senator answer. Coleman. So thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was saying, uh, as I was saying, uh, gross debt uh, is projected uh, to keep growing until it stabilises at about 55 per cent as a share of GDP towards the end of the decade, which uh, equates uh, to about 1.7 trillion dollars. Wow. Senator Gallagher, a uh, supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. In 2013, the minister described $280.3 billion in gross debt as a disaster. How then do you describe the $1.7 trillion of debt racked up on your watch? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, unlike, unlike the Labor Party, the Australian people understand why we're here. They understand about the impact of the COVID recession uh, on, on our budget because they understand that as a result of one million Australians losing their job in one month, 
that that has had a severe impact on our government revenue and will have a severe impact on government revenue uh, for uh, some time to come. Uh, government re tax receipts over the forward estimates are projected to be $227 billion lower than anticipated at the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. $227 billion without having made any decision, just as a result of parameter variations. Now, you seek to make the comparison with uh, you know, your period in government. Let me tell you, the GFC was nothing compared to what we're dealing with at the moment. The, the uh, contraction in global growth was 0.1%. 0.1%. We are dealing with a contraction in global growth 45 times as high. 45 times as high as what you are dealing with. And Order, our... Senator Cormann. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister confirm that even before the pandemic, he had overseen a doubling of gross debt and now leaves the role as finance minister with Australia's highest ever debt level, peaking at a staggering $1.7 trillion. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. What I can confirm for Senator Order. Gallagher is what I've confirmed on a number of occasions before. Senator Watt. And that is that before the pandemic, the gross debt and the net debt position Watt, under our 10. government was much better than it would have been under Labor because we corrected the forward trajectory that we inherited Order. from you. Senator we Gallagher and an unsustainable Keneally. spending and debt growth trajectory from the Senator Labor Party. Rennick. And we brought that trajectory down. And I will forever, Wong. Mr. President, I will forever be proud. I will forever be proud about the fact that I played my small role in helping to repair the budget during our first six years in government, to the point where we returned the budget to balance, and to the point where Australia was able to enter this pandemic from a position of comparative Order. fiscal and economic strength. Now, I know the Labor Party is not interested in this, but Australia went into this pandemic in a stronger position than just about any other advanced economy around the world, and in a stronger position Order, than we would have Coleman, if we stayed with your policy answer. settings. Has expired. Order. Order. I will call the next question when there's silence. Senator Watt. Senator Hume and Senator Hume and Watt and Senator Wong. Senator Watt, please at least pause when I call your name. Not often from the same side of the chamber. Senator Stoker. <laughs> My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham, and it's about something that is very, very close to my heart. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan rebuild and create jobs in Australia's tourism industry? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Stoker for her question, especially as a senator from the great state of Queensland with its very strong, very strong interest in our tourism industry and the number and the number of tourism businesses across Queensland. Mr President, our unprecedented scale of economic support for Australian businesses during the COVID recession through programs such as JobKeeper and small business payments of up to $100,000 has sustained hundreds of thousands of jobs and tourism businesses across Australia. And as part of our plan to ensure and secure the future of our tourism industry, we have outlined an extensive range of supports to keep the industry going through these incredibly tough times. Importantly, last night's budget outlined a cash flow boost for companies with a turnover of up to $5 billion by allowing them to temporarily, up to June 2022, offset tax losses against previous profits and tax paid in or after 2018-19 through a temporary loss carryback. This is an exceptionally important decision for many Australian tourism and travel businesses. It will help them in terms of further cash flow support and is a crucial addition to other measures, targeted measures, that our government has undertaken. On World Tourism Day, we announced a $51 million regional tourism recovery initiative to support some of Australia's most internationally reliant tourism regions, including in Senator Stoker's home state of Queensland. We've equally announced a $50 million business events grants program to get events, conferences, trade shows, exhibitions up and running again across the country. Our $100 million investment at a minimum in specific tourism infrastructure across our tourism regions will help regions to get through the tough times and to build back better. 
and our $231 million record funding for Tourism Australia will help to motivate the domestic tourism market and crucially position us well when we can Order. safely welcome Senator back Birmingham. international Senator visitors. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise how employers across the tourism industry have responded to the government's plan that was outlined in last night's budget? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the, uh, the tourism industry has warmly welcomed a number of the measures across the budget. The Australian Tourism Export Council specifically welcomed the tax loss carryback initiative, which they said will help to stem some of the flow of loss to business and support them through to the other side. The Australian Hotels Association uh, said that it will help hospitality businesses to expand and grow in the months ahead and described it as a considered budget that will deliver comprehensive support while the Restaurant and Catering Association acknowledged the work the government is doing to stimulate demand, that it will help thousands of hospitality businesses to bring back young employees, and they described the budget Mr. President, as a real recipe for recovery. Equally, many individual businesses across the country have welcomed this, such as Matt Waller, the owner of Adventure Bay Charters in Port Lincoln, who on ABC Radio thanked the government for what we're doing and described the budget as an amazing opportunity for tourism businesses Order, like Senator his. Birmingham. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise how the government's plan for recovery and jobs in tourism interacts with the decisions of state governments, including in my home state of Queensland? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our government has provided unprecedented scale of support through JobKeeper, through small business payments and through the various other measures announced in last night's budget to support tourism businesses across the country. It's crucial, though, that we see state governments step up as well. I look indeed, Mr President, at the $51 million regional support package we announced, $20 million of which is headed to support internationally dependent tourism regions in Senator Stoker's home state of Queensland. The Palaget government announced a very similar initiative last Saturday. Last Saturday only it was worth just $5 million. Mr President, we need to see governments do more across the states and territories in terms of their support for tourism industries. Equally, I saw Western Australia's tourism minister say the other day that there wouldn't be any rooms for visitors in Western Australia. Well, certainly Tourism Accommodation Australia say that they have rooms ready to be occupied ready to be occupied, Order. Mr President, Senator and Birmingham. states and territories Time need to help to fill has them. Expired. Sen Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Ruston. Frontline domestic violence workers have been clear that the additional money provided for domestic violence services in March does not go far enough. Can the Minister confirm that all the Morrison government's budget has offered to women fleeing domestic violence is a re-announcement of what they already offered in March. The Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, um, Senator McAllister, for your question. Well, the answer is no. Um, the, uh, this government has made an extraordinary commitment, extraordinary commitment to making sure that we support women who make the extraordinary brave decision to escape domestic violence. And as you would be well aware, Senator McAllister, or well, you should be well aware, this government has a number of programs that are ongoing to support women um, who find themselves in the unfortunate position of requiring frontline domestic violence and family uh, domestic violence services. Uh, they include the $340 million that has been put towards the fourth action plan, and currently we're in the process of consulting in relation to uh, a further. Um, action plan to make sure that we're not only dealing with the response that we find we, that we have to do, uh, undertake in response to women who find themselves in a situation where they're facing domestic violence, but also to make sure that we are putting in place the things uh, to make sure that we are preventing it into the to the future. As you rightly point out, order, <coughs> Senator McAllister, on a point of order. It is a question of relevance, Mr. President. I asked whether the minister would confirm whether all that was offered in the budget was a re-announcement. She has stepped through the re-announcements and done it again in this chamber, but I am really looking for a confirmation of whether there is anything new in the budget paper at all. Senator, uh, Senator McAllister, you, you've restated that, that part of the question, um, but also the minister I can't ask the minister to answer it in certain terms, as long as the minister is directly relevant. Um, and you mentioned yourself that the minister had been stepping through various announcements 
Um, my point being that's a matter for debate. The minister is being directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, and if you read your budget papers, you'll see that there was actually a, an, a new announcement that hadn't been announced before in relation to the ongoing funding for um, Australia's national domestic violence hotline, 1800 Respect. 1800 Respect. Um, because we believe that this Order. is one of the most important resources to women who are escaping domestic violence so that they can make sure that they have on Order. demand. Uh, and I take the interjection from, uh, from Senator Watt. I think it was Senator Watt that, that interjected. It is not a re-announcement. It is a new announcement in Order. relation to ongoing funding for the 1800 Respect hotline. Um, but as I said, this is in addition to, as uh, uh, addition to the $150 million that was made available just to address the issue of domestic violence uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, as well as the $340 million of ongoing Order. funding Senator in relation Rustin. to the Fourth Action Senator Plan. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Uh, as early as March this year, domestic violence services and refuges across the country warned the government of an expected increase. Why has the government failed uh, an expected increase in domestic violence during the pandemic? Why then has the government failed to deliver support to these women? In last Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, as Senator McAllister should know, um, that the, the responsibility for the delivery of frontline services rests with the states and territories. We, as a federal government, provide the funding to the states and territories. And in addition to the ongoing funding, we provided $130 million in additional funding to the states and territories to support them in uh, their, their support of women who are escaping domestic violence. In addition to that, we ran the, the uh, Help Is Here campaign, which very successfully provided advice to women who found themselves in need of support to find out where the services were available to them and providing counselling and other support to women who found themselves victims of domestic violence during the COVID pandemic. And only last week, uh, Senator McAllister, we made the announcements in relation to the allocation of the, uh, the funding for 40 new facilities to provide safe places for women who are escaping Order. domestic violence. I could barely hear Senator Rustin at the end of that um, question. Senator McAllister, you have a final supplementary. Mr. President, women over 55 are the fastest growing group of homeless Australians, and yet last night's budget delivered nothing to address women's homelessness. What advice does the minister have for women over 55 who are facing homelessness and have been left behind by this budget? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, this government takes very seriously homelessness, um, and equally, um, homelessness of older women is of particular concern. Um, however, um, and, and the federal government provides, um, on a normal year, six billion dollars. Six billion dollars, Senator Watt. Six billion dollars uh, to support the states and territories here in the delivery Senator, of Senator homelessness Watt. and us uh, and community housing projects um, to make sure that we are lifting our weight when it comes to supporting uh, people who find themselves in need of, of housing. Um, and, but this year, Senator Watt, this year, just for your information, because this is a demand-driven scheme, we will be providing $7.5 billion in support of social housing and homelessness initiatives to support the states and territories for the delivery of these frontline services to help all Australians, but particularly to make sure that we are helping older women who find themselves in this particularly difficult situation as a result of the pandemic. Order, Senator Rust Senator Wong, is this point of order? Se I seek leave. I'm Senator seeking leave to is table leave. the budget paper number two, which demonstrates that the 1800 respect number to which is the minister leave. referred was announced order. in February, um, is, and is, ask is, her is if she would granted. like to correct the record um, now uh, or later. Order, order. If sought leave, Senator Wong. I'll call the leader of the government. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As uh, Senator Wong knows, the budget was tabled yesterday. But if she would like, uh, by me, if she would like to table the budget again, I'm happy to give her leave. Is leave, is leave granted? All right, leave, leave, order, order. Oh, Senator Wong, you've asked for leave. I've offered. I've asked. The, um, there's a time for debate. You've sought leave to table something and make a point. I've allowed you to make the point. I've asked for leave, and the minister has granted leave. Senator Wong. Uh, I, I, I'm seeking leave to move a motion to require the minister. Well, that is a different matter. Correct the record. Okay. Well, that is a different. If matter, she wishes sir. to do it after question order. time, we'll give her leave order. then. Order.
Senator Wong, that is a different matter than the one you just raised. So, is leave granted for that? Uh, the mo the, is leave to move a motion to, if I'm correct, Senator Wong, to call the minister to make a statement to the chamber? Is that a correct characterisation? Well, Senator Rustin. In, in order to, to assist, um, Senator Wong, I don't believe that I did mislead the Senate. However, I will um, return to the Senate um, today and make any clarification or qualification should I have been incorrect. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. With record funding for aged care outlined in last night's budget, can the minister outline the Morrison government's plan to provide more home care Order. packages to support senior Australians since the 2018-19 budget, including since the interim report of the Royal Commission? Order on my left. Order. Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Henderson, for her question, Mr. President. Mr. President, supporting senior Australians to live in their own homes has always been one of this government's key priorities. At every opportunity, Mr. President, we have provided additional home care packages to help senior Australians with their household tasks to get the equipment that they may need and access personal and clinical care as they age in their own homes, Mr. President. Last night, Mr. President, the Morrison government has announced $1.6 billion, $1 billion for an additional 23,000 packages, building on the $235.7 million investing 6,105 packages announced in July, Mr. President. This means that over this financial year, this government has around 30,000 New home care packages will be available to senior Australians—30,000 new packages, Mr President. This brings our overall investment in additional, to an additional $4.6 billion in 73,105 packages since the 2018-19 budget. Mr. President. And I do recall, Mr President, at the last election, the opposition went to the election That's with $387 right. billion worth of new taxes and not a single home care package, Mr President. Not a single home care package. So their crocodile tears fall on very, very deaf ears over here. Mr President, by the end of this financial year, Order. We, will have, Order. we will have tripled the number of home care packages that were in place when we came to government in 2000. And 13 under Labor. And Mr. President, we will not stop until Australians, senior Australians have access to the package and the care that they need. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Senior Australians need a skilled and responsive aged care workforce. How is the government developing and supporting the aged care workforce now and into the future? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, more home care places mean more jobs, and our latest announcement of home care will generate almost 6,000 new jobs over the next 12 months. Last night, we announced an investment of $10.3 million to support the Aged Care Workforce Industry Council to lead the implementation of the workforce industry strategy. And last week, as part of our response to the Royal Commission's report, Mr. President, the government announced $10.8 million to expand the Australian College of Nursing Scholarship Program to establish an aged care transition to practice program and establish the skills development program for nurses and personal care workers in aged care. Mr President, the funding will provide opportunities for the aged care workforce to increase their skills and capabilities and support them to be well equipped and ensure the care Order, and protection Senator of people Colbeck. in care. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Royal Commission recommended action to reduce the number of younger people with a disability going into aged care. What has the government done to date to address this important issue? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank you uh, for the question, Senator Anderson. 
It is important that young people with complex needs get the right care and in the right setting, Mr. President. The government is proactively working to address the Aged Care Royal Commission's finding that residential aged care is not the appropriate place for uh, younger people, in, except in exceptional circumstances. Mr. President, we are already making progress in this, in this space. As at 30 June 2020, the number of people under age 65 years in residential aged care has reduced from over 6,000 6, in 2017-18 to 4,860 4, as at 30 June this year. And Mr. President, the government is providing another $10.6 million to continue to reduce the number of people uh, aged and, and under 65 or at risk of in residential care in conjunction with the plan to reduce the number Order. of people aged Senator care. Colbeck. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed uh, on the notice paper. Senator Rustin. And provide additional um, uh, advice to Senator Watt. I took on notice yesterday um, in, uh, and said I would provide additional information to the Chamber in relation to the Emergency Response Fund. Um, so, um, the fund provides an additional and sustainable source of funding for emergency response and recovery from natural disasters in Australia that have significant or catastrophic impact. The Director General Emergency Management Australia is responsible for providing the Minister uh, advice on accessing the fund and the design of programs to be funded. When that advice is received, the responsible minister will consider the most appropriate use of the fund, taking into consideration the other significant amounts being spent on resilience building activities, which include the $261 million joint state Commonwealth funding over five years for risk reduction activities in line with the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, $88.1 million for New World Class Disaster Resilience Research Centre, $25.9 million annually indexed and ongoing to the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, and $8 million towards the development of a public safety mobile broom band capability. For recovery, funding of up to $150 million per year may be accessed if existing recovery programs are insufficient. For resilience and preparedness, or to reduce the risk of future disasters, funding of up to $50 million per year is also available. The government committed an, additional two, an initial $2 billion for the National recovery, Bushfire Recovery Fund to coordinate the national response to real build communities and livelihoods after the devastating 2019-20 uh, Black Summer bushfires. That amount far exceeds what was available from the Emergency Response Fund in any given year, and for that reason the fund has not been accessed for recovery. A formal decision of the government is required uh, to access the Emergency Response Fund. Access to these funds are the subject to arrangements detailed in the Era of Guidelines tabled in the Senate earlier this year. Public infrastructure such as toilets are covered under the disaster recovery funding arrangements. Privately owned toilets are not covered under disaster recovery funding arrangements, but support may be offered through grants to small business, primary producers and other mechanisms. I cannot provide any more specific advice without the details of the toilets you were referring to. The government is always willing to work with members of the opposition to support those recovering from natural disasters. I am sure victims would prefer the opposition to work collaboratively with the government as well. Thank you, Minister Rustin. Are you taking notes, Senator? Wouldn't you, have to take note of you that want to take statement note. Yes. before we get to the question time. Just, do I need leave? Uh, you can move to take okay, note. I move to take note of the minister's yes. statement. I thank, yes. the, I, thank the minister, I thank the minister for returning to the chamber and answering this question that I asked yesterday. Uh, and uh, I must admit I was disappointed with her answer yesterday. A, because she didn't know the answer, and B, because she dismissed this emergency response fund as some fund. Well, that some fund actually matters very deeply to bushfire victims and to people who are threatened by natural disasters right across our country. Uh, it appears from all the weather forecasts that we are currently receiving uh, that the greatest threat we face in terms of natural disasters this summer is actually in the form of cyclones and floods, particularly in the northern part of our country, rather than bushfires. Uh, but the fact remains um, that whatever funds the minister wants to refer to now as being available for disaster purposes, the fact remains that the government is sitting on a $4 billion emergency response fund uh, which was set up to allocate $200 million per year for disaster recovery and mitigation work, and not a single cent has been sent, spent to date from that emergency response fund. We voted with the government. 
last October to establish the Emergency Response Fund. This was something that the government announced in last year's budget, last April, which is what uh, 18 months ago. 18 months ago, the government announced an emergency response fund, a $4 billion fund, which would provide $200 million a year for disaster recovery and mitigation efforts. And here we are, 18 months on, not a single cent has been spent. Now, it's not as if there aren't projects that this money could be being used for. We referred to one yesterday in question time. In Bega, one of the towns badly affected by the bushfires last year, there, are, there is a community group who is currently crowdfunding to obtain funds to build new toilet facilities at their evacuation centre. The toilet facilities that they have in place at the moment and that they had to use at last, last bushfire season, uh, you have to go upstairs to access them, which means that elderly people and disabled people can't actually use these toilets when they're in an evacuation centre. It's completely unacceptable. Now, these people are, of course, always threatened by the risk of bushfire. They live in an area which is at high risk. What is to say that we don't get more bushfires there this year and people, elderly people and disabled people are not able to access toilets uh, when they go to an evacuation centre? What is to say in North Queensland or the Northern Territory or anywhere else in Northern Australia this summer when we get hit by a cyclone, as appears inevitable, uh, that there weren't cyclone shelters that could have been built using these funds? There weren't flood levies that could have been built using these funds. But here we are, 18 months on from this emergency response fund being announced by the, budget, by the government in last year's budget without a single spent cent having been spent. I really hope we don't get to this summer witnessing cyclones, witnessing floods, witnessing bushfires and wish that we had the opportunity to use these funds but that that, fund, that, that opportunity was blown. We saw what happened last year when this government failed to prepare for the bushfires. They were warned repeatedly by uh, climatologists, by ex-fire chiefs, by the opposition, by all sorts of people that we faced intense bushfire risk. And yet they didn't prepare. They didn't get the aerial firefighting in place that was required. They didn't take all sorts of other steps that were required and could have been taken which would have avoided the tragic losses that we saw in last year's bushfires. And now, here we are, 18 months on from this fund being announced, not a single spent, a cent having been spent from that fund. We're now in bushfire season in northern parts of the country. There are bushfires happening right now in my home state of Queensland, as far north as Cooktown. So we're in bushfire season already. We're probably a couple of months away from cyclones and floods. And we've got this $4 billion fund that is sitting there completely unused when there are projects that communities are crowdfunding for to build. This government has got to do better. They have got to be better prepared for the disaster season that lies ahead than they were last year. They have funds at their disposal. They should use them and they should stop community groups having to turn to crowdfunding to provide basic infrastructure to keep them safe. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye against. I believe the ayes have it. Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Rustin to the question asked by Labor senators. So in question time today, the responses that we received from those ministers confirmed what we already have already have come to know about this, this budget, and it's a budget that leaves millions of Australians behind. Australians who, through no fault of their own, Madam De Deputy per President, have lost their job or are out of work during the deepest and darkest recession we've faced in a lifetime. In particular, this budget leaves behind Australian women. Women workers have been hit particularly hard by this recession. Yet where are the measures put forward to get women back into work? Where is the plan for jobs in industries dominated by women? Industries we know that have been hit, by the, har hit the hardest by the Morrison recession. The government has put forward nothing, no new initiatives, no policies to deal with the gender pay gap, gap or to tackle the retirement income gap. There is nothing 
in this budget to rectify the imbalance in women's super. Nothing for domestic or family violence services, not one, not one extra dollar for frontline services. Now, Madam Deputy President, this is the government's eighth budget, their eighth budget deficit. Despite their endless rhetoric of the past decade, that mob over there have never been able to balance the budget. They haven't paid down any debt. In fact, they're clocking up a trillion dollars of debt. A complete repudiation of the decade of nonsense they, they have pursued as they bleated about debt and deficit. They are the masters of debt and deficit. They own every cent of it. And despite all of the spending, the budget still doesn't do any, go anywhere near enough to create jobs. It fails to build this nation. It fails to build our future. It fails to strengthen our nation by spreading equality and opportunity. Now, despite, Madam Deputy President, what those opposite want the Australian people to believe, this budget quite clearly leaves far too many Australians left out and left behind. We know the government expects a further 160,000 Australians to lose their jobs before Christmas. We know that unemployment is forecast to be far too high for too long. This includes 928,000 Australians over the age of 35 currently on JobSeeker, people who are actively searching for work, and yet this government this government has chosen to exclude them from being able to access hiring subsidies. For many of these Australians, the government has chosen quite deliberately to sentence them to a long-term unemployment with all the terrible consequences we know that brings. And to rub salt into the wound, they want to return JobSeeker to just $40 a day. How cruel! How heartless, how economically reckless. Australians need and deserve much better. Over a trillion dollars of debt, a track record of no delivery and no plan for the future. That's what this budget is. That's what this budget is, De Madam Deputy President. And this budget has quite clearly overlooked my state of Tasmania, in particular the north and the northwest of Tasmania. In fact, it looks like northern Tasmania has been left off the map. There is nothing in this budget to bust traffic congestion in Launceston, no progress on the Launceston Eastern Bypass, no progress on the sidling, a pitiful underfunding of much needed works on the long neglected West Tamar Highway. There is nothing for the East Coast, nothing for the Tasman Highway from Launceston to Sorrell nothing for the Arthur Highway. Once again, nothing in this budget for traffic con congestion in Hobart. And there's nothing, uh, nothing to gear up Hobart Airport to receive international flights, despite the rhetoric from the thank Assistant Minister Thank you, Senator Minister Brown. Your time Tath has expired. Senator Canavan. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, look, I, I feel a little, little bit sorry for the Labor Party at the moment. Um, some of my Maybe my Catholic guilt coming in here, but uh, I feel a little sorry because they, they are struggling here, uh, struggling a little to, to mount a logical and coherent uh, 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 rebuttal or opposition, if you like, to, to, the, to last night's budget. I, I know it's the job, it's the job of the opposition to, to oppose, and so I know they, they naturally feel this morning that uh, whatever was announced last night, they uh, have to. They are duty bound to to take a uh, an opposition viewpoint, uh, uh, but it's pretty hard. I think you've just just seen it's it's pretty difficult because this is a moment that I think most Australians want to see us come together and and, and support the country and the nation, uh, recover uh, from what uh, has been a probably once in a century uh, 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 upheaval uh, to the global economy. 
uh, so it would be, I think, a little more productive and construction, constructive sorry, if the Labor Party came into this place and put forward uh, some productive and constructive ideas about how we can uh, recover from what has been the worst recession in our nation's history, rather than simply oppose everything that has been put forward. As I said, uh, uh, there's, there's, um, there's, 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 there's errors right through the, the uh, uh, Labor Party's response to the budget here that's been provided today. Uh, I mean, the very, the, very, the very starting point of their response is incorrect, clearly incorrect. We've seen the Labor Party try to get some kind of traction out of this term, the Morrison recession. Uh, uh, you know, for, 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 for a political slogan to work, it has to have some kernel of truth, some basis in fact. I mean, does anyone think that the recession that we are experiencing right now is a result directly of the actions of this government? That is absolutely absurd. When every country in the world, effectively, certainly in the Western world, has faced uh, uh, record-breaking reductions in economic output, it is not something that is alone to the Australian government. In fact, if you were to put us up against each other, the economic impact here has been much, much lower. And we've had fortunate, fortunate status of being an island and locking up our borders. We accept that. But the, the economic reduction now put here has been about 7 per cent in Australia. Uh, uh, our friends across the ditch, it's been uh, well over 10 per cent. Uh, in the UK, it's been 20 per cent. And in most countries in Europe, well, well into double digit reductions in economic output. Uh, so it's not something that's directly caused uh, by this government. There are errors in this government with this uh, Labor Party response too. I just heard Senator Brown there say that uh, there's no new money for, uh, for women or domestic violence. That's absolutely incorrect. I actually don't have time now to go through all of the initiatives for women in this budget. But just to hone in on the point on domestic violence, uh, there is money put forward to protect against domestic violence in this budget. There is provided more funding for the Help Us Here advertising campaign. Uh, especially over Christmas this year, where we know people will face challenges. There's $4.8 million to give continued effect to the ban on direct cross-examinations and $1.8 million in the budget towards criminalising breaches of family court orders. There's also $10.2 million for family and federal circuit courts to ensure the safety of vulnerable litigants and to manage the sharp increase in urgent applications we've seen through COVID. Now, those measures also actually build on the $150 million the government has already put aside across the last two years to support Australians experiencing domestic, family and sexual violence from the fallout from COVID-19. Uh, so millions of dollars put aside from the gov by this government during this pandemic uh, to help those experiencing domestic violence and more funding provided last night as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a logical incoherence, as I mentioned, to this Labor Party's response. They are, on the one hand, uh, criticising the government uh, for, for debt increasing, which has been a necessary consequence of the economic fallout. And on the same hand, saying, uh, well, job keeper and job seeker, job seeker in particular, we just heard from Senator Brown, has to stay higher for longer than what it is. Well, you can't have it both ways. If you're going to spend more, we're going to increase debt. The, the desperate thing now is for it to get Australians back to work. That's why we're offering hiring incentives for apprenticeships and other workers. We have to get people back to work. We cannot keep, keep paying people to sit on the couch right now, especially when many businesses I go to are desperate for workers. I was at a citrus farm in Emerald last week. They are ripping up trees right now because they cannot find workers. We've got to get people back to work so we don't we stop the economic destruction of our country. And finally, finally, I don't want to provide advice to the Labor Party, but as I said earlier, it would be much better, I think, and more constructive if we work together now to recover this nation, just as this budget is doing last night. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and it is pretty remarkable to uh, get a lesson in scare campaigns from Senator Kennevan. Um, he is uh, someone who has been the master of those. So for him to come into this chamber uh, and deliver uh, a lesson to us on scare campaigns is completely unbelievable. I certainly know that the Productivity Commission must hang their heads in shame when they think about his former tenure at the Productivity Commission as well. But it is pretty remarkable from, to hear these conservative senators from over the other side uh, come in here and defend the trillion dollar debt that this government has got itself into. And it is pretty remarkable that they could plunge us into this trillion dollar debt uh, and still leave so many people suffering and do, and as a result of the long term damage of this Morrison recession that we are dealing with. 
And it is important to remember that the economy was already weak before we found ourselves dealing with this COVID recession that the Morrison government has overseen. And we'll, I'll get to the specifics of what we went through in question time today because it was really important, the questions that we put to the government and highlighting some of the issues that we did. But I also want to highlight the lack of imagination and vision in this budget that was delivered last night. A government so small in vision that as we confront this challenge, uh, in, already in an economy that was already weak, that they offer so little hope about what a better future looks like. So for those Australians that are doing it tough and have suffered as a consequence of COVID, uh, this government actually offered nothing last night for those people um, to look forward to over the next 18 months, two years, as hopefully Australia and the world recovers. And there's no expectation from Australia and its people that we can actually come through this stronger. Uh, it's almost as if the government said to those people, um, we're going to continue to, to bottom along here, um, hit the bottom of the ocean, and then hopefully one day uh, we'll emerge out of this. But it isn't going to be um, so people can look forward to something better. It isn't going to be so that people are going to have the opportunity to retrain or get into different uh, forms of work. Uh, it is going to be a very bleak future for those people who have been impacted. And this is where we directed our questions in question time today. Um, we focused on the trillion dollar debt that leaves many Australians behind. Uh, all the announcements, all the spending, they're still expecting to add 160,000 people to the jobless queue by Christmas. So if you listen to the rhetoric from those opposite and what they've been announcing in recent times, it is still going to get harder for a lot of people between now and Christmas, only a few months away. So they're racking up a trillion dollars in debt, but unemployment is going to be too high for too long, and many Australian families will suffer as a result. I think the question that we put to the government uh, by Senator Wong on those people over 35 uh, who are looking for work. So 928,000 of them. Uh, I know that there are so many of those in regional Queensland. I think of places like Harvey Bay, Maryborough, which already have uh, high unemployment over the last couple of years. Uh, the number of people in those areas that will be impacted by this that are going to be excluded from the hiring incentives. That will have a very significant impact in regional Queensland and make it much harder for these regional economies to recover because of decisions by the government. So they offer no delivery, we know that. They offer no plan for the future for these people to have something to look forward to. And the decisions taken by this government in the budget mean that the recession will last longer, uh, it will be deeper, and more people will be impacted than is necessary. Uh, they offer no plan to lift the permanent rate of job seeker from $40 a day. Imagine the anxiety from those people out there who are on this rate now, trying to plan for what their future looks like. The government offered them nothing last night. Uh, we know the plague of insecure work and the damage that that has done, uh, let alone the role that's played in the outbreaks in Victoria. The government offered nothing to tackle insecure work, uh, nothing to improve access to childcare, which will be so important for so many families and parents who want to get back into the workforce and something that the Labor Party has been campaigning on strongly now uh, for months is around social housing. Um, such a great opportunity to provide um, some long-term vision and some long-term good out of this challenge, provide employment for people, but have something to, for people to look forward to so that they had that opportunity to get into a secure house, and the government again provided nothing for them. Um, they give nothing to Australians so that they can have any confidence that their future is going to be better once Australia emerges from thank this crisis. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I, uh, like Senator Canavan, am Catholic, but I don't uh, share any of his Catholic guilt uh, when I look across uh, at the squirming uh, of some of our Senator, some of our Labor senators, whether it's uh, Senator Chisholm or Senator Brown, uh, as they seek to defend the absurd and ludicrous and delusional lines that are being fed to them by the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Albanese, and uh, by the Shadow Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, who had uh, mm -hmm. quite, quite the cracking performance on Insiders, it must be said, uh, which I'll come to. But they've been fed these lines, and the lines are effectively this. And we, we heard sort of both of them uh, from the two Labor senators' contributions. The first line is that 
we're in recession and it's all the government's fault and there isn't this global crisis that's occurring that's seen a economic hit that is 45 times 45 times the size of the global financial crisis so the first part of their delusional message which they're being asked to trot out is look nothing to see here What's, there's no crisis i mean this is this is the morrison recession they say this is what jim chalmers was saying in, on insiders on the weekend and, and i'll come back to that but they also talk about debt uh, they want to talk about debt uh, because they want people to pretend, one, there's nothing going on here and there's no reason uh, why the government has been forced into this position. But they also want to take this absurd and have this absurd double standard where they come in here and they tell us we're not spending enough on job seeker, we're not spending enough on job keeper. All of these programs that they want us to spend more on, uh, and yet they're then complaining about the debt. You can't have it both ways. Now, David Spears, to his credit, put this to the shadow treasurer on Sunday. You know, he said, he said, here I mean you've been critical about too much debt being racked up. At the same time, you want the government to spend more on JobKeeper, as you pointed out, job seeker, aged care, social housing, universities and childcare. Can you just clear up? Do you want the government to spend more or less? And it's a very good question for the Labor Party as they, as they flail around looking for a rationale for their being, as they flail around looking for a critique of this budget. You can't pretend we don't have this global crisis, which is 45 times the economic hit of the global financial crisis. You can't pretend uh, that we haven't seen this downturn right around the world and the fact that, relatively speaking, as difficult as, as it has been, Australia has done much better than most. Now that's something we can be proud of, whilst all the while saying these are tough times and they take extraordinary measures to respond to it. So you can't come in here and say spend more, spend more, spend more, and then complain about the fact that there is more debt. Well, well, that's going to happen uh, unless your plan is to rapidly ramp up taxes, as you've done in the past, as you took to the last election. You know that was the plan, and in fact. In fact, Jim Chalmers was on Insiders again and again failed to di distance himself from the negative gearing policy, from the franking credits policy. That still remains Labor's policy. So is that the way uh, you're going to lower debt? Is it going to be by taxing retirees? Is it going to be by taxing homeowners and renters, as you took to the last election? Or are you going to get real and realise that we're dealing with a significant crisis now in this budget? Deputy President, the government has sought to respond to the circumstances that we find ourselves in with a focus on getting Australians back into jobs. And I, can, I, I, for one, am very proud, and I know my constituents are very happy about the tax cuts that are coming their way. Uh, you know, for average income earners, around $2,500 per person, around $5,000 per household. Now, $5,000 per house on $100 per week that's going to be there. Now, some people have said, oh, well, it won't all be spent. Well, it may, it may not all be spent. A, a significant amount of it will be spent. Some of it will be saved, and that will support households as well as they make decisions going forward, as they make the decision to pay off their mortgage. I'm really proud we've been able to deliver local infrastructure projects, and I point here in the ACT to our massive injection to expand the Tuggeranong Parkway, the Malonglo River Bridge, the Monero Highway. These are really important projects, and we're seeing them right around the country, delivered by this government. Now, when it comes to this budget, uh, we are absolutely with a laser-like focus, focused on getting young people back into work. Uh, and that's why giving a credit to employers who hire uh, young people is so critical. We don't want to see a generation lost, as we saw under Labor's recession in the early 90s. We're going to continue to do this job. This is a budget that is very, very important. Thank you, Senator Seselja. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, um, Madam President. Deputy President, sorry. Gave you a promotion there. Uh, it must be so deflating to have come in here one day after the budget having to give a five-minute speech about what your government's delivering and actually only be able to deliver 60 seconds, 60 seconds of things that the government is doing to get us out of the worst economic recession in a century. And I know that Jim Chalmers, uh, the shadow treasurer, uh, came to Cairns last week and heard firsthand about how this economic crisis is impacting uh, Cairns and the far north Queensland 
region. And that was a really important visit because we know that this government has left far north Queensland behind. This budget, delivered yesterday, includes no new projects for Cairns, no extra funding for social housing in far north Queensland. One of the areas hit first and worse by this economic recession and not a single project in Cairns announced. Just more re-announcements, more press releases re-announced, redrafted, but not a single project for Cairns. That is at the same time that the government is ripping $29 million per fortnight out of the local economy in far north Queensland by cutting JobKeeper. What the budget failed to do yesterday is replace that funding, to replace those jobs. We know that jobs will be lost in Cairns and in places in far north Queensland because of this economic recession. And the task for the government last night was to explain to people living in regional Queensland how they were going to replace JobKeeper funding with jobs. And they failed to do that. Not a single project for Cairns. In Mackay and the Whit Sundays, well, they've missed out as well. They missed out on the six $62.8 million local jobs task force, which covers Cairns and Townsville. They've just, Whit Sundays is one of the areas hardest hit by the economic crisis, and yet they've been completely left out of a local jobs task force. The federal government, the Morrison government, is leaving regional Queensland behind during this economic recession. But that's not the only people they decided to leave behind last night. When it comes to the women's economic security package, there's very little new funding, very little new funding for women, and no funding certainty for the things that we really need to see in the future to secure women's economic certainty. No new funding for childcare to bring down the cost of living, and no plan or strategy for how we're going to improve childcare costs over the short term and the long term as well. A re-announcement of, of a announcement uh, around domestic and family violence, funding that had already been announced, re-announced again. I mean, who do, do they just think women won't notice that we don't know how to read the budget papers and we won't figure out that this is actually something that you announced in March? Zero dollars of new funding under that package. Women over 35 will miss out on the wage subsidy scheme, so older women will also miss out through this budget. And on the paid parental leave changes that the government actually did, did include in the budget last night, that will make sure that women who did lose their job will still be eligible to PPL. They want a pat on the back for this measure. It is the least that you could do for women who have lost their job because we know that more women have lost their jobs during this economic crisis. And you want a pat on the back because women who are pregnant now are eligible for PPL? That is the least that you could do. The economic recovery plan for women, I've got it here, the top three things that you've listed, first is the JobKeeper payment. Well, you're cutting that and you're gonna cut it again. So there goes that idea. Then you've got the job making hiring credit. Well, that doesn't include women over 35, so we'll just forget about them. Then the next thing, tax relief. Okay, but everyone's getting that. So that's not really just for women, is it? Like the economic response to women losing their jobs Thank is you, for Senator you. Senator Green, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Brown to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response given uh, to my questions to uh, Senator Cormann. Um, now, I asked the Finance Minister about facets of the budget. I asked about why millionaires are going to do better than the million unemployed out of this government's budget. I asked about their cooked gas led recovery and the fact that some of their donors are now getting taxpayer handouts 
in this budget, and yet there is pittance for renewable energy. And then I asked about why there is not a single cent for frontline domestic violence services in this of all years, when we have said what was already epidemic rates of domestic violence further increase. Um, unfortunately, Mr Cormann, true to form, uh, rejected the premise of the question. Um, I, I don't know why they think that line is, is a real good one for them, because, frankly, it's just a national eye roll every time they trot it out. So they've rejected the premise of the fact that millionaires will do better out of these tax cuts than ordinary Australians. And most ordinary Australians, who earn less than $90,000 a year, have got that one-off injection through the low- and middle-income tax offset that expires after one year. But those tax cuts that will disproportionately benefit the already uh, well-off and twice as many men as women, I might add, they'll last forever. But the low- and middle-income tax offset, just one year, a temporary boost. And yet they want to try to claim some kind of equity here. Well, they're not fooling anybody. Um, now, the gas-led recovery. This flies in the face of climate science. It flies in the face of economics. I think the minister trotted out that he thought that more gas would actually somehow stimulate manufacturing when we know that the sky-high gas prices, thanks to all the gas that we've been exporting as we cook the climate with it, has actually made it harder for onshore manufacturing because it's increased gas prices. So I, I genuinely don't understand how he can possibly have uh, a different interpretation. But what was announced last night is public money to open up five new gas basins, two of which are in Queensland, the Galilee Basin and the North Bowen. Now, there's some pretty good quality farmland in those areas, and this government wants to use your money to give big multinational gas corporations uh, a hand, a tax break, to rip out that fossil fuel in a way that will endanger the groundwater, wreck the on-surface operations of anyone that's actually using that land, probably don't care whether they've got traditional owner consent or not, and then will leak tonnes and tonnes of methane to atmosphere. Um, this is the so-called gas-led recovery, when instead we could have seen genuine investment in clean renewable energy that creates more jobs. This government has gone into the biggest debt ever. But it's giving this money to millionaires, it's giving it to big corporates, and it's giving it to big polluters. Like You had a chance to fix, uh, fix the future, to bring us back for a green job-led recovery where we invest in uh, actually climate action um, and services, hospitals, schools, things that people rely on and frankly deserve. But no, it's just yet more money for big corporates and for millionaires—$99 billion in tax cuts and corporate subsidies. Well, what an absolute joke. I mean, I guess, I guess that's why this cosy relationship between the donors and the politicians continues to astound and aggravate every single ordinary Australian that I speak to about it. Um, now, the last aspect I asked about was why women are such an afterthought in this government. We know they don't have many women on their cabinet. We know they don't have a, a, a women's budget impact statement. They don't have a gender lens. Tony Abbott got rid of that in 2014, and they've consistently refused to bring it back. Well, last night they released a two-page women's economic statement with the budget, and then a few hours later they hastily released a slightly longer and very glossy uh, paper that, frankly, didn't say much more and that constituted 0.035 per cent of the budget spend. I'm afraid we are more than 50 per cent of the population, folks. We deserve more than 0.035 per cent of the budget. And as I said before, there was not a single cent of that money, that pitifully small money, for frontline domestic violence services. Now, they're trying to rely on some earlier announcements, which were welcome but very, very small. The women's safety sector asked for $12 billion over 12 years. They want $1 billion a year to keep women and children safe. What did they get? Big fat zero. I don't know what more we have to do to get this government to keep women and children safe and to do the right thing. How many more women are going to have to die for Order. us to get proper funding? My question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I understand by agreement with the whips we will be dealing with the placing of uh, sorry, notices of motion prior to moving the condolence. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fioravanti-Wells. 
with my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion numbers one and two, standing in my name for nine sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the ASIC Corporation's foreign financial services providers foreign AFS licensees instrument 2020-198 and ASIC Corporation's Foreign Financial Services Providers Funds Management Financial Services Instrument 2020-199. Are there any other notices of motion to be given? There being none, we'll move on. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 12th of September of the Hon. John Joseph Fay AC, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of MacArthur, New South Wales, from 1996 till 2001, and a former Premier of the State of New South Wales. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former minister and member of the House of Representatives, John Joseph Fay AC. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, I move that the Senate records uh, its deep sorrow at the death on 12 September 2020 of the Honourable John Joseph Fay, IC, former Minister for Finance and Administration and former member for MacArthur, places on record its gratitude for his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its profound sympathy to his family uh, in their bereavement. Uh, Mr President, humble, courageous, principled, Honourable, selfless, a good bloke, an optimist, a man of integrity. Uh, those are just some of the words that have been used to describe John Fay uh, since uh, his sad passing uh, earlier uh, in September. He was all of that and more, a man whose common decency shone through making him someone admired and liked on both sides of politics. John leaves behind a profound legacy. He gave almost two decades of dedicated public service to the people of Australia. First, as a member of the New South Wales State Parliament, where he was a minister and then Premier of New South Wales. He then came to Canberra, where he served as Australia's Minister for Finance. As Premier, he helped to deliver major reforms for New South Wales and he helped to secure the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Then in the Federal Parliament, as Minister for Finance, he helped to repair Australia's finances uh, in the mid to late 1990s. John was born on 10 January 1945 in Wellington, New Zealand to Irish immigrants, Stefan and Annie Fay who left Ireland in the late 1930s to create a better life for themselves and their children, or the children that they hoped to have at that point. At age 10, John's family immigrated to Australia and settled in Picton, New South Wales. He completed his high school education at Chevalier College in uh, Barrow, and then went on to complete a diploma of law at the University of Sydney. At 23, John married Colleen McGarren, they had three children, Melanie, Matthew and Tiffany. John was an avid lover of sport and very passionate about rugby league. He was a Canterbury Bankstown man through and through, who played reserve grade for the Bulldogs and held a number of administrative positions at the grassroots level. Upon graduating from university, John practiced as a solicitor and eventually as a senior partner in his own firm. His first exposure to politics was during the 1972 federal election, where John found himself as a supporter for the member for MacArthur, Jeff Bates, who was running as an independent. John came from a family of strong Labour supporters. His father and sister even handed out Labour How to Vote cards at that 1972 federal election. But it was what he referred to as the extravagances of the Whitlam government as, uh, it was um, because of that that he decided to jump off the fence and join the Liberal Party. In his first speech to the Federal Parliament, <clears throat> John attributed his uh, parents' teachings and his upbringing as to why he chose to join the Liberal Party. And I'm quoting from his first speech now. 
They taught me to think for myself. And that is why I am a member of the Liberal Party. I have never voted Labour, as some scribes have written. The Liberal Party stands for all Australians, not any vested interest groups such as the unions, and it supports reward for effort. Nothing is more Australian. Almost a decade later, John decided to run in the 1984 New South Wales state election, contesting and winning the seat of um, Camden. Four years later, he ran as a Liberal candidate for the newly created seat of South Southern Highlands, winning it. In the same year, Nick Greiner led the New South Wales Liberals back into power. Under Nick Greiner as Premier, John served as Minister for Industrial Relations and later Minister for Education, Training and Employment. However, four years later, Greiner would step down as Premier and John was elected as the new New South Wales Party leader. John was loyal to Greiner until the end, and it is a measure of his character that he would go on to describe the day Greiner resigned and he became Premier as the saddest day of his life. Though his time as Premier was short-lived, he led a major overall of the industrial relations system, introduced the Disability Services Act, the New South Wales Senior Card, and appointed the state's first minister for the status of women. And I should pause here to say that uh, Senator Maurice Pine, uh, who uh, had a very close and warm relationship uh, with uh, John Fay, and who is uh, overseas on uh, official ministerial business, has asked me to uh, mention uh, uh, her um, uh, deep regard and, and her um, association with the remarks that I'm making on behalf of the government. John played a key role in S Sydney's successful bid to host the 2000 Olympic Games, a huge victory uh, for the state and our nation. John had the privilege of being in Monaco in September 1993 when Sydney was announced as the winning bid by the International Olympic Committee president at the time, Juan Antonio Samaranch. The vision of him leaping to his feet and joyously embracing bid boss uh, Rod McGeoch uh, is um, one of the famous moments uh, in our nation's history and one John will always be remembered for. John will also be remembered for his brave actions on Australia Day 1994 when he helped tackle a student who fired two rounds from a starting a pistol in the direction of Prince Charles, who was about to deliver a speech. Vision of the then Premier jumping to the defence of the visiting Prince of Wales was shown all around the world. He, like others there that day, had no idea if a real gun was involved when he, was, when he made the instant decision to act. It was pointed out at the time that some of his old rugby league skills had been on display I believe the biggest thing on display that day was his uh, character and his courage. A year later, the Fay government would lose the 1995 state election, despite winning 51.2% of the two-party preferred vote, statewide vote. While this was a hard time for the party, John was looking ahead, and in 1996 uh, he resigned from the New South Wales Parliament to contest the federal election as the Liberal candidate for MacArthur. John was successful, winning the seat from Labour, as were the Liberals, with John Howard leading the party to victory. He was appointed as Minister for Finance in the first Howard Ministry, a position he would hold until his retirement in 2001. At John's state funeral last month, Mr Howard said he had no hesitation in appointing John Minister for Finance. As uh, Mr Howard said, how could you pass over somebody who had been the Premier of the largest state in the Commonwealth for a, senior, for a senior portfolio? And John relished the task. Uh, Mr Howard said that as Finance Minister, John fixed a steady guise on any minister that had big spending pretensions. John is Australia's third longest um, fina serving Finance Minister and in that role accomplished a number of significant reforms and achievements uh, you know, in that portfolio. He initiated and pursued a number of asset sales, big and small, including the initial partial sale of Telstra and the sale of Sydney and Canberra airports. Considered the greatest sale in Australian history, the sale of the first third of Telstra uh, raised $14 billion. John also presided over the sale of the second 
um, third of Telstra, which raised over $6 billion. Australians benefited tremendously from the improved services those sales facilitated and from the proceeds of those sales, which were reinvested for future generations. In 2000, John played an important role in the federal government's acquisition of the remaining 51.55% equity in the Australian Submarine Corporation. Today, the ISC plays a crucial role as part of our naval shipbuilding uh, uh, repair and maintenance uh, industry. ISC's turnaround in performance in relation to submarine sustainment demonstrates the significant progress this business has made in both experience and capability. In partnership with Peter Costello as Treasurer, they introduced the Chart of Budget Honesty, a key recommendation that arose from the 1996 National Commission of Audit. The Charter introduced a number of innovations to fiscal reporting and strategy, creating more transparency in the Commonwealth budget process. They also delivered the first accrual-based budget in May 1999, which represented a major development in public sector financial management and reporting. The adoption of accrual reporting facilitated better planning, management and decision-making, as well as providing a means with which to assess fin financial resilience. One of the things John was most proud of during his time as Minister for Finance was the fiscal discipline of the Howard government. Fay and Costello, a formidable team, set out to reset and rebuild the federal budget, setting the foundations for what would be a run of four consecutive budget surpluses. The forward trajectory of the budget setting secured under his stewardship as Minister for Finance ultimately led to paying off all government net debt and building a positive net asset position for the Commonwealth within five years. Budget repair is never easy and John was central to returning sound, disciplined economic and fiscal management to Australia for the benefit of all Australians. In announcing his retirement, John said, and I'm quoting him, the simple fact of the matter is that the fiscal responsibility of recent time has without the slightest doubt given Australia a far better future than it could ever have hoped to have. And he was correct. When the Howard government left office in 2007, the strong fiscal management undertaken by John and his successor in the portfolio, uh, our good friend and valued former colleague uh, Nick Minchin, stood Australia in very good stead when we faced the global economic headwinds in the context of the global financial crisis. In 2001, after battling ill health, John made the decision to retire from politics. His battle with lung, with lung cancer and near miss with death didn't halt his work ethic and his commitment to the people of Australia. During his valedictory speech, he acknowledged that, these were, that there were many things still that he wanted to do. He wanted to continue giving to the community and he intended to continue working. He reflected that few have the opportunity to choose when they leave Parliament. More often than not, it is decided by the public or our own parties, and he was lucky to have that choice. Upon his retirement from uh, political life, he served as the chairman of the Bradman Foundation, director of the Royal Flying Doctor Service, as chairman of the Rugby League Development Board, and chancellor of the Australian Catholic University, and fittingly, given his history, uh, chairman of the Sydney Olympic Park Authority and chairman of the World Anti-Doping Agency. John was a devout Catholic and a man of uh, strong faith. He originally wanted to be a bishop, but a year at a seminary in Springwood uh, in his youth was enough to persuade him that priesthood was perhaps not uh, his future. A decision many of us are grateful that he made. In late 2019, John was awarded the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Gregory the Great for his contribution to the Catholic Church. Since the news of his passing, tributes have flooded in for John and his family. Many have reflected on his life and on his achievements. He was a mentor to many, including many of my colleagues. Upon resuming the responsibilities for the finance portfolio back in 2013, on assuming the responsibilities, I should say, for the finance portfolio back in 2013, I was very grateful to John for his generous and wise counsel. He was a kind and generous individual. He gave more than he received. He was authentic and someone you could always rely on. In his final speech to Parliament, he made sure to thank everyone in this place, from his personal staff and colleagues 
to the house attendants, uh, caterers and gardeners, uh, who he thanked for creating a, a place of joy and comfort. That summed up the kind of a man John was. As the Prime Minister stated, John was not your typical liberal, a Catholic, rugby league player and smoker from southwest Sydney. But the Liberal Party is a broad church, something we pride ourselves on. And John broadened our outlook and made our party all the better for it. To John's wife, Colleen, and his surviving children, Melanie and Matthew, and his grandchildren, Amber and Campbell, on behalf of the Australian Government and the Senate, uh, I offer our deepest condolences. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to acknowledge the passing of the former New South Wales Premier and Federal Finance Minister John Joseph Fay. He passed away on the 12th of September at the age of 75. John Fay served his state and his country. He served this parliament and the parliament of New South Wales. And like many good people who have graced this place, John's life started across the ditch. He was born in Wellington, New Zealand on 10 January 1945 before migrating to Picton, New South Wales in 1956. He married his wife, Colleen Marie McGowan, on, in 1968. They had two daughters and one son, and importantly, John became an Australian citizen in 1973. If public life didn't end up calling John's name, he had the beginnings of another career in rugby league. Out of all people to introduce John to rugby league, it was an Irish Catholic nun. Don't worry, John himself described that situation as bizarre. When he was 11, John was coached by Sister Kevin at St. Anthony's Convent in Picton. And was, she was in charge of selecting a team to play against St. Paul's Convent, Camden. John reflected in 2010. Here was an Irish nun in full religious habit, trying to teach a group of boys the fundamentals of league, such as playing the ball in six-man scrums on the concrete playground between the church and the school. It was a blessed relief when one of the team's fathers agreed to take over as coach. He reverted to rugby union at the age of 13, the national religion of his native New Zealand, during his five years boarding at Chevalier College in Barrel. Despite this dalliance with rugby union, he said he learnt more about league than union at this time thanks to his portable radio. The winter months at home from boarding school were spent with, quote, nothing but football talk in the house and drying football gear hanging on the verandas. I think John knew the toll football would take on his body in his early years. He said, football grounds were not watered as they are today. Most grounds had a concrete cricket pitch with a shallow covering of soil that became rock hard. To keep the skin on our knees, we coated them with petroleum jelly. We would slip foam pads into the sides of our shorts to protect our hips. Is it any wonder my generation turned orthopedic surgeons into wealthy men? After years of playing junior league, in 1964, John played senior rugby league as a centre with the Camden Rams in the New South Wales Country Rugby League Group 6 first grade competition. He had just begun work as a law clerk in Bankstown for the wage of six pounds a week, but winning a game of footy paid five pounds. The next year, he was graded for Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs and paid, pl played 37 lower grade matches. It took a failed law exam in 1966 for John to realize he was likely to be a lawyer longer than a footballer. And although he might have stopped playing league, it didn't stop his love or passion for the game. He still coached and became the joint patron of the Bulldogs in 1993 until his passing. As Premier, John canceled the Newcastle Knights' $3 million debt over the development of their stadium. As he pointed out, Parramatta and the eastern suburbs got their stadiums for nothing. Why did Newcastle have to pay for theirs? I might add, John wasn't the last Premier of New South Wales to provide funding for a uh, New South Wales rugby league team. As Premier, and much to the dis dismay of his Liberal colleagues at the time, he helped develop Wynn Stadium in the Labour stronghold of Wollongong before helping fund Gosford Stadium once he became Federal Finance Minister. John's justification was simple. He said, 
Communities revolve around common interests and pride in their achievements. They need to believe they are as good as any other part of our country. Communities, not governments of any particular persuasion, make Australia the great nation that it is. Now, John was first elected in 1984. He became the New South Wales Minister for Industrial Relations by 1988 and then Premier in 1992, taking over from Nick Greiner. His achievements include the introduction of the Disability Services Act, the New South Wales Seniors Card, and appointing the first New South Wales Minister for the Status of Women. John managed the devastating 1993-94 bushfire season, which saw Sydney surrounded and over 70,000 hectares burnt. He might have lost the 1995 election to Bob Carr, but Bob admits that John was a formidable opponent and that, quote, public service more than public combat motivated him. John was a small L liberal, a true liberal, some might say. After his state election defeat, he went on and won the federal seat in MacArthur in 1996 and became the finance minister under John Howard until 2001. John Fay was a larger-than-life personality with equally large achievements. There were also successes there that Australians got to share. Monumental in securing the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games, it's bittersweet that John passed away just before its 20th anniversary. After Sydney won the bid on 24 September 1993, he said, We deserved this one. We got it, and now we're going to put on a fantastic Games. I remember jumping probably higher than I've ever jumped in my life before. The TV cameras and Australians don't forget John's jumping either. At his funeral service last week, which I was fortunate enough to attend on behalf of the Federal Australian Labor Party, Prince Charles, via letter, recounted John's efforts to save him from an armed protester on Australia Day in 1994. Prince Charles shared, Coming to my assistance, as he so valiantly did on that Darling Harbour stage on Australia Day 1994, John demonstrated not only characteristic selflessness and valour, but also the hallmark athleticism of a former rugby league player. I was as fortunate to have him on my side that day as the people of New South Wales were to have him on theirs. Lovely words from Prince Charles. However, in fact, this particular event and the Holy Cross College ride linked John Fay and me, John Fay and me, in an odd way that most people would not know. That is, through two individuals who were enrolled in Holy Cross College Ride in the class of 1988. One of those is Ben Keneally, my husband. And the very next person to him on the official college enrollment book is the person famously tackled by John Fay that day in January 1994. Of course, it's not just John and me who are former New South Wales Premiers with ties to Holy Cross College Ride. The school also helped produce another New South Wales Premier, Labor's Jack Renshaw, who was Premier from 1964 to 1965. But back to John Fay. He was one of the first senior Liberals to support an Australian Republic, a cause that has now united so many across this chamber as well as in the other place. After having a lung removed due to cancer in 2001, John announced he was retiring from politics. But that didn't stop his life of service. He went on to become the second president of the World Anti-Doping Agency from 2007 to 2013. He was chancellor of the Australian Catholic University from 2014 until his death last month. John's Catholic faith sustained him. He carried his soldier's rosary beads with him, reaching into his right pocket during difficult conversations or trying situations. I'm sure his faith gave him solace following the tragic loss of his daughter Tiffany on Boxing Day 2006, when she was killed in a road accident. And he and Colleen took on the unimaginably sad, but nonetheless, I'm sure, rewarding duty to raise his daughter's children as their own. Last year, Pope Francis made John a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Gregory the Great. Not a bad title for a smoking, drinking, rugby league playing politician a title which John accepted humbly, saying it made him feel terribly unworthy. While John might have felt unworthy, he was worthy, and it is worthy of the fitting tributes that he has received. The tributes here, in the other place, in the media, and from the public. No one can say how John might have reacted to such tributes, 
but we know how he felt about his life of service. Last year he said, to have been given the opportunities that I have been given, I count myself extraordinarily blessed. I will say that New South Wales, our Parliament and our country have been blessed to have been served by John Fay. My heartfelt condolences go to John's wife Colleen, to his children and his grandchildren. And in expressing these words of condolence, I also add the condolences of the former New South Wales Premiers, Bob Carr and Barry Unsworth, who both spoke fondly and respectfully of John's service to New South Wales and our country. On behalf of the Federal Labor Opposition, I say John Fay, may he rest in peace. Senator uh, Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Today I pay my respects to the Honourable John Fay AC. He was a good man and a great, authentic Australian. John was a selfless servant to the people of New South Wales and also to Australia over his two decades in the New South Wales and also the federal parliaments. Rightfully, there has been much focus on John Fay's many achievements, both as Premier and also as Federal Finance Minister, but also as the man that he was. John reluctantly took the reins of the Lib Liberal leadership in New South Wales, describing the moment as one of his saddest days because of the circumstances uh, under which the, he took over the leadership. But despite this, true to form and true to nature, he rolled up his sleeves and he got on with the job of leading and reforming not only his party but his beloved state. He delivered major policy initiatives such as the introduction of the Disability Services Act, the introduction of the New South Wales Seniors Card, the appointment of the first New South Wales Minister for the Status of Women and the overhaul of the New South Wales Industrial Relations System. And as has been said by previous speakers, he famously leapt for joy when it was announced that his tireless advocacy and that of his team for Sydney to host the 2000 Summer Olympics was successful. And for those of us old enough to remember, we will never ever forget his spontaneous and unbridled joy. He courageously and selflessly put himself in harm's way to protect Prince Charles from an attack on Australia Day in 1994. He helped the people of New South Wales rebuild after the devastating 1994 bushfires that went straight into the heart of Sydney. After the closest of electoral defeats in 1995s, he rolled up his sleeves, shook himself up, and he entered the federal parliament as the member for MacArthur at the 1996 federal election, which was when I first met him. As federal minister for finance, John was instrumental in rebuilding the federal budget to a position of strength for which all of us in this nation still owe him a great debt of gratitude. I'd also like to mention one of John's unsung achievements, one of many, but that was his advocacy and mentorship for young men and women, but particularly for women in the Liberal Party. And my friend and my very good friend and colleague, Senator Maurice Payne, who unfortunately was not able to be here today because of official overseas business, has very fondly recounted to me the support John so generously extended to her throughout her career in the party. John supported Maurice throughout her political career, all the way back to when she was a young staffer in the Griner Fay government of the late 80s and the early 1990s. Maurice remarked in her poignant and her most heartfelt eulogy at John's funeral that, as part of his team, you worked with him, not for him. She described John as always available and always supportive. And this says so much about his leadership style and his contributions. He valued individuals and also their contributions, and he didn't harbour prejudices. And that is what made him such a wonderful role model for many generations, well, several generations at least now, of Liberals. And I know that he played a role mentoring many other Liberal women, including Senator Ferravanti Wells uh, and the New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian, amongst many others. And while I didn't have the opportunity personally to get to know him well, I am so thankful for all he did to chart the path for strong female representation in this party at all levels. He did not do this in the pursuit of tokenism, 
but in recognition of the need for, or for our parliamentary chambers right across our nation to be more representative of all Australians. In recognition of the need for the best representatives, be they male or female. And in the words of Prime Minister, in the words of the Prime Minister today, he was a tremendous Liberal. We honour John Fay's leadership, his service, and indeed his entire life. To John's wife Colleen, his two children, his grandchildren, I offer my heartfelt condolences. And to John, we give you our thanks for a life so well and authentically lived. Thank you. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. Others have rightly spoken fondly of uh, the Honourable John Fay AC and his service to our nation and that which is on the public record. I just want to add a few brief comments and observe that it was my privilege to be the then Honourable John Fay's junior minister for about 10 months when he was finance minister and I first became a junior minister, a special minister of state. John's politics were motivated by a genuine desire to serve his community, which he did so exceptionally well. He was willing to mentor, advise and share his expertise and wealth of anecdotes, and that was indicative of his generosity of spirit, which he so kindly extended uh, towards myself as a minister seeking to find his feet. M M minister Fay was personable, genuine and humble. You couldn't help but like him. I did. I also recall the day that he gave me the shocking news that he was taking leave for quote unquote exploratory surgery that uh, then gave me that meaningful look, indicating that things were pretty tough. On his return, he was very uh, matter-of-fact about the statistical uh, challenge that he was up against, having uh, such uh, extensive lung cancer. Suffice to say, in his typical spirit, he uh, overcame it. Uh, beyond his own belief and uh, his own uh, predictions to me and uh, continue to serve the Australian people and indeed the world community in the sporting arena uh, in a manner that was indicative of the way that he served the people of New South Wales and the state parliament and the people of Australia in the federal parliament. So, uh, Mr President, can I just simply say that uh, I was the beneficiary of uh, John Fay's mentorship and his generosity of spirit, and whilst it was for only 10 months that I served as his junior minister, I was uh, greatly benefited by that. I'm indebted to him and extend my condolences to his widow Colleen and his family and thank them for lending him to the service of our nation. Senator Fairavanti Wells. To speak on the condolence motion for John Fay. I had the honour and privilege of working for John as his senior private secretary from 1993 to 1994. Prior to the 1993 federal election, I had been working for Jim Carlton. When we lost the election, I received a phone call from Robert Maher, who was chief of staff to John Fay, and he asked me if I would consider taking on the position of senior private secretary. I knew John Fay's former uh, senior private secretary, David Piggott, who had worked for John Howard uh, in the past. And it was a wonderful opportunity, and I certainly accepted the job. My role as senior private secretary was to look after the administration of the office, including the extensive paper flow, as well as the diaries of both John Fay and his wife, Colleen, working with me. I had a team of people, which included Barb Williams, who had been formerly John Howard's private secretary, and two New South Wales Party stalwarts, Liz Storey and Robin Kerr. John loved to talk to people. He liked to have a drink. He liked to smoke. So, of course, that meant that often the diary, notwithstanding best intentions, ended up being somewhat chaotic 
because appointments inevitably ran over and things had to be changed. They had to be rescheduled. Nevertheless, people who needed to see him always got the opportunity to have a chat with him. John can be well described as a consistent uh, smoker. Health-wise, ultimately, he paid a heavy price for that, although he did very well after his lung operation. At that time, the Premier's office was located on level eight of the old state office block on the corner of Macquarie and Bent Streets. Now, of course, it doesn't exist anymore, but at that time, uh, we had old-fashioned air conditioners which ran along the walls between the rooms. Now, the heavy smoking uh, from the Premier's office meant that everyone shared in the effect. Given my office was directly next to the Premier's office, I inevitably had more than my share of the smoking experience, such that I had to often resort to opening my window onto Macquarie Street. Yes, those were the days when you could actually open the windows in offices. Much has been said of John's actions at Darling Harbour on Australia Day in 1994 when he leapt to disarm a protester who threatened Prince Charles. My husband John and I were sitting in one of the front rows when this incident happened. It came as no surprise that John Fay just didn't think twice. He reacted quickly and in true rugby style tackled the fellow to the floor of the stage. It all happened so quickly, but it was just so typical of John to put the safety of others above his own safety and to take the actions that he did on that day. And it was really good to see Prince Charles sending his message uh, at, the, uh, at the funeral service. John was not a man to indulge in spin. He was quiet spoken, measured and honest in his responses. John's natural exuberance when Sydney was named to host the Olympic Games for 2000 was just typical of, of him. I know that at the time he worked very closely with others on the bid. It was tough going up against Beijing. On merit, we knew we should win, but Beijing's aggressive campaign exerted heavy pressure in many different ways. I remember the morning of the announcement. About three or four of us were sitting in the office at 4.15 a.m. watching the television, fully expecting that we weren't going to win. Then, of course, we did win, and the rest is history. As his senior private secretary, my job was to control the paper flow, and believe me, there was a lot of paper. When I started the job, the thing I found most frustrating was when John would go out and people would speak to him and say, look, I wrote to you X months ago and I haven't received a reply. So this called for drastic action. I instigated the establishment of a document tracing system, much to the chagrin of the bureaucrats in the Premier's department. John and I were very similar in, in, a, number of, in a number of ways, both from poor working class backgrounds both having started as article clerks and both having worked very hard to become lawyers. John's attention to detail was something that he and I very much shared. Part of my job was to read all the files and the correspondence before uh, they went into the Premier for consideration. I made sure that prominent details were flagged, omissions or problems highlighted, knowing that John would also read the entire file sharing those concerns and taking the appropriate action. Clearly, this didn't endear me to the public servants, but then that wasn't something that I was worried about too much. John had a strong work ethic, which I saw and experienced firsthand. John and Colleen had an apartment on level nine of the state office block. John would regularly go upstairs at the end of the day, have something to eat, and then come back to the office and work late into the night to ensure that the paperwork and the briefs were done. I sometimes work, worked alongside in the evenings. Let's not forget that this was a difficult time in New South Wales politics. It was minority government relying on three independents to support or reject the government's plans. 
John kept on top of so many issues. He needed to, given the complexities of minority existence. Yes, there were always the cigarettes, and yes, there was always a cup of coffee. Occasionally there was a whisky, but he certainly ploughed through the paperwork. Being of the Catholic faith, uh, I was disappointed that I was not afforded the opportunity to farewell John in person. Nevertheless, I would like to place on record my farewells and my admiration for John as a decent, hard-working man of family and faith. I was grateful to John for having afforded me the opportunity to work in his office. It was a very good experience. I valued both his friendship and his guidance. Can I conclude by once again offering my condolences to his wife, Colleen, his children, Matthew and Melanie, and his grandchildren, Amber and Campbell, who, along with many people, ordinary Australians, will remember John Fay as an honest and decent man who so admirably served his state and his country. John was a decent, hard-working human being. He lived his life true to his faith, true to his family, and true to his values. Vale John Fay. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to say a few words as a mark of respect for the life and contribution of John Fay. I don't think it could be done much better than Senator Fiera Vanty Wells has just done and my colleagues like her. As a Premier, as a Finance Minister, as a courageous man prepared to rescue the Prince of Wales from apparent assassination attempts, um, as a football player, as a community man, as a husband, as a father, he was a special character. And yet John and I didn't know each other well other than to say that I was a teenager when he was my local member. And so in many ways, as I was coming to understand politics, he was the local example I had of how to do it. And he set that example pretty well, I thought. To begin with, I didn't know much about him, other than that he was elected to federal parliament as a part of the Howard government in 1996, a government that I was observing with interest despite being aged just 14 at the time. He'd moved into federal politics, of course, after his substantial contribution to the state parliament. My most memorable brush with John was when, as a senior high school student, I was one of the kids selected to attend the school's constitutional convention, an opportunity that sparked an interest in our constitution that no doubt has played a part in me being a rather embarrassing law nerd to this day. Um, we all travelled to Canberra and there was a reception function where every attendee was matched up with their local member and for as best as I could recall there were relatively few people, about 20 kids from across the state and certainly no more than one per electorate. And so every student had their local member attend and chat about what they were learning about our country, about its institutions and about our constitution. And it was a lovely opportunity. Everyone's local MP showed up except mine. And I didn't understand why. Was there something urgent that had come up? He had a pretty big responsibility, so that would be understandable. Had I done something wrong? It was odd being the only kid on her own. I left a little bewildered about that, but nevertheless thrilled to be a part of this experience and left with a passion for constitutional law that I confess still hasn't gone away. The mystery of my local member's non-attendance wasn't solved until many, many years later. My dad spilled the beans to me about a decade ago. With his usual courtesy and beautiful manners, John had called my home, presumably to give a pat on the back for being selected and to let me know that we'd see one another at the reception in Canberra. My dad, who ran his plumbing business from home, and was under a lot of stress between managing apprentices and tradesmen and builders, wasn't coping all that well at the time. 
He answered the phone with what I will say is a colourful bunch of expletives. It was rough as guts, though, on reflection, as a, an accomplished footy player. Perhaps John was well placed to handle that. <laughs> but it wasn't uncommon in the construction industry at the time. When John introduced himself, again with his usual politeness, my father's reaction didn't improve. And shortly after, with another mouthful of swear words, my dad hung up on poor John. And when I found out this story, I learned why my dad hadn't told me <laughs> about that at the time. I would have been absolutely mortified. And um, though, when I think about it now, given the constituency he served, the jobs they did, the interests they had, and let's face it, the shared love of footy and a drink that both my dad and John had, um, I suspect had they met in different circumstances, they might have got along rather well. Now, no one has sympathy for politicians, of course, but it should be said that no poly deserves to be treated that way. It's little wonder he didn't show up to say hello. I can only imagine what he thought he was going to meet when he arrived. At times, when an irate constituent doesn't answer the phone with the courtesy that I extend to others, my mind flicks back to that story. And it's a reminder that we never know the challenges that the person on the other end of the line is dealing with, how hard they are or how much they're struggling to cope. It's a reminder that some people, dare I say it, particularly some of the toughest looking blokes, still struggle to ask for help. And the bad behaviour, as unacceptable as it is, can be a cry for help. But I've digressed somewhat. John will be remembered for his love of sport and the sheer joy he radiated as he jumped at the news that Sydney had been selected to host the 2000 Olympic Games. I think that's the image that will always be publicly associated with him, burned into our national memory. He'll be remembered for his love of his country and for the important work he did to put this country on a stable financial footing. But I hope he will be remembered for even more than that. He was a devout Christian, and in contrast to so many politicians whose convictions wilt in roles like this, he remained firmly but respectfully pro-life. The measure of the man is how he rose to life's difficulties. After the loss of his daughter Tiffany when she was just 27, he and his wife Colleen became guardians to and raised her children, Campbell and Amber. He battled cancer more than once but he continued to serve his community well after his parliamentary service was over. He made the community in which I grew up better, a place where a plumber like my dad could prosper, despite his occasional potty mouth, and where a girl like me could aspire to make a contribution beyond herself. And for that, I'm grateful. I hope he'll be remembered as a faithful servant, a good husband, and a caring father. May God rest his soul and comfort his family. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to add my remarks and my high regard uh, for John Fay to those sentiments already echoed and made by so many colleagues. Now, John Fay was indeed a great Australian, a great contributor, and a man who left an enormous imprint uh, on the public life and on the public psyche. It is a testament to his style, character and authenticity that Australians, particularly New South Welshmen, remembered him so fondly, so nicely, so thoughtfully following his passing recently. It is also a case that Liberals across the country remembered him as a man of conviction, of values, but also very much of a common touch. I acknowledge his many accomplishments, all of which have been and many of which have been reflected in this chamber today. I wished only to say a few words, but I did want also to add some remarks of others. I reached out to some of John's former colleagues, former parliamentary colleagues in this place, uh, to seek their reflections uh, of the man that they served alongside 
uh, in the parliament and in the cabinet. Former leader of the government in this place, Robert Hill, who served in the cabinet with John Fay, reflected on John as the finance minister, noting that he had the nicest way of saying no when Robert was looking for money, described him as always the gentleman and, as many have, as very much the values-driven politician. Christopher Pine, unsurprisingly, uh, went to John's charm and capability, but described him as being unaffected by that charm and capability that had led him to hold great power in his hands at both the state and national level. Even more unsurprising, Christopher reflected, reflected on John's Irish Catholic background, noting that he maintained that earthiness that comes from so many Irish Australians, humility and insight that endeared him to colleagues. He also acknowledged that John was someone who you could rely on in a political contest, that he didn't run from a fight, but nor was he someone who initiated them. He never abandoned his friends. Amanda Vanstone, who also served in the cabinet and the ministry alongside John Fay, recalled, as many have, his health battles. She recorded in uh, true Amanda Vanstone style the story after John's first lung surgery, where the doctors told him that they hadn't taken much out because it looked so grim. He asked, according to Amanda, if they were effing joking. He said that he hadn't come to surgery to not take every chance possible to give him the best chance of success and that he wanted to go back into surgery as soon as possible and for them to take as much as was necessary to be able to live a long life ahead. And indeed that is what happened, that they went back in, he had further surgery, they took the rest of that lung, but of course that gave him the chance to go on and serve many good years, as we've heard as chair of WADA, to make an enormous contribution but most importantly to John to be able to spend valuable time with his family, his many loved ones and his friends. Amanda described him as a great guy of great courage. Of those many great friends and indeed loved ones is our own colleague Senator Payne who is unable to be here. And I know that Senator Reynolds has already reflected on Maurice's close friendship with John, Colleen and their family. Maurice is deeply disappointed not to be able to contribute to this debate uh, due to her overseas responsibilities at this time. She did have the chance to speak at John's funeral and the Prime Minister has reflected uh, on just how beautifully Maurice spoke of John's memory, of his life and his love, and indeed very much the fact that he was a mentor to so many to young people like Senator Payne and the former Treasurer Joe Hockey and the contribution he provided in terms of kick-starting their careers, but not just through their early stages, right throughout their lives with wise counsel, advice and, above all, the loyalty and friendship that John was so renowned for. Maurice also wanted me to remind the Chamber that John Fay was, like Maurice, a great Republican. Mr President, John Fay leaves a remarkable imprint uh, on this country, particularly on the state of New South Wales. His contribution uh, to our life and to the memory of events like the Sydney Olympics is something that will endure in many. Uh, I too convey my sympathies to his family and our thanks for all that they did and gave in sharing him with the grateful nation. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. And I rise to make some brief remarks uh, in addition to the very uh, generous words that have already been offered this afternoon about John Fay. Uh, like many people who have come to New South Wales and to Sydney, uh, John Fay did not come from Sydney or from New South Wales, uh, which again shows that this is a fantastic part of the world where anyone can make it. Uh, ultimately, John Fay went on to lead the state and served with distinction here in Canberra. 
Uh, I have many personal, close personal friends that have been very good to me over the years, people like John Brogdon and, and people like Peter Seaton, who I spoke to uh, in preparation for these remarks. And the summary really is that John Fay was a believer in hard work, but it, that he had a very big heart and a very soft heart. Uh, everyone has remarked, I think, very eloquently about his contribution to the state of New South Wales. Certainly the, uh, the, the, the securing of the Olympics was a, a great thing for our country, and anyone who attended the Sydney Olympics would recall that. I attended it as a young man from, uh, from Shepparton, and that was like going to Hollywood. Uh, but I think that, that has had a great and enduring uh, contribution to the state of New South Wales. The, the other thing I would like to say, uh, Mr President, was that uh, John Fay, uh, uh, people who knew him well, people like John Brogdon, would often say that the man had a photographic memory, that he would remember exactly what was in every page of every brief, and that he would, uh, he would pull people up for not actually knowing all the detail of the brief that they had had some role in pulling together, uh, which is a remarkable, remarkable thing um, to, to be able to do, but was necessary in the role uh, that uh, John Fay uh, performed with Peter Costello and John Howard in uh, delivering a very important uh, passage of fiscal consolidation in the, in the 1990s, where every single line item in every single budget uh, needed to be uh, known, and as Senator Cormann has done in our own time, uh, the detail is where you win these arguments, and the detail is where you can uh, actually make some really important uh, fiscal improvements. So, uh, I, I did want to just briefly read this great quote from uh, John Brogdon and some other New South Wales uh, colleagues uh, that they published recently in the Sydney Morning Herald, and I thought that uh, this is about the nicest thing I've ever read about anyone in politics. And this is about uh, Mr. Fay. He inspired loyalty and his patience, kindness and, above all, his willingness uh, to, sorry, uh, to chat with everyone created an army of people willing to go the extra mile. More than one staff member despaired of his schedule as he genuinely derailed meetings with questions about rugby, family and life in general. It was a mark of the man that his interest was as deep and genuine in the humblest worker as in the most senior person in the room. Uh, that is a very generous quote. And uh, of course, post politics, uh, John Fay went on to uh, play a very important role in his own family, but also to lead the Australian Catholic University. And uh, I can see there's a man of uh, deep faith. He was also uh, very committed to pluralism and the ACU's work, uh, especially in Indigenous affairs, uh, has gone well, you know, well beyond their direct mandate. So he was a great contributor and obviously a very good man, a warm man, and uh, may he rest, rest in peace. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. We now return to the order of business and I'll call the clerk to call on petitions. The petition has been lodged uh, by Senator McCarthy from 3,759 petitioners. Details are available on the dynamic red and the terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. We have dealt with notices of motion, so I'll now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? It, um, oh, the clerk. Employment notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice of Motion 819 for today to the 8th of October. Business of the Senate number 1 for the 8th of October to the 10th of November. General Business 817 for today to the 8th of October. Business of the Senate number 2 for the 8th of October to the 12th of November. General Business 818 for today to the 9th of November. And Business of the Senate number 4 for today to the 9th of November. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senator Seward. When you're saying business of the Senate, could you tell us those numbers again, please? So I think it was business of the Senate tomorrow, wasn't it? 
was that, no, was it today? Could you just, the could you just say that again, please? Sorry, I beg your pardon. For tomorrow, business of the Senate number two for tomorrow, and business of the Senate number four for today to the 9th of November. Business of the Senate number four for today. Okay, that is one I didn't have. Thank you. We're de still dealing with two and three today, um, and number one will be debated, I understand. But two and three we'll be dealing with here. Four has been postponed. So I'll deal with motions in the most conducive order if people are happy. I Sen oh, see Senator Urquhart. Sorry, Mr. President, I have a motion relating to leave of absence. So I might granted? have missed the spot. No, I'm no. sorry. Leave is granted. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Pratt for today, Wednesday, the 7th of October, 2020, for personal reasons. Thank you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and commence with government business number one. Senator Dunningham. Uh, government business. Notice of motion number one relating to the reference of time critical bills to legislation committees be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator uh, Dunningham, government business number two. I ask that uh, government business notice of motion number two proposing the refer uh, reference of public works to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works be taken <coughs> as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion and I table a statement in relation to work uh, together with accompanying documentation. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I move to number 785 in the name of Senator Brown? You may have that, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator O'Neill will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 785 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. Move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I jump to number 803, Senators Smith and Dunningham? Thank you very much, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 803 relating to Rotary Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion standing in my name and in the name of Senator Dunningham and add the names of Senators Abetz, Askew, Hughes and O'Neill, McLaughlin and Urquhart. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to number 805, Senator Askew? I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 805 before asking that I be taken as formal. Is leave granted to amend the motion? Leave is granted. Senator Askew. I amend the motion in terms circulated and ask that it be taken as formal and also note that Senator Keneally will be added to the so noted. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Askew. I move the motion. Oh, sorry, me. Senator Waters. I'd like to uh, draw the attention uh, to oh, Senator, Senator Rice, Rice, who would like to, Thank you. to seek leave to make a short statement. Okay, on this what motion. I'll do is I'll let Senator Askew move the motion and then I'll call for statement. Senator Askew. So I move the motion. Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, yes. Look, the Greens will be supportive. I assume you're seeking leave, leave, leave to make, to make a, short a short statement, statement. Senator Rice. Leave is granted for one minute. Go. Thank you. The Greens will be supporting this motion, but note that if the Greens had moved a motion on Myanmar, it would have been ruled. Um, we would not have been given leave for it, it was, as it would have been ruled to be a, an issue of complex foreign policy. It's rather hypocratic. However, look, the Rohingya people in both Myanmar and Bangladesh face extraordinary challenges in these difficult times. Their own government has attacked them and they face additional challenges in this pandemic, as are outlined in this motion. At the 2019, 11, the 2019 election, the Greens called for an extra 50,000 humanitarian places a year. And instead, in last night's budgets, the budget, the Liberal governments are planning to cut the humanitarian intake by $5,000. We need to do a lot more in our region, not less. We should be reaching 0.7 per cent of gross national product by 2030, but our aid is at its lowest level ever. Order, Senator Rice. Uh, the question is the motion moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, number 808. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 808 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. A select committee was established yesterday with the support of this place to inquire into tobacco reduction strategies, including the use of e-cigarettes and vaping products. Uh, that committee will report back before year's end, and it's important that we don't preempt that work. The TGA has recently announced an interim decision that, if made final, would clarify the regulation of e-cigarettes containing nicotine and nicotine fluids for vaping. The proposed changes would mean that certain nicotine-containing uh, products could only be supplied with a doctor's prescription. TGA decisions are made independently based on expert medical advice, so we do not accept the premise of the motion that the government has the power to weaken laws surrounding vaping and nicotine e-liquids. The question is that motion number 808 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I jump to 810 in the name of Senator Ayres? Oh, yes, Senator Ayres. Mr. President, I ask the general business notice of motion number 810 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection? There being none, Senator Ayres. Uh, I move the motion. The question is that Senator Davey. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, the federal government supports the state environmental planning policy as revised by the New South Wales state government. The revisions that were negotiated in cabinet in coalition cabinet provide for the protection of vulnerable and threatened New South Wales koala populations while ensuring there is not onerous green tape for our farmers. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Well, what a debacle we've seen uh, in New South Wales over the last few weeks in relation to this issue. And I understand that uh, Senator Ayres is uh, pointing out uh, just what an absolute mess the New South Wales government has been in over this. But let's be very clear: the National Party have no intent on protecting the environment, saving the koala, or doing anything to protect wildlife. They almost split the New South Wales government apart because they wanted the right to kill koalas. This is the legacy and the attitude of the National Party, whether it's John Barillaro or Barnaby Joyce or those here in this place. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Ayres be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I move to 815 in the name of Senators Keneally and others? Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senators Rice, Mullen, Waters, Lambie and Askew will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 815 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 817 in the name of Senator Pratt? I do not have. Oh, eight. sorry, has 817 been postponed? It has? Okay, that's one I didn't catch earlier. Thank you for your guidance. We'll now go to business of the Senate number three in the name of Senator Seward. Senator Seward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate number three. Um, relating to the assets test be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Quest Senator McAllister. I leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor will not be supporting this motion. Our priority is to see the government permanently increase the base rate for JobSeeker and to see the liquid assets waiting period remain suspended because those changes are targeted to the people who need help the most at this time. When the government decided to stop the asset test, not just temporarily increase it, they allowed over 3,000 people with assets of $1 million or more, in addition to their home, to receive unemployment payments. Support should go to those who need it the most. question is, Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, the government does not support the disallowance motion. Means testing is a long-standing fundamental component of the, um, of the uh, sorry, component of the income uh, support system, um, and means testing uh, is a fundamental component of the income support system. And the reintroduction of the assets test is an appropriate step in providing targeted support. 
question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt, business of the Senate number three, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Could I go to motion number 800, Senator McKim? Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 800 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 800 in the name of Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt, tell her for the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell her for the noes.
result of the division is eyes 6, nose 26. The matter is resolved in the negative. Can we now move to matter number 806 in the name of Senator Faruqi? And I ask senators to remain in the chamber for likely imminent divisions. Senator Faruqi. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 806 be taken as a formal Is motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy, and our comprehensive plan places oh, gas central to our recovery. Gas is a critical enabler and it supports our manufacturing sector, which employs over 850,000 Australians. It's an essential input in the production of plastics for PPE and fertiliser for food production. Gas provides the firm electricity generation that we need to balance the record levels of solar and wind. It provides flexible, reliable and affordable generation. Far from competing with renewables, it complements them. And through our 2020 budget, we'll ensure that Australian gas is working for all Australians. Senator Roberts. Your statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. We will not be supporting this. It's now day 398 since I first invited the Greens to tell me about the empirical scientific evidence that justifies their claims that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut, and they have still failed to do so. They won't debate me. Until they give me the evidence, I won't be supporting anything like this. The question is, motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for... One minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 806 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell if the ayes, Senator Urquhart, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 6, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Seawitt, I will come to your business of the Senate matter number two now.
Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that businesses. Business of the Senate Notice No. 2 relating to the liquid assets test be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seaworth. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Um, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, the government does not support this disallowance motion. Means testing is a long standing fundamental component of the income support system, and the reintroduction of the liquid asset waiting period is consistent with the targeted support the government is providing through the extension of the coronavirus supplement and the six month extension to the JobKeeper program. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawood be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is business of the Senate. Matter number two in the name of Senator C would be agreed to. 
The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith teller for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 24, nose 26. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could I come to matter number 804, Senator Faruqi? No, it doesn't. Why are we doing uh, Mr. President, I don't think that's listed for today. Carry on that. So. Yeah, we'll move on. Sorry about that, Senator Fluky. So we'll go to um, 809 in the name of Senator Carr. Mr President, I'd ask that General Business Notice of Motion 809 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? If there being none, I call Senator Carr. I move the motion standing in my name. Senator Dunningham. Short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government, uh, the government does not support a further delay in the committee's reporting date for this necessary reform to the lam uh, family law courts. This reform has already been the subject of a previous Senate committee inquiry that reported in February 2019, mm -hmm. and now has again already been under inquiry by that same committee since December. These bills give effect to a targeted and meaningful reform to what are known uh, structural failings of the current split family law system. These bills will increase the number of matters resolved each year and reduce the cost and time expended by families. Delaying the committee's report further only harms Australian families and simply because Labor members of the committee either won't or aren't able to do their job. The question is that motion number 809 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 809 in the name of Senator Carr be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The matter is therefore negatived. There are two more matters, Senators. Could I come to matter number 811 in the name of Senator Watt? And Senator Urquhart will take care of that. Thank you, Mr President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 811 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The review by Mr Dennis Richardson AC is the most significant review of the intelligence legislative framework in four decades. Consequently, it requires careful consideration by government. Obviously, this process has been disrupted somewhat by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and the requirement for all governments to focus, on, uh, focus all efforts rather, on protecting lives and livelihoods. The government's consideration of this important and substantial review is being finalised, and I expect an unclassified report will be publicly released along with the government's response in the coming months. As is appropriate, Mr Richardson has briefed the chair and the deputy chair of the PJCIS along with the shadow attorney-general throughout the course of the review. Attempts by the opposition to rush this process are irresponsible, further demonstrating they don't possess the temperament needed to govern and keep Australians safe. Order. Question. Senator McAllister, the question is that motion number 811 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. I've been asked to. All right, on that, I've been asked to, with the consent of the chamber, withdraw the division. Um, I'll put, and put the motion again. Sorry, I've, I, I hear voices. The question is that motion number 811. Yeah. It'd be the least scary thing about someone in this building, Senator McKenzie. Um, the question is that motion number 811 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you to the chamber. The last matter is number 816, in the name of Senator Hanson Young. I give you a moment to go to your seat. Mr. President, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 816 uh, before asking that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I oh. ask that it be taken as formal. Sorry. I'm just getting a message about this. If there is no objection to it being taken as formal, I'll take its amended and call on Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I move the motion as Qu amended. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Yes, I, I didn't. Yeah. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 816 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell of the noes. The division is ayes 24, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I will give senators a moment to take their seat or exit the chamber before we move on to the next item, the MPI. Senators, I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 17 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Thorpe on her first day. Oh, the letter reads, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's budget for millionaires is a disaster for our climate and for economic equality, driving the expansion of dirty gas and giving billions in corporate handouts. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I'll call Senator Rice. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. I'm very pleased to be kicking off the debate on this matter of public importance. That the Morrison government's budget for, is a budget for millionaires, it's a disaster for our climate and for economic equality. It's driving the expansion of dirty gas and giving billions in corporate handouts. This is a budget for millionaires, not the million unemployed. Budgets are about choices, and this budget chooses to prolong the recession, fuel the climate crisis, and it gives young people the finger. This budget is brown and trickle down. There is an eye-watering $99 billion in handouts to business that, rather than resulting in an economic resurgence, is likely to result in an orgy of spending of imported goods straight from overseas, in bigger corporate profits and increased return to shareholders. And as for jobs, what we're being offered is wage subsidies for young people, the jobs that sadly will probably be par for course of what young people expect out of jobs in the current circumstances, poorly paid, temporary and part-time and probably time limited because those subsidies only last for a year 
once that subsidy finishes in a year, the likelihood is that they'll be shown the door. And we've got job seeker and job keeper still being slashed. So it's going to be back to living below the breadline for over a million Australians, struggling to survive, reducing, reduced to missing meals and couch surfing in this one of the richest countries of the world. I mean, last night's budget was such a missed opportunity. I mean, just think of the hope that would be in the air, the sense of optimism about the future. If last night the government had announced that, yes, it was spending $99 billion, but it was going to spend it in sectors like renewable energy, green hydrogen, public housing, public transport, bike and walking infrastructure, aged care, childcare, environmental restoration, a jobs and education guarantee for young people. We would not only be well on the way to implementing a Green New Deal, we would be creating tens of thousands of jobs and we'd be tackling our climate crisis. I mean, we are in a critical decade for climate action. But this budget gives money to liberal donors in the coal and gas industry, it fast tracks climate collapse and it turbocharges inequality. I mean, Scott Morrison envisages a gas-powered future where 99% of companies get tax breaks, but 2 million people don't have enough work. And they're doubling down on transport infrastructure that locks in pollution, that props up fossil fuel corporations and makes the climate crisis even worse. There is zero funding for public transport projects in my home city of Melbourne. There is zero funding for projects like high-speed rail and an absolute pittance for electric vehicles. There's no investment in active transport. In Victoria, cycling has tripled since the pandemic, but people are going to be forced back into their cars once they return to on-site work because the safe bike paths to get them to work just don't exist. I mean, imagine the difference we could make if walking and cycling were a national priority and we invested at least a billion dollars to build zero carbon walking and cycling infrastructure. It would make our neighbourhoods more livable, our transport networks more polluting. I mean, this budget makes one thing clear. This government is not up for changing. They've backed right off the measures we applauded during the COVID crisis of free childcare and doubling job seeker. No, this budget makes it really clear that they are wedded to their neoliberal ideological small government agenda. So it's just as clear then as to what needs to happen. Australia, we need to turf this government out of office. Thank you, Senator Rice. I now call Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Ah, the Australian Greens Party. It's hard to know sometimes whether they're for real, isn't it? You can always count on them, though, to be demanding that more money be applied to the least productive members of our society day in, day out, of course, to be taken by force from those people who do produce until there remains no incentive whatsoever for anybody to produce anything. Some economic strategy. I mean, why would you, when not producing is rewarded, but producing is to be penalised harshly. Now, none of this should be taken as a judgement on those people who, because of circumstances beyond their control, can't work. On the coalition side, we believe in giving a hand to those people who are doing it tough, but in a way that is sustainable, in a way that doesn't undermine the important ethic that says all of us must take responsibility for our lives, that working is not optional for those people of working age and capacity. So while this government has provided help to those people whose work has been affected and disrupted by the pandemic, either to keep them connected to their work with JobKeeper or to provide temporary relief for unemployment using JobSeeker, we make no apology for being focused on helping people back into work rather than providing, generating a lifestyle, a culture where a life on welfare is a comfortable choice. But that's the Greens approach. That's what the Australian Greens Party 
advocate for in this place day in, day out. And you know what? The idea that we should all live comfortably on welfare while contributing nothing is corrosive to our pride, it is corrosive to our self-respect and it is corrosive to our prosperity as a nation. And so I want to come back to the words of this motion. It's, it'd be laughable if they weren't serious. They call this the Morrison government's budget for millionaires. Are they for real? The Greens could not be more out of touch. Tax cuts for everyone and an effective doubling up of the tax assistance that's provided to low and middle income earners because they get both the tax cut and the extension of the low income tax offset, effectively doubling up on the help that we are providing to give incentives to people on low and middle incomes to do as much work as they can get their hands on. Now, I acknowledge that's difficult at this point in time. What we need is more jobs. And you know what? That's what this budget is all about. This budget is about jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs for young people, jobs for older people. Jobs so that the dignity of work can be restored after the disruption of COVID. But here's what the Australian Greens Party just do not get. Where do they think jobs come from? They don't come from a magical job tree. They don't come out of a magical job hat or a magical job pudding. For they complain incessantly about anything that might provide any assistance to any business to do what they do. But hang on, where do jobs come from? Jobs come from viable businesses. And so they get up here and bleat about assistance to anything in a corporate structure. I think the words they've used here are corporate handouts. Well, you know what? The small businesses in my home state of Queensland who are given incentives in this budget to take on more staff, be it an apprentice, be it a young worker. That's not a corporate handout. That's real practical assistance to get a person started in work. And the small business that's trying to find out whether or not it's viable to do a fit out of their premises so that they can take on more clients or the farmer who's trying to work out whether or not he can afford a new harvester, trying to work out whether he can invest. The assistance we're providing by way of making it possible to immediately deduct the cost of those assets from their tax bill, that's not a corporate handout. That's facilitating investment in the jobs of Australians. I cannot believe that there would be people who come in here day after day with their economic gobbledygook that says you cannot, you cannot provide support to businesses but jobs magically appear. Well, the thing is, we need strong, viable, profitable, sustainable businesses for the long term if we're going to get Australians back into work. Because Australians don't want to be on JobKeeper. Australians don't want to be on JobSeeker. Australians want a job that allows them to achieve the freedom of choice, the freedom to be able, the freedom to be able to support their family on their terms rather than being confined by a welfare life. And so those in the Greens with their magical job tree. No, that's not how it works. It's okay to support the businesses of Australia, overwhelmingly small businesses, I might add, because it is those businesses that underpin the prosperity of every Australian. The word corporate is not a dirty word. Did you get the memo, Australian Greens? 
a corporation is just a group of people who've got together to build something great for this country, to produce something great for this country. And what do they produce? Well, they might produce in manufacturing items that we sell overseas. They might produce the services that we sell to other Australians or indeed um, the, the services that we sell around the world. They might produce the resources that those on the opposite find so very, very offensive, but that power all of the things that we enjoy in our modern lifestyle and wouldn't want to give up. They power the energy that's needed for us to be able to run this country, to be able to sustain jobs. And we don't apologise for it. We're proud of that. And so when I hear that 890,000 Queensland businesses will be eligible for business tax incentives, including temporarily deducting all of their eligible expenses with no asset limits, I think that's a wonderful thing because that's an investment in Queenslanders' jobs. The budget increases total payments to Queensland by $8.1 billion over the forward estimates. And every single dollar is an investment in the infrastructure that produces jobs. It's an investment in the infrastructure that improves our productivity, which also produces jobs. It's an investment in the futures of Queenslanders. Not a life on welfare, not a life of hopelessness, not a life of working out whether or not one can get by on whatever the government decides is the welfare rate for the time being until it runs out of money because it has no plan to make um, this country prosperous and productive, because that's what the Australian Greens argue for every day of the week. No, this is a path to economic recovery, a path to all Australians being able to choose their own adventure of aspiration, to decide what they want out of life, to decide for themselves what careers they want, to have real choice about the jobs that they take on, to be able to choose to travel once our borders open again, of course, to be able to choose to invest in a home, to educate their children the way they wish. Real choice. The kind of choice that no life confined to welfare in the way that the Australian Greens seem so determined to inflict upon Australians could ever deliver. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Call Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'm glad that this motion does give me the opportunity to share a few observations about last night's federal budget and what it contains for the country as a whole and, in particular, for my state of Queensland. I have to say my overwhelming reaction to last night's budget was one of disappointment. Uh, I really did think that at this time, at a time when Australia is facing its worst recession since the Great Depression, that there would be some more vision from this federal government about the kind of country that we want to have as we emerge from this crisis and the budgetary support that would be provided to make sure that we get us there. And instead, really what we saw last night from the government was a budget that was really just about spinning wheels. Sure, yeah, there are some significant announcements there. There are some significant funding injections, uh, but it doesn't really take us anywhere. It really just is about getting things happening rather than actually setting us up for the sort of future that we need as a country. So I think that that is a really lost opportunity. Uh, when we face these kinds of conditions, it really should force us to think about the kind of country that we want to have in the future and what are the types of problems that we saw in our country heading into this crisis. And this budget would have been an opportunity to actually fix some of those problems and make Australia stronger, more prosperous, more inclusive than it was prior to the crisis. And when we look at the key initiatives of this budget, really some of them are things that Labor has been calling on this government to do for a very long time. We have been calling on this government to bring forward the stage two tax cuts for many, many months. 
We have been calling on the government to increase its investment in infrastructure for many, many months. So now that the government finally does these things, they sort of want to sit back and wait for all this glory and acclamation for having done things that Labor has been calling on the government to do for months. And you can't help but wonder where the country would be now if the government had actually acted on Labor's suggestions months ago when we first started making them. Where would the country be now if the government had actually brought forward those stage two, country, uh, stage two tax cuts months ago as we had called on the government to do? How many jobs would have been created in the infrastructure projects that the government is finally agreeing to now if the government had done this months ago as Labor had called on the government to do. So, as I say, I think all in all the budget is a pretty underwhelming document in terms of what it will do in the short term and what it will do in the longer term for the country. Because we've seen the government benches today, the awkwardness that was just emanating from every uh, government senator today when they were reminded that they will be the government remembered for presiding over $1 trillion worth of debt in our country. We know, I mean, I've, I've only been here a short time, uh, but I know how many speeches I've seen from government senators telling us that the way to prosperity and to success is to have a government that's about low taxes and low debt. I remember the insults that have been thrown at Labor for so long about debt and deficit disaster that we apparently ushered in after the GFC at a fraction of the debt that this government is now racking up. But what's worse than that is the very little we will have to show for the debt that is being racked up by this government. Because despite the fact that they are racking up $1 trillion in debt, and Senator Cormann will always be remembered as the $1 trillion man as he leaves this parliament, probably something that he didn't aspire to, but that will be his record. The, well, I, I'll, I'll come to that, Senator Smith. Senator Cormann will be remembered as the $1 trillion man, much as he might not want to have that description applied to him, if he's remembered at all. Uh, but for all of that spending, order, order, senators. for all of that spending, it's hard to see what we're going to get from it. It's not as if we're going to get some massive new investment in childcare to finally get a fix to the aged care crisis that this government has presided over. There's no more social housing being provided to address the housing crisis that this gov government has presided over. No jobs coming for tradies building that social housing. And for all that debt that's being racked up by the government, we're still going to see an increase in unemployment and we're still going to see wages in this country not rising for four years. In fact, the budget papers say that the government is forecasting there's going to be a real wage cut over the next 12 months. People's wages are going to go backwards over the next 12 months once you take into account inflation. So I would have thought that if the government was going to be racking up $1 trillion in debt, that they might at least be able to get unemployment down. They might at least be able to ensure that Australians are going to get a wage rise and therefore have more money to put through local businesses and create jobs. I would have thought that we might actually see a fix to the childcare system uh, to encourage particularly women back into work. I would have thought that you might see a fix to the aged care crisis. But what we now know is that after this debt is being racked up, all of those problems will still remain for a future government to deal with. Uh, so that is a really lost opportunity, I think, uh, for this government and for the country as a whole. Now, the other really disappointing aspect of the budget last night is that it didn't take up Labor's suggestion to reverse the cuts that the government has imposed to JobKeeper and to JobSeeker. Now, again, in my state of Queensland alone, 
those cuts which have taken effect over the last few days are impacting on hundreds of thousands of people. Just to give you a few examples, in Brisbane, it's estimated there are about 273,000 people who have had JobKeeper or JobSeeker cut over the last few days. On the Gold Coast, cut by 165,000. And I'm happy to take this absurd interjection from Senator Hume, which we've been hearing all week. They are so terrified of the reality that they have cut the job seeker payment and job keeper payment that they want to turn it into some extension. Well, let me give you the tip. When someone's receiving $1,500 a fortnight on JobKeeper, and that's reduced by hundreds of dollars a fortnight, it's not an increase. It's not an increase. It's a cut. And it might not be a word that you like. It might not be a word that you want to use. It's not an increase to reduce a payment by hundreds of dollars a fortnight can only be labelled as a cut. A cut imposed as part of the Morrison recession. And this is going to make things worse. At a time when the economy is so precarious, to have hundreds of thousands of people in Brisbane, in Logan, in Scenic Rim, on the Gold Coast, on the Sunshine Coast, in Central Queensland, on the Fraser Coast, in North Queensland, in Outback Queensland, having the JobKeeper payment and the JobSeeker payment cut, that is taking millions of dollars out of those local economies every single week. That's money that people had in their pockets that they were able to spend in local businesses that they no longer will have. That is going to have a devastating impact on those local economies, and we saw nothing last night to address that and to change that. The other thing we didn't see last night in the budget was the funding that the Queensland opposition leader, Deb Frecklington, has been going around claiming to have to upgrade the Bruce Highway in Queensland. Ms Frecklington has spent the last week driving from Brisbane to Cairns, telling people all along the way that if she's elected as the Premier of Queensland, that she's going to make the Bruce Highway a four-lane road from Brisbane to Cairns. Now, that costs $33 billion. She's saying that she'll put in 20 per cent, which means that she needed about $26 billion from the federal government to meet her commitment to, to four-lane the Bruce Highway. And what did we see last night? $200 million. $200 million committed by this federal government to the Bruce Highway. So she's about $26.2 billion short, and she'll only make it up by cutting Thank you. just like the federal Senator government's White, cutting right now. Your time has expired. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I will discuss the real economic inequalities that this government has created and the disastrous effect they're having on hard-working Australians. As we've heard in the last half hour, the Greens and Labor tag team to attack the government on the budget's inequalities. Yet both are complicit in supporting the most destructive and regressive attack on the working class ever seen in our country. That is, the United Nations led war on cheap energy. This war is hurting humanity, destroying the environment, and curtailing the freedoms and sovereignty of our nation. And let's not forget that while Labor and Greens policies will cause a swift and evil end to affordable energy in our country, the Liberal National Party approach is death by a thousand climate regulations. In the end, whether Labor Greens or Liberal Nationals climate policies prevail, the destruction of our economy will be the same. It's just the length of time it will take to deindustrialize and destroy our way of life. The Greens and Labor talk about inequality yet ignore the inequalities their own policies have on Australians. Where is the equality for Australians who are now paying 39 per cent of their electricity bills for climate policies and renewable subsidies? Yet government tells us it's only 6 per cent. And that's the government's own data and cannot be sensibly refuted—39 per cent. Where is the equality for Australians who are paying $526,000 for every wind turbine erected in Australia with taxpayer subsidies going directly to mostly foreign companies. They're paid even when the turbine generates no power. Where is the equality for working class Australians who are paying $13 billion extra a year in higher electricity bills due to climate policies that wealthy elites champion? 
yet they can afford the higher, yet they can afford the higher cost of electricity. Where is the equality for Australians whose economy is being destroyed, trying to limit our 1.3 per cent of global human CO2, when countries like China, who produce 30 per cent of global human carbon dioxide, build hundreds of new coal-fired power plants? This is not democracy. This is hypocrisy. I would like everyone in this chamber to take a moment to think about the most vulnerable people in our society and the effect your climate policies are having on them. The poor, the elderly, students, the unemployed. This is a highly regressive tax on these people. The proportion of climate policies on our electricity bills is now 39 per cent. 39 per cent. And again, this figure is from state and federal government's own figures. Paying for an essential service like electricity is becoming an, an, a luxury for some. For the majority, it means less disposable income for families to spend on food, birthday presents or a family holiday. When are you, my colleagues in this chamber, going to start focusing on what is good for the people of Australia, rather than enriching your corporate mates in the green energy business and virtue signalling to the elites and the United Nations? You were elected as servants to the people of Australia. It's time you started acting like it. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, I uh, rise to speak in this uh, MPI debate, speak in the context where, uh, uh, having, read, um, having read the MPI, I'd like to add my welcome to the welcome of other senators to Senator Thorpe and, uh, and say to her, it's very fortunate. Some of us have been here for more than 12 months and haven't got an MPI up. She's got an MPI up in the first week, and that's a very, very good thing. Um, and what the MPI does go to uh, is the centrality of economic equality to uh, any sense of social justice, and the deep disappointment that most Australians will have in the failure of the budget to deal in any meaningful way in this context, the context of the deepest recession since the Great Depression, the Morrison recession now, uh, a recession that is deeper and will go on for longer because of the policy failures of this government to deal with the challenges that the coronavirus pandemic has faced or has presented for our economy. And what we've seen is that the test for this budget must be what does it do for jobs and good jobs for Australians in our cities and regions, and it fails that test completely. The myth created by those on the other side of some coalition economic capacity, some capacity to manage the economy, is surely now gone forever. If it wasn't the silliness of the back in black mugs that they put around the place last year that strangely you can't find. I tried to buy one. I tried to buy one late last year. They just sort of disappeared. They had just gone. Um, claiming a budget surplus before you deliver it is surely one of the silliest things that a treasurer and a prime minister have done in Australian political history. And up close, I've got to say, over the course of the last 12 months, I've realised how fragile, how fragile this myth of coalition economic capacity is. See, Senator Cormann isn't going to be here for much longer, and his side rely upon him to continue that myth of economic credibility, but it's really only maintained by bluster and slogans. And if you follow the bouncing ball of the logic of the coalition's claim to some economic credibility, it's all about debt. Well, if they had a debt truck in 2013 because there was $160 billion worth of Commonwealth debt following the global financial crisis, they would have needed a B-double at the end of last year and a road train wouldn't, wouldn't hold the slogan 
a road train wouldn't hold the slogan. But the point about debt is not how big it is, it's what did you do with it? What did you achieve? And we're in a position where much more than a trillion dollars of net debt will be in the economy at its peak. And what has been achieved? Well, unemployment is the highest number of Australians unemployed in our history today. And if you follow, if you believe the government's own modelling, there are 160,000 more Australians to go to lose their jobs between now and Christmas. I mean, if you believe that, we'll see what happens. Uh, the, 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 the budget package is an utter failure. What is it going to deliver? How many people are going to go into good jobs uh, because of this government's package? Now, the average Australian taxpayer is a 38-year-old woman with two kids. What's in the budget for her? If she's part of the million people who are now unemployed, well, in December, she can look forward to the job seeker package going back to $40 a day. If she isn't in the million people who have lost their jobs, is she going to be in the next 160,000? Or if you believe the Treasury estimates, 400,000 people who are going to lose their jobs between now and Christmas. And if she has lost her job, some of the people who have lost their jobs because of the Morrison government's mismanagement of this recession, according to the government's own estimates, face the prospect of four long years of unemployment before they get a job. If that woman, that 38-year-old woman with two kids, wants to get back in the work, if she was looking to this budget to deliver anything for her in terms of improvements to the childcare framework for Australian women and Australian families, this budget has a big fat zero in it for her on childcare. If, like hundreds of thousands of other Australian women, she works in aged care or childcare or retail or any of those other occupations that are highly feminised, nothing in the budget for them, just a legacy of wage stagnation and neglect in those sectors. And because she's 38 and the government's delivering precious little in terms of new job creation, what she faces up to is an incentive system that incentivises employers to employ anybody but her. Uh, and she's got to face up to that additional challenge in the labour market. Now we know what's worked. When Labor came here to the Senate and to the House of Representatives demanding a wage subsidy program, those on the other side of this chamber, including the leader in the Senate, laughed the idea out of the place. Two weeks later, they launched JobKeeper and JobSeeker. Well, we know those programs have worked to maintain a relationship between some workers and their businesses, more than three million of them, and they've kept hundreds of thousands of businesses afloat. But both those programs are going to be cut, despite what Senator Hume says. They go on for a bit longer, but the rate's going to be reduced and it's going to have a catastrophic effect. We are going to have the only recovery that's going to happen over the course of this year is a liquidator-led recovery because of your cuts to the JobKeeper program that will send many businesses to the wall. Uh, this recession is a pure product of absolute mismanagement by this side. Absolute mismanagement by this side. It is the Morrison recession. It is the Morrison recession because your cuts mean hundreds of thousands of more Australians will lose their jobs. It means tens of thousands of Australian businesses will close because you don't understand 
your responsibility as a government to manage the economy. Now, Australians have got precious little for the trillion dollars worth of extra debt. And Mr Frydenberg and the Prime Minister would have us believe that the economy was somehow in good shape, that we were in a good fiscal position somehow as we approached the end of 2019. Well, what have we had? We had flatlining growth. We had wages falling for most Order. Australians, a long period of wage stagnation in the record books. Ordinary Australian families couldn't get ahead. Unemployment and underemployment steadily working their way up. The jobs underemployment going up. 1.8 million Australians unemployed or underemployed. If you're proud of that legacy, if you're proud of that legacy, 1.8 million Australians without a job or without enough work. The RBA doing all of the heavy lifting in the economy. Interest rates at historic lows because this lot couldn't do their job and productivity declining. They're just not very good at economic management. The, 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 verdict, the verdict on their economic management will be the same as the Royal Commission's verdict on their management of the aged care system. Neglect and failure. Thanks, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dep uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this debate today. And what a sheer disappointment uh, last night's budget was for those who have been the hardest hit by this pandemic and the recession that has followed. We know the moment uh, restrictions had to be brought in to manage the health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of Australians were out of work. Those working within the hospitality industry, the tourism industry and, of course, the arts and entertainment industry. And yet last night the Treasurer could not even bring himself to utter the word art. <coughs> Arts, artists, creatives, entertainers, nothing. The hardest hit sector that binds our hospitality industry, our tourism industry together, has been left out in the cold once again. And we're talking about 600,000 Australian workers, bringing $112 billion to the economy, and they've been left on the scrap heap. Many of them have never been able to access JobKeeper, so they're still left out in the cold. Many of them casual workers who have had hours cut jobs cut, wages lost, and their savings, if they had any, is, are now running on dry and empty. We're talking artists, musicians, authors, photographers, graphic designers, florists, the thousands and thousands of dance teachers across this country who run dance schools that Australians send their kids to every weekend or used to be able to. Hundreds of thousands of Australian artists and those who work in the creative industries have been left on the scrap heap today after receiving nothing in this budget, despite being hit the hardest by this economic crisis. And of course, this industry, like retail, hospitality, tourism, the arts and the entertainment industry, is predominantly female orientated. So again, we see women at the heart of this crisis carrying the burden, the economic burden, and again have received nothing out of this budget. It just beggars belief that after six months, the Treasurer last night gave a speech and did not utter a word of supporting Australia's art and cultural sector and industry. It is as if art doesn't matter. It's as if culture doesn't exist. It's as if, for the last six months of lockdown, Australians have not turned on the television or their screening service and watched shows that have entertained them, have not turned on the radio or the stereo and listened to music, have not got themselves into a good book. It's as if art and culture in this country means nothing. 
The Prime Minister spends quite a bit of time going to the football. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every now and then he went to a community art centre? Wouldn't it be wonderful if he swapped the footy scarf every now and again? to this MPI that the Morrison government's budget for millionaires is as a disaster for our climate and for economic equality, driving the expansion of dirty gas and giving billions in corporate handouts. Last night's budget, touted by the Treasurer as a budget all about jobs, does nothing for those who will remain unemployed, because even the government says and knows that there will be still around 6 per cent unemployment, even if their wildest dreams came true. Those people deserve support from our social security system so that they are not living in poverty, so that their well-being is ensured. The Treasurer mentioned Job Seeker three times in his speech last night that I counted, but did not mention and did not commit to any permanent increase to JobSeeker, nor give security <coughs> to those that on the th at the end of December do not know whether they will be condemned to $40 a day. In fact, at the moment, that's what is going to happen. So people on the JobSeeker payment, on youth allowance, basically at the moment are going to be know that they will end up in deep poverty. With the cut of $300 a fortnight, we know that they've been put below the poverty line, but by the end of December they will be in deep poverty of $40 a day. We saw nothing for people on the job seeker and youth allowance and these who are becoming increasingly anxious about the future, What's going to, whether they're going to be able to pay their bills or not. This trickle-down budget is rooted in choices that will prolong our recession and fuel the climate crisis. And the tragedy here is we could actually move to a much more equal community and society and address the climate crisis. But the government has prioritised $99 billion a year in handouts to big corporations while unemployed Australians get nothing. Millions of Australians on high incomes will get tax cuts, but there's no guarantee that they'll spend the money. Where if you, guarantee, if you commit to certainty for people on low incomes, and in particularly those on the job seeker payment, if you guarantee certainty and make sure that they are given an income and supported above the poverty line, they will actually spend the money because they know that they have to <coughs> put food on the table pay their rent, pay their mortgages, go to the dentist, buy medications. They contribute to the community and, in fact, by not making sure that people were continued to get the paid, the original coronavirus supplement, the government has taken out $31.3 billion worth from our economy. And it means there's not 145,000 jobs that would be available if, they were, if the government was paying the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus supplement at the original level of $1,100 a fortnight. That money would not only benefit the economy, but much more importantly, it would make sure that people aren't living in poverty and that people's wellbeing was looked after. This budget condemns people to poverty. It also expands inequality so, and will help so drive our climate the crisis. The time for debate has expired. Thank you, Senator Sir. Uh, now, um, we will proceed to the consideration of documents. So, Senators, the documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. Are there any contributors? Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. Document number two uh, on page five. Uh, 
On 1 September, the Senate passed a resolution moved by Senator Dunham and other LNP senators which made baseless and slanderous claims against the Bob Brown Foundation and some eminent scientists regarding a paper they, reg they wrote in relation to bushfires and forestry operations. The motion was passed with only Australian Greens senators opposing. The motion was a disgraceful and cowardly use of parliamentary privilege to smear scientists for doing their jobs and activists who are bravely defending Tasmania's magnificent carbon-rich forests from ongoing destruction by the logging industry. A response to this motion from Mr Stephen Chaffer, CEO of the Bob Brown Foundation, has today been tabled in the Senate. I will now read the substance of Mr Chaffer's response into the Hansard. The resolution says that the paper was withdrawn after the insistence from the academic community. The paper was in fact withdrawn by its honourable authors before anyone else asked for such action. The claim that the withdrawal of this paper was required is manifestly wrong. Indeed, the editor of the journal Fire, Professor Alistair Smith, <coughs> said of the authors, and I quote, the retraction was made at the request of the authors of the original paper after they were alerted to an error. This is an excellent example of research integrity by the authors." End quote. The resolution condemned the Bob Brown Foundation for the use of bodgy science and for falsehoods about forestry. On the honour of the Senate, I ask you to forward to the Foundation the evidence, the science, for this otherwise egregious slander. The Hansard contains no such science or evidence. The Senate then called on this foundation to apologise for using misinformation to demonise hardworking Australians. This foundation, says Mr Chaffer, did no such thing. The foundation does, however, employ hardworking Australians and is supported by thousands more hardworking Australians. It is appalled by the misinformation used in the Australian Senate to demonise these hard-working Australians. And I want to say this, uh, Mr President, unlike many in the chamber, the Australian Greens believe in and accept the climate science. We support climate scientists. We support the scientists who wrote the paper that Senator Dunham's motion referred to, and we support the great work that the Bob Brown Foundation is doing. There is abundant existing evidence, apart from the paper that Senator Dunham's uh, motion referred to, which links logging with increased bushfire risk. My colleague, Senator Wish Wilson, has also written to Tasmanian Forest Minister Guy Barnett on behalf of the scientists, requesting that the relevant maps held by Forestry Tasmania be made publicly available to assist with scientific research. He's also urged the Liberals not to politicise the work of scientists and instead let the scientific process, whereby scientists are the ones who debate and critique each other's research, take its course. The Australian Greens will continue to fight for the many Australian communities and the many ecosystems in this beautiful country of ours that are affected by and threatened by increased bushfire risk due to industrial forestry operations and the breakdown of our climate. And I say this to Senator Dunning. If he's got evidence to support the contentions in his motion, then he should provide it to the Senate. If he doesn't, and I suspect that's the case, then he should come into this place and apologise and withdraw. Finally, I urge Senator Dunham to get his head out of the sand, accept the climate science and work to end his political party's war on nature and this planet's climate. Senator McKim, thank you. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Seek leave, thank yes, you. Yes, okay. Leave granted, leave granted. Any other speakers? If not, okay, I'll move on now to uh, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Lurkett. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, I do apologise. Uh, you, okay. Is that okay? Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Lurkett. Um, thank you. On behalf, <coughs> excuse me, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest 13 of 2020. Thank you, Senator Lurkett. Senator Davey. 
Uh, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, Senator Firavanti Wells, I present the Delegated Legislation Monitor 11 of 2020. Thank you. Are there any other further speakers? Senator Davey. Um, pursuant to order and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports on the examination of annual reports tabled by 30th of April 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I present the report of the Finance and Public Administration References Committee on lessons learned in relation to the 2019-20 bushfire season, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, for the speakers, no. Okay, so we will now move to Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Oh, sorry, Senator Rice. Hello, there's two of you. So I'm sorry, <laughs> Senator Rice. New technology, I'm getting used to. Yes, Senator Rice. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, yes, I, I wish to speak to the um, Finance and Public Ad Administration interim report on on the bushfires. I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago that the bushfires had such a devastating impact. But it wasn't even a full year ago. I mean, we had people wearing masks, not because of COVID-19, but because the smoke was so bad. We saw heartbreaking pictures of people evacuated off beaches as the flames roared. And it's been such a hard year for so many since then. We had over 30 people losing their lives, more than 3,000 homes being destroyed in the six months of the Black Summer fires. And in addition, it's estimated that there were 417 excess deaths because of, because of bushfire smoke exposure and over 4,000 hospitalisations and emergency department presentations for cardiovascular problems, respiratory problems and asthma because of bushfire smoke. And I extend my sympathies to families and friends of those who tragically passed away, those who were injured or traumatised or lost their homes or their livelihoods and whose health was affected by the fires. And I also note that there were over 3 billion animals killed in these fires. The Worldwide Fund for Nature described it as one of the worst wildlife disasters in modern history. These fires were supercharged by our climate crisis. Despite the devastation we saw in the fires, the Liberal Party is refusing to address the climate emergency in the midst of a pandemic, a de devastating economic turndown and a climate emergency, the Liberal Party is still trying the same old tired ideological approaches. So this interim report into the bushfires is very timely. It presents the evidence that we've heard to date. It presents 13 recommendations drawing on evidence that the committee has heard. And it's important that the government act urgently before the coming summer, because there are things that the government can do right away that will make a difference for future bushfires summers. And the Greens support the recommendations that are outlined in this report. But in my comments, I want to focus on what wasn't in the recommendations, but what we have included in our additional comments, and that's the need for urgent action on our climate crisis. The committee received ample, overwhelming evidence, very clear and sobering evidence about how, how our climate emergency is having a terrible impact on, uh, on fire conditions. As the Climate Council of Australia wrote, climate change was the driver of the record-breaking extreme weather conditions that led to the catastrophic bushfires. Any remaining doubt on the clear causal linkage, linkages between climate change and worsening bushfires driven by extreme weather, needs to be comprehensively refuted in the inquiry report. And just to state the obvious, we know that Australia's actions contribute massively to the climate emergency. And the Liberal National Party government has done the bidding of its fossil fuel donors and consistently blocked, repealed and undermined action on our climate crisis. And if future generations look back and they ask, why didn't we act earlier? The answer will be the fossil fuel lobby and their shills sitting in the Liberal Party room. Because of that undermining of meaningful action, 
Australia is still worsening the climate emergency. We are the fifth biggest miner of fossil fuels behind China, the USA, Russia and, and Saudi Arabia. For every Australian, this country mines 57 tonnes of fossil fuel carbon every year, 10 times greater than the world average. So it's disappointing then that given the overwhelming evidence that's presented to the inquiry, that the Labor majority committee, the Labor majority committee didn't see its way clear to make a recommendation about the urgent need to reduce our carbon pollution to zero as soon as possible. We are completely out of time for half measures. This is an emergency. We do not have time to wait. It's not a matter of waiting for more evidence. The moment is here and the time is now. We need to act urgently to reduce our carbon pollution and meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement. If we act now, we can still, we'll still be facing the impacts of the warming that's already baked in, but we can prevent the future warming that is going to make fire seasons much, much worse. So to address the climate emergency, there are two things that we have to do. That we must declare a, cl a, a climate emergency. And we, the Greens, have introduced a climate emergency bill 2020, and the parliament should pass that bill. That is one of our additional recommendations for this interim report. And more than that, we should enact a Green New Deal, a government-led plan of massive investment and action to build a clean economy and a caring society. Under a Green New Deal, the government would take the lead in creating new jobs and industries, getting to zero emissions as quickly as possible, and delivering universal services to make sure that no one's led behind. Yes, exactly what the government did not do in last night's budget. Last night's budget was such a missed opportunity. I mean, the Liberal Party likes to pretend that the reason that they're not acting on our climate crisis is because of some imagined cost. And the Labor Party so that they can't act at the speed and scale needed because they're worried about jobs in mining and burning coal and gas. But of course, we know that upsetting the big fossil fuel companies that donate to both parties is the main reason that they're not acting. So it's very clear, if we are to be not having increased, more extreme fire conditions in future years, if we are to have a future where last summer's desperate fires are just not a taste of what needs to come, we need to act, and we need to act in our climate crisis, and we need to act now. Thank you, Senator Ross. Senator Ayres. Take note of the um, bushfire interim report. It's been a privilege to chair uh, the committee that has dealt with this, and uh, a privilege to work with the Secretariat and the other senators who participated uh, in the work of the inquiry. Of course, the bushfires uh, committee is doing its work in the shadows of the Black Summer 2019-2020 bushfire season. And the Prime Minister and this government failed to prepare for the 2019-2020 bushfire season. We knew it at the time. The warnings weren't just private warnings to the government. They were public warnings to the government from public institutions that understood the magnitude of the bushfire risk that was posed right across the Australian continent. And of course, at this very moment in the United States, in the Northern Hemisphere, bushfires are raging across the United States and the continuing escalation of bushfire threat around the globe intensifies the challenge for Australia. We knew it at the time. The Commonwealth government, the Morrison government, should have known it at the time, should have taken steps to prepare bushfire communities, and ultimately we saw the tragic consequences, and the evidence submitted to the inquiry has confirmed that <coughs> all over again. I do want to thank those organisations and individuals that have made submissions to the inquiry, uh, many of whom we have heard oral evidence from. So, the scientific experts, despite um, 
what uh, some senators uh, in this place say about the role of the CSIRO and the other key credible scientific institutions uh, in Australia. The scientific experts have said conclusively once again, just in case people needed reminding, that rising emissions have contributed to a changing climate, which has meant increasing drought conditions, longer fire seasons, drier fuel, less opportunity for hazard reduction and more intense risks of more dangerous and uh, bigger bushfires right across the Australian continent. Australia is uniquely vulnerable to this kind of climate risk, and that's why there's no shirking the responsibility here. The idea that the Commonwealth government doesn't hold a hose should be completely dispelled, uh, not just by this inquiry, but the other inquiries, including the Royal Commission, that are doing their work. The recommendations handed down in the interim report are especially focused on ensuring, firstly, that the government recognises its responsibility, doesn't shirk it, doesn't point at the states, recognises its responsibility in terms of bushfire mitigation, adaptation and doing the work to secure the safety of Australians in bushfire communities. We must urgently invest in resilience and mitigation works to keep bushfire communities safe. We must raise the rate of the Australian Government disaster recovery payment to assist survivors to recover. We must build a sovereign aerial, fire aerial firefighting fleet so that we can cope with longer and more intense fire seasons, but also eliminate bushfires in remote parts of the country that are inaccessible for our professional and volunteer firefighters and eliminate those fires before they become the giant conflagrations that have threatened communities, particularly, uh, particularly on the east coast of Australia. We should reverse the cuts to the ABC and particularly safeguard their emergency broadcasting funding, uh, and we must invest in hardening the transmission sites that have been so crucial to keeping bushfire communities safe. Now, there is disagreement, I think, amongst the senators on, on the committee on some elements uh, of the issues that confront us. But I do have to say that there has been agreement across all members of the committee that the work of the Bushfire, committee, the Bushfire Senate Committee is important work. And it's important that we continue to engage in that careful work of sifting through the evidence and the material that is supplied to us. So that there isn't this sloganeering about hazard reduction on one hand and climate change on the other, as if they are two things that we cannot deal with at the same time. Many of the recommendations in the interim report are intended to be enacted immediately. Can't leave these communities behind like they were last year. We're seeing the same failure to prepare that we saw last year when the Prime Minister and his government ignored warning after warning from the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC, the opposition, their own departments and dozens of former fire chiefs. It can't be allowed to happen again. Key recommendations include recommendation three, that as a matter of priority, the Commonwealth Government announce and release funding for mitigation projects through the Emergency Response Fund. The committee recommends that the Commonwealth Government review, with a view to increase the rate of the Australian Government disaster recovery payment and the disaster recovery allowance as a matter of priority. The committee recommends that the Australian Government make the Better Access Bushfire Recovery Initiative and the Better Access Bushfire Recovery Telehealth Initiatives permanent mental health support services with both initiatives properly funded over the forward estimates. And I can't tell you from visiting bushfire communities just how crucial extending those initiatives is. And the committee finally recommends that the Australian government develop a business case to progress the establishment of a permanent sovereign aerial firefighting fleet. We just can't have any uncertainty 
in the context of overlapping northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere bushfire seasons, uh, the uncertainty of being able to deliver sovereign uh, aeroplane uh, bushfire fighting capability. So the committee notes in this report, this is just the interim report. It's by no means exhaustive and it's intended to catalogue the evidence and make recommendations that deal with bushfire preparedness and the lessons learned from last summer. There is much more work to be done. When travel restrictions are relaxed, the committee will visit bushfire affected regions to examine the progress and effectiveness of the recovery that we know will be long and arduous for many communities. Uh, and I'm deeply sorry that because of the public health restrictions that we weren't able to conduct that work over the course of the last six months. I think it would have been of immense benefit to the committee's work, but I think of some benefit to those communities to have the parliament out there in their communities uh, listening to them, uh, listening carefully to them about their experiences. We will examine the ongoing impacts of the fires on the physical and mental health of people directly impacted by the fires and those uh, exposed to hazarded levels of bushfire smoke. There is a lot of emerging evidence of the impact on people and communities and recently the impact upon pregnant, pregnant women and their unborn children from uh, exposure to hazard levels of bushfire smoke. In a rapidly changing climate, appropriate hazard reduction re regimes are becoming increasingly problematic. Evidence presented to the inquiry so far demonstrates that historical <coughs> methods of hazard reduction are increasingly problematic. For example, there are just less days in the year uh, when hazard reduction work can occur safely. And it is true that state governments have cut the capacity of national parks and wildlife uh, and state forests to do some of that work. There is much more work and investment required in further research. In the meantime, the committee will continue to engage in a thoughtful way with the experts in the field. We are very concerned about evidence that insurance in fire-prone areas is becoming increasingly expensive and could become unavailable unless strong mitigation is undertaken. We're concerned by the effect of the increasing frequency and severity of climate change driven natural disasters on the financial stability of the insurance industry and the apparent preparedness of the industry to make policyholders carry the burden through increased premiums. For, the, for that reason, we've made recommendations relating to APRA supervision of the industry and monitoring of the natural perils component of insurance premiums by the ACCC. Finally, I want to thank the committee secretariat for their assistance their hard work in the conduct of the inquiry so far, particularly in the challenging circumstances presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Senator Lears. Are you seeking leave? I want to seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Lears. Okay. We shall now proceed to um, ministerial statements. Are there any? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Reckon, Deputy President. I present the government's updated response to the report of the Environment Communications References Committee on its inquiry into the Australia's formal extinction crisis and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Committee membership. Committee membership. No, no, I'm asking. Sorry, I'm sorry, Senator Seward. I didn't know if you had any more. You haven't got any more? No, okay, that's fine. Sorry, Senator Seward. Um, can I uh, take note of that report and seek leave to continue my remarks? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Yes, you can. Thanks, Senator Seward. Okay, so we should no more um, ministerial statements. We shall now move to uh, committee memberships. Uh, the president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. There are two nominations for one position on the select committee on tobacco harm reduction allocated to a minority group or independent senators. In accordance with the standing orders, a ballot will be held to determine which one of the two senators who have nominated is to be appointed. I understand it is the wish of the Senate that the ballot will be held tomorrow morning at a time to be determined. Minister. I seek leave to, I seek leave to have a motion to the very the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed in the dynamic red. The question is: there be agreement to that um, motion? Those of that opinion say aye. 
against. No, the eyes have it. Right, we shall now move to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Biosecurity Amendment, Traveller Decor Declarations and Other Measures Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Well, the question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye against no. Clerk. By Security Amendment, Traveller Declarations and Other Measures Bill 2020. Thank you. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, I put the question to the Senate that the debate now be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye, against. No, the ayes have it. Clerk. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, relating to disallowance of part of an instrument. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move the motion. On 28 September, the JobKeeper wage subsidy, which supports about 3.5 million workers, was reduced from $1,500 to $1,200 a fortnight for employees who work more than 20 hours a week and to $750 a fortnight for employees who work fewer than 20 hours a week. This motion would reverse these cuts. JobKeeper and the coronavirus supplement should never have been cut. If anything, JobKeeper should be expanded to workers left out of the scheme. Any worker who needs it must have access to this vital support. The risk of the pandemic to people's health and livelihoods has not abated. People are struggling now and they will suffer more as a result of these cuts. Borders are still closed and workplaces are still being radically impacted by COVID-19. The cost of living hasn't suddenly reduced by $300 a fortnight. People will again be forced to skip meals, take on extra debt to pay their rent, or to just survive. They'll have to forego essential health care, like dental appointments and medicines. Modeling by the ANU released last month showed that as a result of these cuts, the national poverty rate will rise to over 15%. The government should really be ashamed of itself. A few days before the JobKeeper cut, the $550 a fortnight coronavirus supplement for those on JobSeeker and other social security payments was also cut by $300. The Greens are fiercely opposed to the cut to the coronavirus supplement for people on social security payments like JobSeeker and Youth Allowance. But unfortunately, the Senate won't even have the opportunity to seek to disallow those cruel cuts, as the only way to strike down the cut would be to strike down the supplement itself. The Greens were the first to call for a wage subsidy for workers during this crisis. While we have had serious issues with the JobKeeper scheme, there is no doubt that it has helped millions of people. We strongly oppose the government's repeated cha repeatedly changing the rules to keep university workers out. When the government withdrew access to JobKeeper from early childhood educators, we spoke up and spoke out against it. And shamefully, from the very beginning, the government cruelly refused to extend JobKeeper to many casuals and all temporary visa holders. We are in a pandemic and we are in a recession. This is not the time to be cutting the critical JobKeeper payments, which is only just a living wage to begin with. One survey in June found that 50% of people on JobKeeper were being paid less than their pre-pandemic income. Around a million people lost their jobs in the early stages of the pandemic. Unemployment could reach 10% by the end of the year, regardless of the Treasurer's optimistic projections. JobKeeper and the coronavirus supplement were the only things keeping millions out of crushing poverty and serious risk of homelessness when eviction bans are lifted. These cuts are indefensible. Over two million people are expected to be kicked off JobKeeper over the next few months as the government winds back support. At the very least, hundreds of thousands of people currently on JobKeeper will be pushed onto the even lower poverty level job seeker payment. 
The Treasurer has admitted this, but is still hell-bent on making this happen. What's worse, the budget last night confirmed that this government doesn't mind spending money. It's not that they are cheap. It's just that rather than supporting ordinary people, they'd rather splash cash for their mates, the fossil fuel barons, the property developers and speculators, the big banks and the cashed-up private schools. Cutting back JobKeeper is also an attack on women. Women have borne the brunt of this pandemic, and the cuts to the JobKeeper payments are yet another harsh blow. Women lost their jobs twice as fast as men in the early stages of the pandemic and had their hours reduced at a higher rate than men. Women are now overrepresented in the ranks of casual workers and in industries most affected by shutdowns like retail and hospitality. And twice as many women than men will have their JobKeeper payments cut to $750 a fortnight due to their overrepresentation as part-time workers. The removal of free childcare and the withdrawal of JobKeeper from early childcare staff was a double whammy for women. 240,000 women over 55 are at risk of homelessness, and we are staring down the barrel of a homelessness crisis for them when the eviction ban ends. This government needs to commit to closing the gender pay gap and address the financial insecurity so many women find themselves in, not consciously or deliberately making women's lives harder and their futures even more uncertain. The government thinks that we live in a society where we aren't responsible for one another, where governments don't have the primary obligation to facilitate our care for each other. This pandemic has shown that in a crisis, ordinary people's instincts is solidarity, to protect each other by making sacrifices, to check in on each other, and make sure we each have what we need to get by. This disallowance is about fairness. It is about the kind of society that we want to live in. But obviously, the idea of fairness for the liberals is the exact polar opposite of ours. The choices the government has made in the budget, in cutting support to people who need it most, have intergenerational implications. Children will grow up in poverty and the effects will reverberate throughout their lives. Young people will continue to, be blocked, to be, continue to be locked out of our broken housing system. Those same children and young people face a climate crisis, which this government is fast-tracking as they give away money to their coal and gas donors. And yet, in the budget handed down last night, this government is giving out massive tax cuts of $99 billion a year to big corporations and the wealthy. Tax cuts now mean service cuts later. I don't need a tax cut. The Prime Minister doesn't need a tax cut. The Treasurer doesn't need a tax cut. Their corporate mates don't need tax cuts, if they even pay tax in the first place. What the community needs is support for people so that they can come out of the pandemic with a brighter future. The Senate has the power to undo these cruel cuts to the JobKeeper wage subsidy and insist that this government support workers who need help, not to be kicked while they're down. And I implore everyone in this chamber to make the right choice today and support this motion. Senator. Still? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Labor supports this disallowance. Uh, we do not think this is the right time to, withdrew, to be withdrawing support from the Australian economy. Uh, we do not think that this is the right time to be withdrawing support from Australian businesses. We do not think this is the right time to be withdrawing support from people whose jobs and livelihoods are on the line. And on this basis, we can't support a $300 reduction in this payment at this time. Last night's budget was extraordinarily deeply disappointing. We are in the grip of the most serious recession in almost 100 years. Businesses are closing, hours are being cut, and sadly, people are losing their jobs. The government, we believe, had the opportunity to significantly improve the lives of those doing it tough. 
Instead, their budget persists with ill-timed cuts to payments like Job Seeker and Job Keeper. And the Liberals' proposed cuts to JobKeeper are coming at the worst possible time for many, many workers, businesses and communities. A small business owner from Penshurst in the south of Sydney said, and I quote, If JobKeeper is cut, I think our business would close within a few months. We are a travel company and have been without income since February, when people stopped travelling. We have given up our office, sold or even given away our office furniture and cancelled most of our contractors to save money. If people don't start buying from travel agents, I fear many of us will be closing before the end of the year. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, as an opposition in this chamber, we don't choose the structure of the legislation and regulations we are asked to respond to. Labor is supportive of better targeting the JobKeeper payment through tiered arrangements. However, we do not support lowering the rate of JobKeeper from $1,500 to $1,200. It is on, the basis, on this basis that we will be supporting uh, 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 Senator Faruqi your disallowance motion. Labor has always said that the arrangements needed to be tailored to the economic conditions, and we know they won't continue forever. But we do know what the economy looks like today and how tough Australians are doing it right now. This government loves to talk about how good they are for the economy, for businesses, for regional Australia, but they continue to leave them in the lurch. Their budget completely ignored the disproportionate impact of this recession on women failing to acknowledge the massive job losses in female-dominated industries and proposing no new measures to end the gender pay gap, improve women's super balances or address family and domestic violence. And now they want to cut JobKeeper and push more people into economic limbo, unsure about whether, where their next paycheck will come from. Madam Acting Deputy President, Australians deserve much better from this government. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The JobKeeper payment has been instrumental in supporting job retention, maintaining employment links and business cash flow, as well as providing income support to eligible employees. This extension will provide further support to significantly impacted businesses so more Australians can retain their jobs and continue to earn income. As the economy reopens, the payment will be tapered in the December and March quarters to encourage businesses to, to adjust to the new environment, supporting a gradual trans transition to, the, to e economic recovery while ensuring those businesses who most need support continue to receive it. The question is, is that part three of schedule one of the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Amendment Rules No. 8 2020 be disallowed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, Division required? Ring the bells.
is this business of a seven notice promotion company? One. Thank you. Stop the bells. The question is the business of the Senate matter number one be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell her for the ayes. Senator Davey, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 22, noes 27. Sorry, I don't quite read the handwriting. The matter is resolved in the negative. My apologies. Um, now I understand there was an agreement to allow a.
late submission of a motion from Senator Patrick or Senator Lambie? Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm without a script, but I seek leave to uh, amend uh, the motion that I lodged today to be dealt with tomorrow rather than on the 11th of, uh, of uh, October. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. I, I move the amendment. Uh, no, you just need leave to amend the notice of motion, and leave has been granted. All right. So, thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. I'm looking at the clerk to make sure I'm correct. I am. Uh, we go back to government business. So I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, higher education support amendment job ready graduates and supporting regional and remote students bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate and the debate on the amendment moved by Senator Faruqi. We'll just take a moment so senators can take their seats. Senator Lyons. I'm, I take the call, but if he's on the line, I'm happy to sit. Sorry, Senate, sorry, Senator Waters. Can we have the mics on, Senate, Senator Waters? Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. My understanding is Senator Steelejohn is still keen to speak. Um, he might be sort of temporarily. Um, indisposed, but can he not lose his speaking spot? I don't know the formal words to use, but could he stay on the list um, while we get him back to the right Absolutely. We'll place? get the whips to sort it out thank tomorrow. You thank much. you, Senator Waters. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in opposition to this bill. And uh, quite frankly, when we first saw this legislation, we could not believe um, how the government could could put forward a bill which so obviously disadvantages a group of students um, who are largely studying in the humanities area. And when we looked further at the bill, we thought we can't even improve on this bill because it is so bad uh, that we will um, stand in opposition to the bill. And I'm really proud to stand here tonight in opposition to the bill. I think the other point the government has. Um, completely misunderstood or is just simply ignoring, along with uh, One Nation and uh, Senator Griff, who are supporting the bill, is that students currently in years 11 and 12 aren't suddenly going to be able to change their course to do a STEM degree. I mean, they have committed themselves to two years of study, which the ATAR is really a course of two years' study. So not only are we disadvantaging university students who, in good faith, signed up to do a course uh, and knew that they would incur a hex debt at a particular price to suddenly find, whether they're halfway through first year or second year or third year, that the cost of their degree, because of the course that they've chosen, has absolutely doubled. And then we are now disadvantaging those students in years 11 and 12 who, if they haven't already been disadvantaged this year with their schooling, the government seeks to, public, to punish them even more because they simply are not in a position to change their course of study right now, even if they wanted to. And what has the government got against um, a humanities degree? As I said earlier today, the other group of uh, students who are absolutely disadvantaged uh, on this bill are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander bills. As I said earlier today in another contribution to the Senate, in Western Australia we have less than 2,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students enrolled at our universities. That's shameful. And what are we doing to those students? We are absolutely disadvantaging them because the stats say that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are more likely than non-Aboriginal uh, students to enrol later in life. They take longer to finish their degree, and they pretty much enrol in humanities. So look what we're doing to First Nations people 
uh, right across this country. We are simply going to say to you, sorry, we're not interested in you. The government senators, and I've listened to some of the contributions they've made, have made a big deal about how it will advantage regional and rural students. And I'm not seeking to single out anyone, but significant numbers of students from regional and rural areas already attend university many more times than our students from First Nations background, and yet it's those students that we're seeking to advantage over First Nations students. And quite frankly, to sell them out, as we've seen uh, Senator Alliance do, for 40 pieces of silver, a few roads in Mayo is a disgrace. How those senators can come in here and disadvantage the nation's Senator students Lyons. is beyond me. Senator Lyons, you will be in continuation, but it being 7.20 p.m., I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Rennie? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. When I first moved to Brisbane in 1988, Queensland was the powerhouse economy of Australia. At that time, we boasted Expo 88, which was one of the great uh, events of that year, uh, and Queensland itself was one of the world's great tourist attractions. It also had one of the world's lowest power prices. But the best thing I loved about Queensland was the fact that there was very little difference in opportunity for those in the regions, between those in the regions and those in the cities, in the city of Brisbane. And what I loved the most about our capital city, Brisbane, was that it was a big country town. And it didn't matter you know, where you were from, uh, someone always knew someone else in the country. And that was what was great about Brisbane. I mean, often you know, people would say, oh, it's a big country town or whatever. But you know, that's, the, that's the charm of Brisbane, or that was the charm of Brisbane. Unfortunately, in the 30 years since, we've seen Brisbane turn its back on regional Queensland. We've seen the state Labor government that got into power in 1988 forget about the regions. And today, our regions in Queensland have been left behind. And that is a tragedy because our cousins in the regions in, in, in Queensland are, are what gives Queensland its wealth, you know, whether it's farming, uh, mining, fishing, forestry, even our beekeepers uh, have had, you know, the state Labor government's turned its back on the beekeepers. They intend to throw beekeepers out of national parks uh, in the next term of government if they get back in, uh, which is quite incredible when you think that at the same time they're allowing foreign uh, renewable wind farms into national parks. Uh, you know, our beekeepers are being thrown out. But I just want to walk through the history of what the state Labor government has done to our great state of Queensland. One of the, you know, the first things they ever did was to allow poker machines into the state, into our pubs and clubs. And that's basically you know, destroyed families. It's been another form of wealth transfer from the regions uh, back into the head offices of Brisbane. Uh, and, and now, you know, since uh, the old TAB has been taken over by Tabcorp, uh, the money even goes out of the state now into, I think they're based in Melbourne, I'll be corrected on that. But that was the first thing and I, I just, you know, it's amazing, we'll often hear Labor knock Sir Joe and all the rest of it, but I can tell you what, he could balance the budget and build infrastructure and he never needed poker machines to do it. And that, you know, I'll, I'll give credit to, uh, well, I'll criticise Wayne Gross for putting them in, but, I, I, you know, he himself admitted later in his life uh, that that was the biggest mistake he ever did. And of course, you know, he admitted the reason why he did it was that he was pandering to the unions. And that really is the same old, same old with Labor. They will just pander to the unions on anything at all, if it means that they're going to employ more people and get more uh, members into their union and collect more union funds. And the other bad thing that's really happened, and this is very close to my heart, is that they have shut down over 30 maternity wards in the regions. And you know, we always hear about, you know, from Labor and, and the Greens about the treatment of women and that somehow the LNP are leaving women behind. Well, there is no greater way to leave women behind than shut down maternity wards in the regions. You know, the biggest co premature cause of death uh, in third world countries for women uh, is giving childbirth, and yet Queensland is heading that same way because Labor has shut down so many maternity wards. And that is a, a, a legacy and a blight on the Labor Party 
uh, that they you know, really should do something about. I mean, it's a bit too late now. Um, but I'm pleased to say that the state LNP has committed uh, to bringing back birthing services to my hometown of Chinchilla and Theodore, and hopefully, hopefully there'll be many more. And just to give you an idea, Bowen, for example, a town of 10,000 people doesn't have a maternity ward. But it doesn't end there. You know, it's the tree clearing laws they've cracked down on farmers, the reef regulations they've cracked down on farmers, the closure of agricultural uh, colleges, another crackdown on farmers. It's the collapse in infrastructure spending. I mean, not only can state Labor not even build infrastructure, they're pulling the infrastructure down. They're pulling down, uh, lowering the wall at Paradise Dam, which is going to have a devastating impact on Bundaberg, one of Queensland's, if not Queensland's, fastest growing region. So it doesn't matter which way you turn, Labor does not help the regions. And when you come to vote uh, at the end of this month, on October the 31st, make sure you put a vote in there for LNP because we will back the regions and get Queensland working again. Thank you. Senator Polly. I rise to make a contribution regarding the 2021 federal budget and its lack of coherent economic stimulus plan for my home state of Tasmania. This year's federal budget was the most important budget since the end of World War II and it has left Australians across the land wanting. Prime Minister Morrison promises a lot but delivers nothing, and this is what this budget is all about. The Morrison government has had the opportunity to invest in Tasmania with a plan to boost economic activity and jobs, but has left my home state off the map. This crisis, above all else, demands prioritising job creation initiatives, which means direct investment to small business and the industries which keep our state moving, but they have missed that opportunity. Those opposite have also missed an opportunity to provide assistance to unemployed Tasmanians and those suffering under a housing crisis. There is nothing in this budget that builds confidence in the Tasmanian community, nor does it future-proof us against a future outbreak. There is no plan for jobs. There is no plan for Tasmanian hospitals. Tasmanians need more than the $360 million road infrastructure package to supposedly be delivered over the next four years. This federal budget required a bold plan for our tourism, agriculture and emerging industries, and yet the Morrison government did not take that opportunity provided to them. Tasmanian industries have not been adequately supported to recover from this crisis. $13.5 million for Tasmanian tourism projects just doesn't cut it. Local, interstate and international travellers spent a total of $4.5 billion on tourism in Tasmania in 2018-19. Tasmania needs a federal government that will actually build Tasmania's tourism infrastructure on a larger scale. What this government is consistently guilty of over successive years is re-announcing previously committed funds that are yet to be delivered. They do that across the country, not just in Tasmania. The funds committed to the Sorrell Causeway duplication are welcome, but these funds were announced at the last election. Those opposite move around communities and promise but don't deliver. For example, in my hometown of, Tas of Launceston, in last year's budget, they promised much, but they've delivered very little. In fact, there are three commitments worth noting which not only haven't been delivered, but may not be delivered until 2023-24, if ever. $10 million for the Built Cultural Initiative's Albert Hall Renewal Project, $47.5 million under the Launceston City deal to improve the health of the Tamer River estuary, $15 million for the Northern Suburbs Recreation Hub. Ensuring as a community we overcome this crisis, we get out of this immediate danger of the crisis and the recession we find ourselves in as a nation, we must be bold with our policy advocates and we must deliver. The government has had one shot at this, but there is no second chances. Direct investment to get our state moving again and to help that momentum is crucial if we are to emerge from this Morrison recession. 
Tasmania just can't afford funding commitments which will not be delivered until 23-24. The people of Tasmania deserve better than this, and the people of Australia deserve better than this. A less than $50 a fortnight tax cut just does not cut it. And for people who have lost the, and will lose their $300 taken away prematurely, of the reduction of the JobKeeper, Australians need the faith and full support of the federal government, not the termination of assistance that is keeping them afloat. Where is the plan to keep people in work and keep older workers in work? Because once they lose their jobs, we know they're unlikely to be rehired. Instead of better targeting the taxpayer funds, those opposite are condemning future generations to a record levels of debt, with gross national debt expected to reach $1.13 trillion by 2024. Sadly, last night's budget is built on a wing and a prayer with no plan for Tasmania and a wish for a vaccine by the end of the year. Building roads will not get us out of the Morrison government's recession. It won't work. Their budget is not going Order, to cut Senator it. Senator Polly. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I see and note that Australian politics has been seduced and sometimes conned into endorsing policies aiming at decarbonising and consequently deindustrializing our whole economy by 2050. Climate claims now push policies to cut the human use of vital hydrocarbon fuels like natural gas, coal and oil. At the core is the claim that carbon dioxide from burning those fuels is warming our planet and that warming is a danger to humans and to our planet. Politicians have the highest duty of care to base all policies on rigorous scientific evidence, especially policies that bring about radical change with severe consequences for people's livelihoods and lifestyle. Expensive policies need justification with impacts specified and quantified before implementation. And this can only be achieved when based on solid data as scientific evidence and that proves causation. Climate policies are decimating our nation's productive capacity, economic sovereignty and economic resilience, and we are on the slide from independence to dependence on other nations. Climate policies and renewable subsidies are already costing households an extra $13 billion per year in excess electricity charges. That's an extra $1,300 per household per Australian household. High electricity prices are dismantling our productive economy and exporting jobs overseas. Ridiculous electricity prices are suffocating manufacturing, agriculture, small and large businesses. Energy intensive industries and value adding processing of food and minerals are moving to countries with cheap energy. Australia is a CSIRO is Australia's national research institution and as the people's representatives we need to have unequivocal re confidence in the quality of its research, scientific process and scientific evidence. So I examined the CSIRO, cross-examined them, held them accountable. We need to know that CSIRO is deeply committed to due diligence, knowing that its work forms the basis of wide-ranging policy decisions. With more, than a with more than a decade of research and analysis and of questioning experts worldwide, I questioned the CSIRO and I found CSIRO, in terms of climate research, did not meet the high standards we expect of what was our premier research institution. I shared the CSIRO's presentations and my conclusions and observations with 17 international climate scientists who concluded that the CSIRO lacked the evidence necessary to justify any government policy. During our examination of CSIRO on its so-called evidence, used politically to justify current climate policies, the following key climate themes emerged. CSIRO admitted that it has never stated that carbon dioxide from human activity is dangerous. Who did, we asked them. Well, you'll have to ask the politicians. So why have we got the policies that we have? There's no basis, no danger. CSIRO secondly admitted that temperatures today are not unprecedented. So that means we didn't cause them. Number three, CSIRO relies upon unvalidated models that give unverified and erroneous projections as evidence, confirming that it lacks empirical scientific evidence. They have no evidence for this. CSIRO has never quantified any specific impact of carbon dioxide from human activity. So there's no basis for policy. CSIRO admits to not doing due diligence on reports and data from external agencies. They just swallow it. 
CSIRO relied on discredited and poor quality papers on temperature and carbon dioxide. CSIRO withdrew discredited papers that it gave to us that it had cited as, as evidence of unprecedented rate of temperature change and then failed to provide supporting empirical evidence. CSIRO revealed little understanding of the papers it cited as evidence. It even cited papers that contradict each other. CSIRO allows politicians and journalists to misrepresent CSIRO science without correction. CSIRO misled parliament. The onus, therefore, is now on the federal parliament to scrap climate policies and un unless and until CSIRO can provide accurate, repeatable and verifiable empirical scientific evidence within a logic scientific framework that proves carbon dioxide from human activity detrimentally affects vari climate variability and needs to be cut. Further, the proposed cuts need to be specified in terms of the amount, the impact and the effects together with the costs of making and of not making those cuts. How else can we justify these severe costly cuts that people in this chamber are inflicting on everyday Australians right around the country and their future? How else can we measure progress? How else can we ensure effectiveness? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bragg. Well, Labor want to talk about the quote unquote Morrison recession. I received an email this morning from Jim Chalmers saying that there was a Morrison recession. But of course, um, that means that Mr Chalmers hasn't heard about the coronavirus pandemic, which is sweeping the globe. Uh, and if he'd read the budget papers last night, Mr Chalmers would have seen that, uh, yes, our economy shrunk by 7 per cent in the June quarter. That compares to a 20 per cent reduction in the UK and a 12 per cent reduction in New Zealand. So who is uh, Labor's economic team? Well, let's just go through a couple of these very interesting characters. The first is Mr Chalmers. Let's call him Tweedle, Tweedle D. Now, he's interested in the leadership. He's breathing down the neck of uh, Mr Albanese. There's a, there's a puff piece in the Australian. I anticipate your point of order, Senator Thank McCarthy. You. I was just... Um, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that. We shouldn't refer to people um, by nicknames of that like that. Withdraw. I appreciate that, Senator Bragg. I'll Thank withdraw. you. And in this puff piece in the Weekend Oz from the 6th of June, it says, quote, in his first speech as an MP, he waxed lyrical about his deep local roots, quoting Tennyson, that he was part of all I have met growing up in Logan City, but the shtick does wear thin with others in caucus, who note wryly that the well-trodden path from university to a job in political office, parliament and the front bench hardly imbues him with life experience. He works hard at trying to hide that, says one Labor MP. Very interesting. There you go. So Mr Chalmers, of course, is, or Dr Chalmers, he is the architect of the housing and the retiree taxes from the last election, which were voted against by the Australian people. And when he worked for Mr Swan, he was the architect of the mining tax. So Dr Chalmers loves the class war. He refers to the top end of town all the time. Last election he said it 100 times, 20 times on one day. And one of his icons, Mr Keating, one of my friends, uh, said, quote, Labor lost the ability to speak aspirationally to people and to fashion policies to meet these aspirations, end quote. Now that's very good advice. So where is uh, Mr Chalmers taking his inspiration from? It looks like it's Mr Swan. The, the chief president of the Labor Party. Now he says, uh, Mr. Swan says, or oh, sorry, this is Chalmers says, I was proud to work for him, and I'm one of a few people to know him best. That's in Glory Days, which has sold 713 copies over the last seven years, which is about 100 copies a year. Now Swan says uh, Labor should stick with new taxes, so more taxes during a pandemic. So that's very, very concerning. That the guy who's never heard of COVID uh, thinks that we should take advice from the guy who wants to increase taxes. Now we can go on to Mr Jones. Dr Jones, is he as well, perhaps? Now he worked for the ACTU and the CPSU. Now this man has no idea who he represents. He's not sure whether he's there for the ACTU, CPSU, Industry Super, or maybe he's there for the people who elected him, the people of Whitlam. Uh, now Mr Jones hates the idea that people have been able to access their own money during this pandemic through early access. Uh, now, Jones is good. He runs an outsourced policy model. He rings up his mates of the industry super funds and they write all these policies for him. It's a very efficient way of doing business. The trouble is he's come a cropper because he's become the boy who cried wolf. Back in March, March 25th, Jones said, 
we have genuine liquidity concerns in the AFR about the about the three trillion dollar super industry losing thirty or forty billion dollars. Genuine liquidity concerns. So, and then he went on to use uh, these dodgy numbers uh, from the industry super network, uh, which have been massively overstated according to the corporate regulator. Now Jones is keen on Twitter. He says on Twitter uh, in September that uh, I'm a hypocrite. That apparently, I've taken. I've taken more money from the super industry than anyone else. And then he said in August that I've literally taken more money from the super industry than anyone else in parliament. Now, the difference between me and Mr Jones is being elected to this place, uh, actually, I take my responsibility very seriously. I'm here to work for the people that put me in this place, not people I used to work for. That's the difference between me and him. So he wants to run all the, all the lines for the ACTU that fund his campaigns. Now, by 2030, the super funds will be sending 30 million bucks a year to the ACTU and its constituents. So Jones is working hard for these people. He gets very offended when I point this out, but th these are the facts. So at the end of the day, uh, there's not a very strong economic team, Mr Jones and Mr, Mr. Uh, Chalmers. Now, Jones has also said just recently that there's uh, 113 members of the coalition party room and it appears most of them aren't interested in Andrew Bragg's plan to destroy superannuation. The good news for him is that the publishers inform me that we've sold uh, 779 copies of Bad Egg, How to Fix Super, and Chalmers has only sold 713 copies of his book, Glory Day. So there you go. Senator Green. It is worrying, it is worrying to hear um, government senators um, come in here and use uh, time to talk about their book sales, um, but I understand they don't have much to talk about from the budget that was delivered um, last night, so um, I can understand them wanting to spend some time attacking Labor, um, defending themselves, uh, but I am here to talk about regional Queensland and about jobs in regional Queensland. The LNP in Queensland will put jobs at risk in regional Queensland, and we know that. The LNP will put jobs at risk in regional Queensland because they have said that they don't care about having a majority government. When did they say that? Well, they have decided to go ahead and preference every single minor party and then have the gall to go out there and say, that they want to win majority government. Well, if you go ahead and preference every single minor party in Queensland, that's a surefire way to make sure that our Queensland government ends up in chaos in a time when actually Queensland needs certainty more than anything else. The LNP will preference Clive Palmer. They're going to go ahead and and give him some votes. He is spending quite a lot of money on Facebook ads, so I can understand he would want something in return. They are going to go ahead and preference One Nation. Well, they know, we know that One Nation votes with the LNP most of the time anyway, but that makes sense. But this is the real clincher for me. They're also going to go ahead and preference the Greens in every single seat in Queensland, in every single one. In Townsville, they're going to preference the Greens. In the Burdekin, they're going to go ahead and preference the Greens party. In Keppel, in Rockhampton, all across regional Queensland, all across regional Queensland where the LNP has stood up and said, we will protect jobs, we will represent regional Queenslanders, they're going to go ahead and preference the Greens party and do more damage to jobs in regional Queensland. They will possibly lead to more Greens getting elected into Queensland Parliament, less majority government and chaos and uncertainty for Queensland. But they're not going to tell you that when they head up to Townsville, put on their shiny new high-vis, talk about how they're, they're there for people in regional Queensland and their jobs. But what they are going to do on election day is preference the Greens party. At the last election, the federal election, they said they'd put the Greens last. Well, now it's all about political opportunism for the LNP in Queensland, because we know that they have incredibly bad judgment, risky behaviour, and they do not put Queenslanders first. And there's no better example of this than of 
the leader of the opposition, Deb Franklington's uh, position on border closures in Queensland. And now what's very interesting, and she's out there trying to say, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't want to open up the borders um, in July when there was an outbreak about to happen in Victoria. Well, she's been caught out. She's been caught out because over and over again, time and time again, she called for the borders to be closed. And even LNP senators in this place, in this place, passed a motion to try to get Queensland to open its borders. That was 10 days before the Victorian outbreak started. If we had listened to the LNP, if Deb Franklinton had been allowed to make decisions on behalf of Queenslanders, there is no telling what would have happened. Queensland needs strong leadership, certain leadership. We need a Queensland Labor government that will back jobs, that will bring manufacturing back to the regions, that will build trains in regional Queensland as opposed to sending them overseas. And we need a Queensland Labor government that is prepared to go out there and say, we back you first above everyone else that we are here for regional jobs, that we are here for Queenslanders, not the LNP who are out there doing deals, making preferences, agreeing to put the Greens, doing preferences with the Greens to try to get themselves over the line and damaging Order. Queensland Green, at the same time. time. For the contributions expired. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. I am so delighted to have Senator Lydia Thorpe join us in Parliament. Senator Thorpe and I will be leading the Greens to put anti-racist work at the core of everything that we do. We will leave no stone unturned to tackle head-on the rising tide of racism and demand justice for First Nations people and people of colour. Side by side and alongside communities of colour, we will fight the growing tide of far-right nationalism and tackle systemic racism. In the words of Angela Davis, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. I am proud to have the responsibility of a new anti-racism portfolio for the Greens. Over the last few years, we have seen the far right emboldened. We have seen again and again the cheerleaders of the far right and the merchants of hate in here and in the media legitimize, normalize, and even incite the hate that foments right-wing extremism and toxic anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim hysteria. The institutions that are meant to protect us haven't just failed. They've become cap captive to the hate they're meant to fight. Any nation where police officers feel comfortable flashing white supremacist hand gestures is not one where people of color can feel safe. It has led us to become a nation where far-right violent extremism constitutes up to 40% of ASIO's counterterrorism caseload. That's up fourfold from as little as 10% just four years ago. Yet politicians trivialize racism and far-right extremism. Just like they've been denying 200 years of systemic racism against First Nations people, resulting in ongoing oppression, incarceration, and deaths in custody, they now also deny the far right and the harm they cause. And they draw their inspiration from President Trump in the US. During that awful first presidential debate last week, when Trump was pressed by the moderator to denounce violent white nationalism, he said, proud boys, stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right-wing problem, this is a left-wing problem. Many people looked at this in horror. But I'd heard similar things before. I heard this when the Home Affairs Minister, in the days after Christchurch, drew an equivalence between my advocacy and my anti-racist activism with the far right and their apologists. Make no mistake, there's no doubt that what is happening in the US is very bad. But let's also have some introspection. Trump is a president who has time after time shown his racism, white nationalism, and white supremacy. 
Even moderate U.S. commentators who shied away from labeling the president, president this way now admit that he is a racist and a fascist. He has encouraged violence against Black Lives Matter protesters while openly bolstering the far right. He has described Haiti, El Salvador, and some parts of Africa as S-hole countries. He has gone out of his way time and again to target and attack Democratic Congresswomen of color, telling them to go back to the broken and crime-invested places that they came from. Yet there is little reflection in this chamber on what this means for us. There is a liberal labor consensus of unquestioning and uncritical alliance with the United States. They are too cowardly to call a spade a spade. They are too complicit to call out Trump's blatant racism. Australia should be distancing itself from Trump, not cozying up. But we've also got to get our own house in order, and we are far from it. We must become an anti-racist country. We must proactively dismantle the racist system we live in, a system that oppresses and silences people of color, a system where there is a dismal lack of diversity in politics, in the media, and in the top of Australian companies, institutions, and government departments. A system that refuses to accept that far-right violence is a serious and growing threat. A system that has allowed increasing hate to be piled on communities of color, using them as scapegoats when the going gets tough. Well, no more. I look forward to working with communities as we continue to fight for racial justice and focus even more on anti-racism. And I call, call you to join us in this fight. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, as we all know, Australia right now is in the grip of the Morrison recession, the worst recession our country has seen since the Great Depression. We know that this recession is worse than it needed to be because of the decisions of the Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, and his government. Their decision to exclude over a million casuals and other workers from receiving the JobKeeper payment their decision to cut the JobKeeper and JobSeeker payments uh, when the country is in such a parlous economic state. So the Morrison recession is going to harm our country for a long time to come, and unfortunately so many Australians are paying the price. You really would think that when our country is experiencing the worst recession we have experienced since the Great Depression, that the government will be doing everything it could to keep people into work and to keep money flowing through the economy and flowing into people's pockets so that they can spend that money in local shops and businesses. But of course, what do they do? They do the opposite. The Morrison government has consciously decided to cut the JobKeeper payments and the JobSeeker payments while the economy is still weak and while unemployment is still growing. Just in my own state of Queensland, there are hundreds of thousands of Queenslanders whose JobKeeper payments and JobSeeker payments, coronavirus supplement payments, have been cut over the last few days. That is going to be terrible for those individuals and their families, but it's also going to be terrible for the local economies uh, and local communities that those people live in, because they'll have less money to spend in local shops and businesses, which will send those businesses into further trouble and inevitably lead to further job cuts. So yet again, we see that the LNP's answer to a crisis is cuts, cuts and cuts. And in Queensland, we know a lot about LNP cuts. It wasn't that long ago that we had an LNP government in Queensland headed by Campbell Newman, whose only solution to every problem was to cut and cut and cut. They cut 14,000 jobs in the public sector, including frontline positions in our hospitals, in our schools and our police services. They tried to sell anything that wasn't glued down. Uh, and they, they cut funding to all sorts of other programs. And of course, standing right beside then Premier Campbell Newman was his assistant treasurer, Deb Frecklington, now the leader of the opposition in Queensland. She was there right by Mr Newman's side with every cut that he made, every asset he tried to sell, uh, every program he tried to wind up. And she's at it again. Just last night on ABC TV in Queensland, uh, Ms Frecklington faced one of her first interviews of the election campaign. She was asked repeatedly to rule out public service cuts 
and to answer whether cuts would only occur uh, to the public sector via natural attrition. And she ducked and she dodged and she weaved. Time after time after time, she was asked this question about whether the public service, frontline workers, would be cut through natural attrition, and she would not give an answer. The reason she wouldn't give an answer is because she knows in her heart that she's going to do exactly what she did last time she was assistant treasurer, and that's to cut and sack and sell. Now, Ms Frecklington and the LNP are so desperate to win at this election that they have made the unprecedented decision to preference every other party in Queensland ahead of the Labor Party. Their position is so unprincipled when it comes to preferences that they will preference anyone as long as it's not the Labor candidate, because that's how they have decided they are going to get elected them to, to government. Now, of course, this is going to cause immense chaos, because the result of this decision, at a time when Queensland needs immense stability to recover from the COVID crisis and from the Morrison recession, what we instead face is a ragtag coalition of LNP, Palmer, One Nation, Catter uh, and Greens MPs running Queensland. Can you just imagine trying to get any sensible decision about Queensland's future out of such a coalition? And if there is any sign of how diminished a figure one of the LNP's leading lights in Canberra, Senator Matt Canavan, has become, it is the decision of the LNP to preference the Greens ahead of Labor. Senator Canavan has made his career out of hating on the Greens. He says they're jobs destroyers. He says they're all sorts of things. And now his own party is deciding to preference the Greens ahead of the Labor Party. Just today, Senator Canavan has criticised BHP uh, for its, its decision to disaffiliate from the Resources Council over the Greens. Order. He can't even Senator make his own party listen. The contribution has expired. Um, the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. See you tomorrow morning.